and the camp commander had set up a system in which prisoners were rewarded with an extra cigarette for each box of flies they collected. Bob had become an expert fly killer. His cell door opened, and liver lips stood in the doorway, motioning for him to follow. The guard always carried a thick bamboo stick that he used to hit prisoners. Usually being summoned by liver lips meant a trip to the interrogation room or a beating. Bob took a deep breath and followed liver lips down the corridor. Bob told himself that whenever the intensity of the beatings increased, it was a sign of an allied victory somewhere, and the POWs were paying the price. Getting accurate details on the war's progress, of course, was not easy. Guards had told him that San Francisco had fallen and Tojo was in Washington, D.C. The most reliable source on war news came from the newest prisoners to arrive in camp, but because the prisoners weren't permitted to speak with one another, this wasn't always possible. Still, Bob had been able to whisper to Captain Fitzgerald about the rice ball under the bench, and Captain Fitzgerald had been able to let Bob know that he'd found it and eaten it with great appreciation. Arriving at the medical office, Liver Lips pushed Bob inside. Bob stiffened. The medical facilities at Oofuna were woefully bad, with no doctor and only a minimum of supplies. There was a medical technician on site by the name of Kitamura Kongo Chio, a man the prisoners had nicknamed the Quack and considered to be one of the most sadistic men on staff. Since arriving at Oofuna, Bob had seen men with a wide array of medical problems, from scurvy and beriberi to intestinal parasites and pneumonia, denied treatment. When the men were allowed to go to the medical office, nobody seemed to come back improved. Some never came back at all. There was no shortage of horror stories, amputations performed with no anesthetic, bamboo strips used for acupuncture to the eyes. If the Red Cross was sending medical supplies, they weren't being used on prisoners. Upon entering the office, Bob spotted a familiar face across the room, Greg Pappy Boyington. Standing next to him was the quack. Liverlips pushed Bob in their direction. With the possible exception of Captain Fitzgerald, Bob admired Boyington as much as anyone in camp. Boyington, an ace marine fighter pilot from Idaho, had recently arrived in camp after being shot down in a dogfight over the island of New Britain. A notorious bad boy with a proclivity for fistfights and drinking, he had formed a flying unit of misfits called the Black Sheep Squadron. His nickname was Pappy because he was ten years older than everyone else in the squadron. The Black Sheep quickly became a lethal force credited with 94 downed Japanese planes. Nineteen of those were by Boyington, five of those in one day. After being shot down, he was pronounced missing in action and presumed dead. In March 1944, he was awarded the Navy Cross and the Congressional Medal of Honor to be held in Washington, D.C. until such time as he could receive it. Brought to Ofuna after his capture, he arrived in camp with an infected thigh wound he'd sustained when he was shot down. Since being in camp, he'd been beaten endlessly, his request for medical attention to his wound ignored until now. The quack ordered Boyington to lie down on a table, then signaled Bob to stand next to him. Bob glanced down at Boyington's gaping wound, almost gagging at the look and smell of the infected leg. He quickly figured out why he'd been summoned. He was there to hold Boyington down by his shoulders. Using a knife that looked like it had been borrowed from the kitchen, the quack sliced open Boyington's thigh. Keeping his hold on Boyington, Bob turned his head. If he'd had anything to eat, he was sure he would have thrown it up. Boyington gritted his teeth, but didn't flinch or yell out. After probing the wound, the quack removed a bullet fragment, then wrapped the leg in gauze and ordered Bob to help Boyington back to his cell. Boyington declined the help and hobbled back on his own. Bob was positive he'd just spent time with the toughest guy on earth. He felt re-energized and even more determined to be strong. 31. Tim Skeeter McCoy, Fukuoka No. 3 Working in the pipe shop at the steel mill, Tim waited until there were no guards or civilian pushers hovering nearby. 
Now was the time to make his move. Whistle if you see somebody coming, he said to Gordy Cox. Gordy nodded, although he wasn't sure he even had the strength to whistle. In the last couple of weeks, the malnutrition and dysentery had taken their toll. It was all he could do every morning to get up for roll call and climb on the flatbed car for the thirty-minute ride to the steel mill. Still, he was one of many who thought that going to work was better than taking their chances at the camp hospital. A Japanese worker had recently changed the blade on one of the nearby band saws. Tim eased his way toward the saw, sliding past other prisoners and Japanese workers. Nobody paid him any attention. Of all the grenadier prisoners, he was the one always moving around, leaving his position, testing the limits. He was committed to doing whatever he could to make things tougher for his captors, and nothing had diminished his resolve, not standing naked in the snow or watching the dead bodies being wheeled out of camp to the crematorium. Reaching the bandsaw, he glanced around. It wasn't just the guards he was worried about. He was also leery of the civilian workers, the pushers. For them to catch a POW stealing was not only a victory for the Empire, but also a way to earn personal praise, or, better yet, be rewarded with extra food. Their rations had also been reduced. Confident that nobody was looking, he grabbed the blade and pulled, bending it in the middle. It didn't break. He pulled harder, this time snapping it in two. He quickly took half the blade and stuffed it into his pocket, and then turned and headed back to his station. Now his task was to file it down into a knife blade, and then smuggle it out of the pipe shop and sneak it past the guards and into camp. Tim waited in line to board the flatbed car for the ten-mile train ride back to Fukuoka No. 3, watched by two armed guards. He climbed up onto the flatbed car and sat down on his small, three-legged wooden stool. The POWs had talked the factory administrators into letting them make these stools in the carpentry shop so that they wouldn't have to sit on the wet, dirty floor for the thirty-minute ride. What the Japanese didn't know was that most of these stools had been crafted with a false bottom, and the POWs used them to smuggle things in and out of camp. The most frequently smuggled items were cigarettes and food. Tim had successfully filed down the saw blade and slipped it into the false bottom of his stool. His plan was to deliver it to Dr. Herbert Markowitz, a Navy doctor who had been captured on Wake Island. Exactly what the doctor would use it for, Tim wasn't sure. Maybe to lance the boils the prisoners had developed from malnutrition. The reason didn't matter to Tim. All that mattered was that Dr. Markowitz had said he needed it. Like all the prisoners, Tim had great respect for Dr. Markowitz, although he knew that the doctor was limited in what he could do because of the lack of supplies and the fact that the Japanese controlled everything that went on in the hospital. As the train slowly pulled away, Tim nervously surveyed the guards. Since the stools with the false bottoms had been built, contraband had been smuggled in and out on a semi-regular basis, and nobody had yet been caught. The train entered the mile-long tunnel. A few weeks earlier, there had been a discussion among a group of POWs about jumping the guards in the dark of the tunnel and stealing their guns. That idea was quickly dismissed, the prisoners concluding that their chances of survival if they escaped would be zero. Inside the tunnel, Tim closed his eyes and tried to relax. When the train reached the camp, he would calmly climb down and walk past the guards stationed at the main gate, just like he did every day, carrying his stool in his hand, just like all the other prisoners. As he often did, he let his thoughts drift to Valma back in Perth. Did she know he was alive? Was she still wearing the engagement ring he had given her? He and Chuck had talked about how they'd both fallen in love during their last leave, and how fast the time had flown by in those exhilarating days. For Tim, Valma was his first real love. Back in high school in Dallas, he'd been too busy to have a steady girl, always working after school to help support his mother. The few girls he'd met since joining the Navy had been a challenge to his Texas Baptist morals. That and the copious amounts of beer he'd become fond of imbibing. But Valma was different, beautiful and smart and devoted. 
He'd heard a rumor before the last patrol that there was going to be some kind of legislation enacted back in America that would allow war brides to be given special consideration in moving to America. Tim and Valma had discussed taking advantage if something like that was available. She had seen photos of California and movies that made America seem beautiful and glamorous, and once they were engaged, she had made it clear she was willing to follow Tim back home. In his last letter home, he'd told his mother about Valma and included her address, encouraging his mom to write her. He wondered if she had. As was usually the case when he thought about his mother, he also thought about his father. Even as a POW, he had not been able to let go of his anger toward his father for abandoning him and his mom. It had been a long time since he'd seen his father, and he wasn't sure he ever wanted to again. It was hard not to remember the image of his mother ironing other people's clothes in their scorching hot Dallas apartment. But he did wonder if his dad knew what had happened to him. The train slowed to a stop, and Tim grabbed his stool and closed ranks with the other prisoners, his heart pounding. He knew that if he was caught, he'd probably be beaten and thrown into the little cement box next to the entrance so everyone could look at him as they marched in and out of camp. It was too small to even stand up in. Surely he'd go crazy in there. A guard eyed him as he approached the prison entrance. Tim looked straight ahead, not changing his stride. In a few more strides... He was safely past the entrance and walking down the camp's main passageway toward his barracks. Later that evening, he delivered the blade to Dr. Markowitz. His bravado was renewed. Tim pointed to his shoes. Shoes, he said. A young Japanese boy standing next to him in the welding shop nodded and repeated the word. Tim smiled. It was part of his daily language lesson. When he and his crewmates were first captured, they had absorbed a lot of face slaps and rifle butts to the shoulder because they didn't understand the guard's orders. A few of the prisoners had made no effort to learn any Japanese other than their prisoner number, which they needed to know during roll call. Their attitude was, let those little nips learn to speak English, because they're going to need to when they figure out they ain't going to rule the world but Tim was doing his best to learn as many Japanese words as possible and to teach his captors English. Being able to converse with the guards and civilians, he believed, might give him some small advantage. Anything to beat the system and help him survive. A month earlier, he had been transferred from the pipe shop to the welding shop. He missed not working side by side with his buddies Chuck and Gordy anymore, but he was really happy with his transfer. He thought he had just about the best job of anybody on the crew, even if he'd had to lie to get it. Because of a shortage of Japanese welders, the factory administrators had put out a call to the prisoners for experienced welders. Tim had never welded anything in his life, but a fellow prisoner named Ripper Collins, who'd been a first-class welder on the USS Houston before it was sunk and its crew captured, told him he'd put in a good word for him to get the job. It's a great place to work, Collins said. There are no guards, and they have a bunch of Jap kids to work for you. When Tim said he didn't know how to weld, Collins assured him, I'll just tell the Japs you're rusty. They'll never know. I guarantee I can teach you how to be a great welder in just two weeks. Within a week, Tim was welding flanges like he'd been doing it for years. He had also made friends with some of the Japanese boys assigned to help him. They were in their early teens, not quite ready for military service, yet required to report to the factory every morning at 6 a.m. and work until 3 p.m. and then go to school until 9 p.m. Tim would work on his vocabulary with several of the boys who were interested in learning English, especially with one he'd nicknamed Babe because the boy liked baseball. Kenshi, he asked, offering Babe a cigarette during lunch break. Babe smiled and accepted. The boys liked to think they were big guys, so Tim offered them one or two Japanese cigarettes a day from the pack he'd get each week. He wasn't much of a smoker himself, so he'd trade his smokes to them in exchange for their bento, which was usually some rice wrapped in a corn husk like leaf with a tiny slice of either fish or pickled white radish to go with it. To make his supply of cigarettes last longer and to get more food in return, he cut the cigarettes in half. 
In the two months he'd been working as a welder, he'd put on several pounds and gained back some of his strength. He'd even developed a taste for the pickled white radishes. He was, however, cautious in these cigarette-for-food trades, aware that the guards would punish him if they found out. But so far, he hadn't been caught. After finishing Babe's bento, Tim relaxed, waiting for the factory whistle to end the lunch period. Instead, the quiet was interrupted by the loud, shrill wailing of an air raid siren. With everyone else, he hurried to a reinforced area of the plant. Tim listened for the drone of airplane engines overhead. In the last two months, air raid drills had become an almost daily part of the routine at the steel factory. Although there had been no actual bombings as yet, some of the men who'd been captured most recently were saying that American B-29s would soon start bombing Japan. Allegedly, these planes would be taking off from airfields being built on the recently captured Marshall and Solomon Islands. Tim had mixed feelings about these rumors. On the one hand, he wanted to see Japan leveled by American bombs. But he knew that the Iwata steel mill and the surrounding industrial complex would most likely be a primary target. He did not want to die from his own country's bombs. Soon the all-clear siren rang out, and he breathed a little easier. Sneaking into the storeroom next to the food galley, Tim looked back over his shoulder to make sure there were no guards in sight. A stack of fifty-pound burlap bags filled with soybeans sat straight ahead. Of all his limit-testing capers, he knew this one was the most daring and the one most likely to land him in the dreaded guardhouse. When he'd first spotted the unguarded stack of soybeans, he'd become fixated on pulling off this heist. He knew he couldn't steal a whole bag, but he thought he could drain out three or four pounds and cover his tracks so that they would never be missed. He planned to sneak them back to his barracks, and each day he could take a couple of pocketfuls to work and bake them with his welding torch. Quickly he moved to the stack of soybeans and pulled out a two-foot piece of bamboo he'd hidden inside his shirt. He had cased the job the previous day and knew that the bags were stapled at the top and could not be opened without cutting the bag, so he'd sliced off one end of his bamboo stick at a sharp forty-five-degree angle. With a quick jab, he punctured the side of a bag and then pulled out a pair of borrowed dungarees that he'd knotted at the cuffs. With the hollowed-out bamboo serving as a drain spout, he placed a leg of the dungarees at the end of the drain and watched as the beans flowed smoothly out of the bag, filling a part of one leg, then the other. Satisfied, he withdrew the bamboo from the bag and watched as the slit closed behind it, resealing the bag good as new. Although he'd taken more beans than he'd initially planned, it was only a hundred yards back to the barracks where he planned to stash the beans under his bunk. With the dungarees slung around his neck like an Ivy Leaguer's sweater, he slipped back out of the storeroom and headed for the barracks, trying to stay calm. But standing directly between him and his barracks was a guard, and the guard was staring directly at him. Tim continued walking, eyes straight ahead, arms folded across his chest in hopes of camouflaging his contraband. It didn't work. The guard stepped in front of him and signaled him to stop. For an instant, Tim thought about running, but he knew that would be useless. The next morning, he lay curled up in the guardhouse, barely able to move, as the other prisoners filed past him on their way to catch the train to work. Standing next to his cage, a guard angrily pointed at him. Dazudorobo, he shouted. Bean thief. Dazudorobo! 32. Bob Palmer, Ofuna A guard summoned Bob to join a work party in unloading a newly arrived truck. It held 72 cases, each containing eight cartons of Canadian Red Cross food. Bob wondered how many boxes the Japs would steal. He hoped Captain Fitzgerald, the ranking officer in the camp, would demand all of it go to the prisoners. Bob now had another reason to admire Captain Fitzgerald. The captain had started secretly keeping a journal in case an accurate account of their treatment would be needed after the war. Fitzgerald scribbled his thoughts in a small notebook he'd stolen from the hospital and kept it hidden under a plank in his cell. 
In case it was discovered, he was careful about his language. January 6, 1944. Questioned again. They have been at me every day since my capture off Penang. This time mostly political and history of naval officers in USN. Back in cell took a lot of willpower to take the last part of starch from my rice bowl in order to stick a snapshot of my wife to a piece of plywood. January 24, 1944. Twenty-one men left camp today for another camp. Was questioned again yesterday. General topic, why was the U.S. submarine force morale so high? The tobacco situation is becoming very acute. Looks like we might all become non-smokers in a couple days. I believe they are short of this commodity and no ships to provide same. Okay by me. January 25, 1944. QK again, morale of submarine force and what makes it high in U.S. Wonder what the Japs are driving at. It snowed, first I'd seen since November 41 in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Physically am much colder here, no heat whatsoever, and barracks are well ventilated. February 2, 1944, Peg's birthday. Hope to be present for the next one. Coffee and cigarette particularly good today. Exceed my chocolate ration for the occasion. February 3rd, 1944. Are we prisoners? Unarmed enemies. Have been told many times that we're not POWs and names not sent in. A hell of a note. March 3rd, 1944. Had my first piece of steak since capture was about three-sixteenths of an inch thick and about two and a half inches in diameter, was very small, but enjoyed very much. March 5th, 1944. Sleet, rain and snow, high wind and cold as hell. The most miserable day this winter. While taking the bi-weekly bath, snow was blowing into the bathroom. Slightly chilly. March 14th, 1944. Twenty men left today. I've missed five transfers out of here so far. Maybe the next time, I hope. After his entry of March 14th, Fitzgerald talked briefly with Bob during the exercise period, letting him know he'd requested that all of the men from the Grenadier be transferred to another camp, but obviously it hadn't helped. One of the reasons Bob had hoped to be transferred was that at a new camp the prisoners might be allowed to get mail. Nobody at Ofuna had received anything. Robert Coonhart stood in the doorway of Barbara's apartment on Pine Street, fumbling for the right words. In a couple of days, the sawfish would be sailing for Pearl Harbor to rejoin the war. The overhaul had taken longer than expected, and Coonhart had been in San Francisco for two months. He and Barbara had seen each other every possible chance during his leave. Sometimes she'd walk straight from her job as a file clerk at Southern Pacific and meet him for dinner. Other nights they'd go dancing or out for drinks. He was usually in his dress whites, and other patrons often bought them drinks, a way of contributing to the war effort. There was so much Barbara liked about Robert Coonhart, including the fact that he was an officer and a graduate of Annapolis where he'd been captain of the sailing team. He talked of one day becoming an admiral, Clearly he had ambition, and her parents had repeatedly told her that she should find somebody who would be able to provide for her, and not just on a sailor's salary. Coonhart had grown up in affluence in Greenwich, Connecticut. His family owned a successful import-export business and was able to send him to fancy prep schools during the Depression. He talked about taking her back east after the war to meet his family, and spoke fondly of his mom and dad. He wanted to own his own yacht and told her he'd take her to fancy lawn parties on Long Island's North Shore, like something out of The Great Gatsby, a book he loved. She couldn't remember Bob ever reading a book. Lieutenant Coonhart seemed mature and sophisticated. Barbara had never been anywhere outside of Oregon and California, and his stories of New York and Washington, D.C. sounded so worldly. She also liked to listen to him talk about the submarine and his duties as an officer. It all sounded so brave, 
yet at the same time frightening. She'd already lost Bob, and the thought of losing another man seemed unbearable. But for all the attraction and all the promise of an entree into a world of privilege and class, she wasn't yet ready to completely give up hope for Bob. It seemed almost unpatriotic. After all, they were still married. What if he was still alive? What if one day he came home and learned that she'd run off with another man? It had been only ten months since he was reported lost. What kind of wife wouldn't wait twice as long or ten times as long? Her dilemma wasn't helped by the fact that she didn't know any of the wives or family of the other men on the Grenadier. There was no one to share her grief with or seek comfort with. There was also the simple fact that he was, after all, her first true love, and down deep, she still loved him. Of all the guys she'd dated, he was the most passionate and romantic and daring. Coonhart, for all his intelligence and bright future, was a by-the-book guy. The first time she'd brought him back to her apartment, her roommate was in the hospital, she had been the one to initiate making love. You're still married, he hedged. I don't know if this is right. She assured him it was. On another occasion, he invited her to a party at the officers' club at Hunter's Point, but asked her not to tell any of the officers that she was married or that her husband was missing in action. She did as he asked, infatuated with being part of the elite world of commissioned officers, something that was never going to happen with Bob. The only possible red flag she saw with Coonhart was that he'd imbibed a little too much on a couple of occasions and had been rude to waiters. But she liked to drink, too, so it wasn't something she worried about. Standing in the doorway of her apartment, she and Kunhart fidgeted, both having trouble saying goodbye. During the two months they'd been together, he had repeatedly talked about recent American victories in the Pacific, the Marines taking Bougainville, U.S. troops invading Tarawa in the Gilbert Islands and New Britain in the Solomons, and most recently the capture of Kwajalein in the Marshall Islands. These were places she'd never heard of, but when he talked of the inevitability of a Japanese surrender, there was strength in his voice and believability in his conviction. After their final goodbye kiss, he asked if she'd wait for him to return. Of course I will, she promised. Back in the prison camp at Ofuna, Captain Fitzgerald wrote in his journal, April 16, 1944. During the past week, the rice ration has taken another 25% drop. By actual test, the quantity we now receive can and has been fitted into a teacup. It's said that rice is now short, but if so, how about the truck which backed up to the kitchen last night and hauled several bags of it away? April 17, 1944. Rations throughout Japan cut, hours to 213 grams per meal. So it looks like tightening the belt and forget it. For two years this camp has had a full bowl, now only a half bowl or less. Don't suppose we'll starve, but the midsection is somewhat lean, and this launches a bit of complaint. May 29, 1944. They must realize that Japan cannot win the war and are beginning to think what the reactions will be upon return home if this rather harsh treatment continues. Some days it's fairly good, but when it's bad, it's a bit of hell around here. June 8, 1944. Questioned by Naval J.G. He stated that if Japan were to be destroyed, so would prisoners. Therefore, we should hope for Japan's victory. My reaction and statement to that was to the effect that if this government chose to put a bullet into me, there would be nothing I could do to prevent it, and doubted that it would help the Japanese war effort. June 22, 1944. Rumor has it that more men to be transferred soon. 33. Tim Skeeter McCoy, Fukuoka No. 3. Scrunched up in his little four-foot-by-four-foot four cement cage after he was caught stealing beans, Tim heard bombs exploding in the distance, then the sound of planes high overhead. He could see Japanese guards running for cover. He knew that the main target for the bombs was the steel mill, where all of his crewmates were at work. 
It was June 15, 1944, and for the first time in the two years since Doolittle's raid on Tokyo in April 1942, American planes were attacking the Japanese homeland. In a plan implemented at the direction of President Roosevelt called Operation Matterhorn, America's newest weapon, the B-29, had been rushed into combat, its mission to destroy Japanese ability and heart to wage war. Nicknamed the Super Fortress, it was one of the most advanced bombers of its time, featuring a pressurized cabin, central fire control system, and remote-controlled machine gun turrets. Manufactured by Boeing and assembled in factories in Washington State, Kansas, Georgia, and Nebraska, the four-engine plane was designed for use primarily as a high-altitude daytime bomber, with a range of nearly 4,000 miles and a capability to fly at speeds up to 350 miles per hour and at altitudes up to 40,000 feet, which was higher than the Japanese fighters could fly and out of range of almost all anti-aircraft fire. The long-range plan was to have these planes attack Japan from bases in the Marianas, but American forces had not yet completed construction of the necessary airfields there, so President Roosevelt secured support from India and China to use bases in those countries for the attacks. This first attack was launched from Chengdu, China, with 47 B-29s all loaded with tons of bombs. Their target was the Imperial Iron and Steel Works at Yawata. For what seemed like forever, Tim lay curled in his box, helpless, listening to the explosions, worrying that his buddies were being blown to smithereens. A month had passed since the bombing. Surprisingly, little damage had been inflicted on the steel mill, and although the B-29s had been heard passing overhead again, there had been no more attacks targeting Yawata. After five excruciating days in the cement tomb, Tim had finally been released, although he was back three weeks later. This time it was because the guards had found a stash of soybeans hidden under his bunk, a stash he was convinced Trigg had planted. During his second stay in the tomb, Tim received only one small rice ball per day. The rice had been laced with rock salt, which made him thirsty a thirst that the spoonful of water he got each day didn't quench. The guards beat him repeatedly, and every day that he was caged he vowed that when he was released he'd find the gutless son of a bitch responsible for doing this to him. Neither Tim nor Trigg had made any effort to hide their dislike for each other. Tim figured that Trigg just didn't like any white people, which seemed like a tough cross to bear given that the Navy was practically all white. Tim had been raised to believe that it was best if the two races stayed apart. His dad had preached that, and so had his church. He'd never really known any blacks. Maybe if Trigg didn't have such a chip on his shoulder, whether he had good cause to or not, then maybe Tim wouldn't think he was such a prick. On more than one occasion, Tim had called him a dumb nigger. But so had everyone else on the crew, including Captain Fitzgerald. Tim was clearly not alone in his dislike of Trigg, and the animosity had gotten worse since they'd been captured. Everyone believed that Trigg had been getting special treatment from the guards. Nobody could remember him getting interrogated in Penang. He hadn't been beaten as much, and he always seemed to be served more food. Plus, he often played sick to get out of work at the steel mill, and somehow got himself assigned to the galley where he had access to the food supply. More than the other prisoners, he had maintained his weight and was still an imposing figure. But Tim wasn't intimidated. He pushed himself off his bunk and stormed in Trigg's direction. Get out of that bed, he screamed. Trigg didn't budge. What's your problem, he said. You planted those fucking beans, yelled Tim. No, I didn't, Trigg replied. Tim reached down and grabbed him by the shirt jerking him to his feet. Goddamn liar! Trigg lunged at Tim, grabbing the wooden dog tag that hung by a chain from his neck. He pulled him toward him, their faces now a foot apart. Let go, warned Tim. Trigg twisted harder, Tim's face turning red. With a strong upward sweep of his forearm, Tim knocked Trigg's hand loose from its grip. 
Before Trigg could react, Tim took a quick step back and kicked him as hard as he could right square in the balls. Trigg crumpled to the floor, writhing in pain. Tim turned and returned to his bunk, congratulated by his crewmates. 34. Gordy Cox, Fukuoka No. 3 Nursing two black eyes and a broken nose, Gordy sat on the edge of his bunk, wondering if this hell was ever going to end. It was July 1944. The previous day, Water Snake, an 18-year-old civilian pusher at the mill, had beaten him senseless for no reason. Gordy's face was so swollen he was hard to recognize. Are you going to take a bath? asked Tim. Gordy shook his head, an emphatic no. The prison compound included a bathhouse with two separate rooms, one for the Japanese guards, the other for prisoners, each room with a large concrete tub big enough to hold fifty to sixty men at a time. For the prisoners, the order of bathing was rotated by barracks number between the twelve barracks and twelve hundred men. By the time the second barracks had finished bathing, the water was always filthy, and like most of the crew, Gordy skipped bathing most evenings. Some evenings the layer of scum on top of the water looked thick enough to walk on. Gordy never bathed when the two barracks with the Indian prisoners went ahead of him. Most of the Indians worked all day loading coal, and by the time they returned to camp they were caked with black soot and sometimes they washed their clothes in the tub, which was supposedly forbidden. It was Gordy's impression that the Japanese still believed they could convert the Indians to their side, so they let them do things other prisoners couldn't. He watched as some of his crewmates headed down to the bathhouse. This evening he was passing the time picking bedbugs. It had become almost a sport for him to see how many he could kill. Of the many aggravations and hardships of prison camp, Perhaps the most irritating were the bedbugs and lice. Gordy wasn't always certain which bug was which. He just knew that most days they drove him nuts. The mat he slept on was always crawling with them, and sometimes when the person on the top bunk lay down, it unleashed a downpour of bugs. The bugs had crept their way into just about everything. Clothes, food, hair, ears. But at least it was better than the infestation of crabs that some of the men had brought with them when they were first captured and taken to Penang. By now, most of the men, including Gordy, had shaved their heads in an effort to help relieve the discomfort. Many mornings his prison clothes would be filled with bugs. Prisoners were allowed to wash their clothes once a month, and within a day the lice and bedbugs were back. Still, Gordy considered himself lucky. A pusher at the pipe shop sometimes let him boil his clothes in a big pot next to the furnace. Gordy watched a guard slowly make his way through the barracks, checking to make sure nobody was lying down yet. The rule was that prisoners weren't allowed to lie on their bunk until lights out, which meant no naps or resting in a prone position, not even after a twelve-hour workday. The guard eyed Gordy picking at the bugs. It struck Gordy that the guards and workers in the plant, who were infested with the lice and bedbugs just as badly as the prisoners, were not bothered by them. Maybe they'd just gotten used to it, he thought. Or maybe the Japs were truly different, and were as oblivious to the bugs around them as they were to all the pain and suffering. Gordy reached up and plucked a louse from his eyebrow. Resting on his shovel, Gordy glanced to the sky first spotting the vapor trail, then the sun glistening off the plane. He didn't know what kind of plane it was, only that it was American, and that almost every day it flew overhead, too high for Japanese anti-aircraft. Initially the Japanese had tried shooting it down, but the shells exploded halfway to their target. They'd tried to scramble fighter planes up to get it, but they couldn't get close enough. Gordy had never seen the plane drop any bombs, it just flew in the same direction at about the same time every afternoon. To Gordy, it was a magnificent sight. As a guard stationed nearby edged toward him, Gordy looked back down and resumed shoveling in the sandy dirt. A few days earlier he'd learned his lesson the hard way when a guard caught him staring at the plane. He'd absorbed a few raps alongside the head for that little mistake. 
It almost made him laugh. It was as if these guards believed that the plane would disappear if the prisoners didn't watch it. Clearly it was making them jittery. Gordy continued shoveling. For over a week he had been too sick to go to work at the pipe shop, but not sick enough to be confined to the hospital. The ambulatory sick, like Gordy, were assigned jobs around the camp. Gordy was part of a crew digging a bomb shelter behind the camp. To him, this was just another case of how dumb his captors were. Digging was a lot more strenuous than his work at the pipe shop. But he learned early on in his captivity that logic didn't always apply here. The prisoners had taken to calling the plane Photo Joe, speculating it was taking reconnaissance pictures, gathering information for an impending invasion. The guards had threatened that if indeed there was an invasion, all the prisoners would be marched down to Moji Bay lined up at the shoreline and gunned down, letting the tide carry their bodies out to sea. Gordy wondered again if it would be better to take a bullet between the eyes rather than die an ugly death of starvation. Plus it would mean that the Japs were about to get slaughtered in their own backyard. With Photo Joe out of sight, he turned his attention to the sand fleas. It wasn't the exhaustion of shoveling the dirt that wore on him as much as it was the sand fleas. Each new turn of earth unleashed more of these biting, hopping little crustaceans, which could jump ten inches, making the pale ankles of the prisoners the perfect target. Gordy's ankles were covered with welts and lesions, and it was hard to keep from scratching. He paused, remembering the bugs he'd encountered when he and his brothers and parents slept on the ground when they were picking fruit back in the Yakima Valley during the Depression. He was twelve then. He thought about how hungry he'd get working those long days in the fields, and how some of his classmates called him an Oki. Eight years later, as he reached down to knock away the sand fleas, those seemed like good times. After a week of missing work, Gordy convinced the Japanese doctor at the hospital that he was well enough to return to his job at the pipe shop. He wanted to work not so much because he was feeling better, but because prisoners received more food at the steel mill. There were also more guards around the barracks, most of them with nothing better to do than make life miserable for the prisoners, showing off to each other about how sadistic they could be. In the pipe shop, Gordy could usually breathe a little easier, except when Water Snake, so named because of the way he slithered and snuck around, was on duty. Water Snake seemed to take special pride in picking on Gordy, maybe because Gordy was one of the smaller POWs. Gordy was looking forward to lunch. Rumor had it that all the POWs at the pipe shop would be receiving a Red Cross food box on this day. So far, no Red Cross supplies had reached the prisoners at Fukuoka No. 3. He took a seat at a lunch table across from Tim. Unlike Tim, Gordy hadn't gotten involved in any stealing and bartering on a regular basis. There was one time when he and another prisoner mustered up enough courage to steal some peanut oil and to trade it with some Javanese prisoners for rice. They smuggled it past the guards in a canteen, but Gordy was so nervous that he said that was the last time he'd try something like that. He'd been the same way as a young boy. When the other boys dared him to steal a candy bar, he wouldn't, not because of some higher moral code, but because he didn't want to get caught. Waiting at the lunch table with Tim, Chuck, and Robert York, Gordy spotted a guard heading their way. He was carrying one Red Cross box. For several months, Red Cross packages had been arriving in camp, but the Japanese were using them for themselves. The prisoners knew this and had repeatedly complained, but to no avail. Sometimes the guards would eat from one of the packages right in front of the prisoners, just to taunt them. Attempts to sneak into the warehouse where the boxes were stored and steal some of them had become a regular, if not always successful, occurrence. When an attempt to steal boxes was successful, the contents were like gold. Sometimes the thief devoured the food himself. Other times he'd use it in trade. Nothing on the black market commanded as much in return. But when the Japanese suspected someone had stolen one of the boxes, everyone paid the price guards trashing the barracks trying to find the stolen goods. And if they couldn't find the contraband, then they marched everyone outside and made them stand at attention all night. The guards stopped at their table and set down the box, 
indicating that its contents were to be divided among the four men. Gordy opened the box and looked inside. It contained a three-ounce can of sardines, a biscuit, four prunes, and a chocolate bar. As meager as the contents were, it looked like Christmas dinner to Gordy and the others. They divided the sardines, biscuit, and chocolate bar into four equal portions. Each man got a prune. As Gordy put his piece of chocolate into his pocket to save for later, he looked up and saw a water snake coming toward him, hand extended, demanding the prune. Three days later, Gordy sat in the barracks, listening to the exploding bombs in the distance and hoping that his crewmates at the mill weren't dead. He hadn't gone to work on this day, August 20th, 1944, because his left eye was swollen shut. Watersnake had celebrated his last day before heading off to the army by taking a welding arc and torching his left eye, just because he could. Dr. Markowitz told Gordy he was lucky that he didn't lose the eye. The bombing had started around noon. Even though the camp was several miles from the factory and separated by a hill, Gordy could clearly see the bombers. Shortly after the first wave of B-29s had appeared, flying much lower than Photo Joe, Akak fire peppered the sky, and over a hundred Japanese fighters went up after them. From his vantage point, Gordy saw one of the fighters fly directly into a B-29's wing, both planes exploding, the debris hitting another B-29 and bringing it down as well. He saw another Jap fighter shoot down a B-29, and when the pilot and crew bailed out, the fighter opened machine gun fire on them as they floated down in their parachutes. One of the men's chutes didn't open, and Gordy saw him fall to his death. He watched as another fighter blew the tail off of another B-29, and the plane spiraled to the ground like a leaf in a strong wind. With the war now going badly for the Japanese, the B-29 raids launched from the China-Burma-India theater were beginning to strike terror into the hearts of the Japanese public. Because of the long-distance fuel problems the B-29s were experiencing, they had been forced to reduce weight by carrying smaller bomb loads. They were not flying in formation and were at a lower, more dangerous altitude, 27,000 feet, to take advantage of the jet stream. At this level, they were vulnerable to Japanese planes and anti-aircraft fire. As ill-equipped to defend the home islands as it was, the Japanese Army Air Force, with the help of recently improved radar, had thrown itself fully into the task of stopping the B-29s. When earlier attempts to repel the higher-flying B-29s through conventional means had been unsuccessful, Japanese pilots had formed specialist ramming flights, and this was the first time the strategy had been put to use. From Gordy's viewpoint, it appeared to be having success. Finally, seven hours after the attack had begun, the last of the B-29s turned and headed back toward China. The prisoners from the steel mill straggled back into camp. Gordy met them as they entered the barracks. To his surprise, there had been no casualties among the prisoners. They had spent the duration of the raid in one of the recently built bomb shelters. The bombs had fallen all around the steel mill, but somehow had missed the target. A few sand flea bites, said Tim. That's it. 35. Chuck Vervalen, Fukuoka No. 3 Chuck could hear the screams of one of the downed B-29 pilots, reminding him of the agonizing cries he'd heard from Captain Fitzgerald back in Penang. He hadn't seen any of the downed pilots yet, but everyone in camp knew they were there. If the men of the Grenadier had been the Japanese's most prized prisoners, the B-29 pilots had now replaced them. Like most of the prisoners, except for those who'd grown up on the West Coast, where most Japanese Americans lived, Chuck had not known any Japanese growing up. In the year and a half of captivity, he'd learned to hate them with every fiber in his body. To him, they were Japs, Nips, Slant Eyes, Yellow-Bellied Cockroaches, Buck-Toothed Yellow Monkeys. He went to sleep every night hating them, and woke up every morning hating them even more. During the build-up to the war, Chuck had thought the war in the Pacific was about halting Japan's expansionism. 
After the attack on Pearl Harbor, for him, revenge was a motivating factor. But now that he had experienced how much the Japanese people hated whites, it was about race, a primal conflict of good versus evil. He'd listened to the guards and interpreters harangue the men about their almighty warrior code of Bushido and how in their eyes the men, white, Chinese, Korean, who'd allowed themselves to be captured, did not deserve respect, mercy, or restraint, and were despicable and deserved to die. Maybe the Japanese weren't putting people in gas chambers like the Germans, but they were driving them to their deaths by the tens of thousands just the same, by starvation, malnourishment, dysentery, malaria, pneumonia, and beriberi. They beat them for no reason, then told them that the only reason that they were being allowed to live was that the emperor had graciously spared their lives. To Chuck, the Japanese were alien, grotesque, sadistic, brutal, and inhuman, and it scared him to think that at the time of his capture they ruled millions of square miles of the world, China, the Philippines, Southeast Asia, and a large part of the Pacific. With so many POWs dying, Chuck had sat in on more than one conversation about survival. What allowed some men to keep going, whereas others gave up? No simple answer emerged. Some men said it was religion that kept them going. Some said it was focusing on home and loved ones, while others contended that it was easier for single guys because they didn't have a wife or children to worry about. Some thought it was easier for married guys because they had somebody waiting for them at home and they could escape to thoughts of being together again. Chuck didn't think marital status had anything to do with it. Chuck concluded that, whatever it was, he had to believe that life was still worth living and that he needed something to focus on, even if it was hatred of his captors, even if it was staying alive just to see these Jap bastards have to pay for their savage ways. But he couldn't say for sure why he was alive and others, such as his good friend Charles Doyle, died. Maybe it was easier for men like him, who had never had much in the way of luxury and didn't expect too much out of life, who knew more about hard work and grit and getting up before sunrise. Chuck took comfort in a sense of brotherhood, the shared POW experience, though with 1,200 men in the camp it wasn't one big united tribe. There were eight nationalities in the camp, American, British, Australian, Indian, Javanese, Dutch, Chinese, Portuguese, and everyone pretty much stuck close to his fellow countrymen. There was little fraternization among nationalities. Half the prisoners were Americans, and although they shared a natural patriotic bond, Army, Marine, and Navy personnel stayed primarily with others of the same service. Chuck noticed a special closeness within the Marines, maybe even tighter than the togetherness that he and his fellow submariners shared. He had developed a friendship with one of the Marines, Eugene Lutz, and they had even talked about getting together back home. As far as Chuck was concerned, the guys who caused trouble, like Tim, were taking too big a risk. Survival was a lot easier, he calculated, if you did everything possible to stay invisible, like he and Gordy. But maybe, in the end, none of it made any difference. Survival was a mystery. Sometimes strong men died and weak ones lived. It was like his poker games, he concluded. It just came down to the luck of the draw. The will to live was a gift. Maybe it was an exercise in futility, but Chuck was writing a letter to Gwen back in Australia. Nothing gave him hope like his thoughts of Gwen and those glorious weeks they'd spent together in Perth and Fremantle. But he knew there was no guarantee the letter would be sent. For the prisoners, the chance to send a letter was given randomly, often months apart. It was another form of torture. Their words were tightly scripted, allowed only on a pre-worded card with no chance for real communication. I am interned at blank. My health is good slash fair slash poor. I work in a blank. I am treated well slash exceptional. Please say hi to blank. I look forward to blank. Chuck knew that circling the more positive choice about his treatment did not improve the chances that the card would be sent. 
Recently, a batch of cards written two months before had been found in a bag in a storage room, a discovery that sucked the wind out of the prisoners, including Chuck. Some of the men had received a letter from home, but Chuck had not. For the men who'd gotten letters, they were a lifeline. Some shared their letters, others hoarded them, a treasure more nourishing than food. They read them over and over and carried them everywhere, kissing them, pressing them against their hearts. He closed his message to Gwen the same stilted way he had with his other letters to her. I look forward to seeing you again after the war. He hoped she could read between the lines, if she ever got it. Lying in bed, Chuck debated whether to chance going to the bathroom. Getting up in the middle of the night and walking through the darkened barracks was not easy. For one thing, there was the matter of the latrines. As disgusting as the bathing situation was in the camp, going to the toilet was even worse. The supply of toilet paper was always low, and the paper had the texture of fifty-grit sandpaper. The stench from the latrines was constant, especially at night when the air was calmer. The tank was supposed to be emptied regularly, but it rarely was, and often overflowed. The job of cleaning it fell to the men in sick bay. They dipped the waste out with buckets and carried it to a small garden between the barracks where they poured it out as fertilizer. Oftentimes guards would push them, spilling the contents of their buckets onto their legs. Chuck continued his mental debate about a latrine run. Despite the exhaustion from a twelve-hour workday, sleep did not always come easily. As a child, he'd shared a bedroom with as many as six siblings, but here a hundred men were crammed into one barracks. At least back home he had had a pillow and blankets and clean sheets and a mattress, things he knew he'd never take for granted if he survived. The night was punctuated by men tossing and turning and snoring. Many of the prisoners had nightmares. They yelled out in their sleep, sometimes waking everyone close by. There were also men with happy feet, a painful condition caused by vitamin deficiency that affected the nerve endings in the feet, causing men to moan and groan through the night or get up and shuffle back and forth through the barracks hoping for relief. But those men were few compared with the number of prisoners with dysentery who had to take endless trips to the Benjo. Deciding he couldn't hold out until morning, Chuck rolled out of his bunk and tiptoed across the wooden planks of the barracks toward the latrine. Tonight the stench was especially bad. At the end of the barracks, he saw a shadowy figure, and he paused, debating whether to return to his bunk. Too many times he'd heard men make their way to the latrine in the middle of the night, only to be intercepted by a bored guard assigned to the night watch with nothing better to do than administer a random beating. Before Chuck could turn around, the figure moved toward him. He braced himself. There's no toilet paper, the man whispered. Chuck recognized his buddy, Eugene Lutz. Chuck resumed his course. He hoped someone had left a Japanese newspaper or some scraps of paper on the floor. As a boy, his family had often had to make do without toilet paper, sometimes using pages from a Sears catalog which by his analysis were softer than the toilet paper the Japanese supplied. In any case, he wasn't going to use the Dutch method. Like most of the other American prisoners, Chuck shared a lack of respect for the Dutch, partly because of what he perceived as their grumpy demeanor and partly because of their propensity for not using toilet paper, a habit that even in the squalor of the prison camp Chuck found disgusting. Able to scrape together enough pieces of paper, he finished his business, as flies buzzed around his head and fleas clung to his legs. He stumbled back through the darkness to his bunk. Not wanting to disturb Johnny Johnson sleeping next to him, he lay motionless, feeling the bedbugs crawling over his legs and biting his legs so hard it felt as if they were taking a blood bank donation. Hearing the grumbling and seeing the angry glares, Chuck slammed down his serving ladle and clenched his fist, ready to fight. It was dinner time, and Chuck had recently been put in charge of dishing up the rice. In a world where every grain of rice and sip of soup mattered, the man serving the food was God, only more closely scrutinized. 
At every meal, prisoners examined their portions like lab scientists, comparing it with others. If they thought they got less, they shouted or whined, and tempers often flared. The job of server was coveted, and of all the jobs in camp, it was the most political in nature. In Chuck's case, the ranking officer in his barracks had appointed him because he thought that Chuck could be fair and magnanimous, and that he was tough enough to fend off the criticisms and threats he would surely get. Chuck and the other servers went to the galley before every meal and filled up large pots with rice and the watery gruel the men called tojo soup. After carrying the pots back to the barracks, the server dished out equal portions to all the men. No matter who was serving, the others accused him of favoritism, or of taking a hefty portion for himself before even leaving the galley. Every prisoner's biggest concern was food, or lack of it, and obtaining it was every man's obsession. Almost all the deaths in camp were a result, directly or indirectly, of malnutrition. For Chuck, it was excruciating to watch once healthy men turn into skeletons or see once proud men rummaging through garbage cans, hoping to find a guard's discarded orange peel. Chuck didn't think anyone back home could possibly understand the extent to which hunger controlled his every waking hour. He compared it to his sex drive when he was a teenager. But now, if he could choose between a plate of meat and potatoes and a naked movie star, the plate of meat and potatoes would win. When Chuck looked around the camp, he feared that most of the men wouldn't survive another winter, including Gordy, who was deteriorating daily. Pneumonia would most likely reach out and take them. But as much as he wanted to serve a larger portion to the most desperate, too many others were studying his every move. Chuck didn't understand why some of the men faked illness in order to get out of work. He called them babies. Chuck still hadn't missed a day of work and figured he'd have to be on his deathbed before he would. It was well known that the Japanese, as a way to encourage productivity, served larger lunch portions to those who worked. There were others, however, who calculated that a hard day's labor would use far more energy than a few extra grains of rice could ever replenish, and so a camp doctrine of malingering was firmly in place. Chuck also couldn't understand why some guys willingly traded rice for cigarettes. That was suicidal in his book, although on more than one occasion he had paid off a poker loss with a serving of rice. There were a few among the crew who believed he did it by skimming off a little rice from the serving pots. Everyone in camp knew that to the Japanese, rice was life itself. One interpreter told Chuck that the Japanese had captured all the rice on earth, and without it the rest of the world was doomed. But the rice served in camp tasted like mushy, goopy grits, only without any flavor. Half the time there were flies in it, and sometimes maggots. According to the Geneva Conventions, prisoners were supposed to be fed food from their national and cultural background, but everyone in Fukuoka No. 3 knew better than to expect that. Of all the food cravings Chuck had, that for sugar was the worst. He would have gladly traded five bowls of rice for one more can of sweet cling peaches like the ones he'd had just before he dove off the submarine. Like everyone else, he hoped that more Red Cross parcels would arrive soon, and each prisoner would be given his fair share. Then maybe the guys would stop accusing him of cheating them out of food. Chuck had just finished his lunch in the pipe shop when he noticed Babe, one of the young pushers, coming toward him wearing a big grin. He was holding something behind his back. Chuck retreated a step, not sure what to think. Of all the pushers, he trusted Babe the most, but experience had taught Chuck not to trust any Japanese completely. A couple of days earlier, a piece of pipe had needed to be bent, and when nobody else was able to get the job done, Chuck took a big sledgehammer and, wielding it like a baseball bat, shaped the pipe. Babe pulled his hand from behind his back and thrust it toward Chuck. In it, he had two baseball gloves and a ball. He extended a glove toward Chuck, clearly an invitation to play catch. Chuck nodded, following him outside to a paved area. Without speaking, they began tossing the ball back and forth. Chuck smiled, 
enjoying the moment. He loved baseball, and this brought back memories of all the games he'd played as a kid and the endless summer hours he'd spent at the ball field, using bats held together by electrical tape and balls coming apart at the stitches, pretending he was Babe Ruth or Lou Gehrig. Earlier in the summer, one of the interpreters had said that Ted Williams of the Red Sox and Bob Feller of the Indians had both been killed in action. Chuck doubted that it was true, but he knew that FDR had declared that major leaguers were not exempt from serving. Williams had enlisted as a Marine pilot, and Feller had joined the Navy. Usually news arrived in camp by way of recently captured prisoners, but it was always hard to tell fact from fiction. Rumors were a constant. In the past few months, Chuck had heard plenty of them. Every POW was going to get a brand new Ford when he arrived home. The Queen Mary had been sunk. Bob Hope had died in a plane crash. Malnutrition caused sterility. He and Babe continued their game of catch, each putting a little more zing on their throws. Chuck's arm felt surprisingly good. When he was in high school and played on the town team, some of the older players liked to play burnout with him, a game of hardball chicken where two players stood fifty feet apart and threw progressively harder until they were firing as hard as they could and someone either cried uncle or got hit. He wondered if Babe knew the game. A few POWs and about a half dozen guards and pushers had gathered to watch them play. The news the POWs most wanted to hear, of course, was about the progress of the war. By the end of the summer of 1944, a lot of positive news had reached camp, giving cause for hope. The Allies had invaded France at Normandy, and the Germans were on the run. The Marines had invaded Saipan and Guam in the Marianas, and were building airstrips that would make it much easier to launch air raids on Japan. There was also word that American subs were wreaking havoc on Japanese shipping and cutting off their supply lines. The most recent rumor was that MacArthur was getting ready to retake the Philippines. There was no way to confirm any of these rumors, but Chuck wanted to believe. Soon he and Babe were throwing hard. Some of Babe's throws were starting to sting his hand. The flimsy glove offered little padding. Babe smiled. He was handling Chuck's throws with little effort. Chuck knew he could advance their friendly game of catch to a full-scale game of burnout, confident he had a better arm than Babe. It would be a nice little victory, a statement of American superiority. But what if he lost? Then again, if he won, Babe and the guards might be pissed and take it out on him and the other POWs, like the three Marines who had won a race against the guards. Deciding he was in a no-win situation, he eased up on his throws, and the lunch period ended with him and Babe back to where they started, a nice game of soft-toss catch, both of them smiling. 36. Bob Palmer, Ashio. Exhausted, Bob stood in front of the smelter at the Ashio copper mine, about to start the three-mile trudge back down the hill to the prison camp. It was March 1944. Bob and eleven of his grenadier crewmates had recently been transferred from the interrogation camp at Ofuna to the prison camp at Ashio, a small mountainous town of 2,000 located about a hundred miles northwest of Tokyo. He and the others had suffered through six brutal months at Ofuna before the Japanese decided that they couldn't beat any more useful information out of them and that they would be more valuable as slave laborers at the copper mine. Captain Fitzgerald and his top officers were still at Ofuna. Ashio was the site of the largest copper mine in Japan, producing 26% of the country's total output and playing a significant role in the development of Japan's economy. In the build-up to the war, the Ashio mine, by meeting increased demand needed for both foreign exchange and military purposes, was part of the foundation upon which Japan's imperialism was being built. But even within the country, it had become hugely controversial and the site of riots and environmental challenges. In its two centuries of existence, the mine's zealous pursuit of full production had eroded the surrounding hills, poisoned the farmland, 
and turned hundreds of square miles into an absolute wasteland. The once healthy forest that surrounded the refinery had been completely denuded. The sulfurous anhydrite from the smoke produced by the mining and smelting machinery had caused intractable pollution problems. Over the years, raging floods had carried poisonous waste from the mines, devastating the area's rich agricultural ecosystem, depositing monstrous slag piles, and causing massive fish kills in the nearby Watarase River. But it was not ecological issues that Bob thought about as he continued slogging down the hill toward the camp. It was the angry citizens lining the road ahead, almost rabid in their hatred of America, every day a chance to spew their venom at the dirty, disheveled white men filing through their little town. A gob of spit hit Bob on his cheek. He slowed, glancing to his left, eyeing a woman a few feet away, his instinct to grab her by the neck. He kept walking. Sitting in her small apartment on Pine Street in San Francisco, Barbara read the certified letter from the Navy Department dated May 29, 1944, two months after she had said a tearful goodbye to Robert Coonhart. Dear Mrs. Palmer, You have previously been informed by this bureau that your husband, Robert Wiley Palmer, Yeoman First Class, United States Navy, was being carried on the records of the Navy Department in the status of missing. He was on board the USS Grenadier when that submarine was reported overdue and presumed lost from a mission against enemy shipping in the South Pacific area. Pursuant to the provisions of Public Law 490, as amended, the Secretary of the Navy has given careful consideration to the circumstances surrounding the disappearance of your husband. In view of the fact that the list of prisoners made available by the Japanese through the medium of the International Red Cross have included the names of some of the personnel of the Grenadier, and because the possibility that your husband may be an unreported prisoner of war, the Secretary of the Navy has directed that he be continued in a missing status until information is received or other circumstances occur which would indicate that he should no longer be continued in this status. By operation of law, your husband's pay will be credited to his account and any allotment registered in behalf of his dependents or for the payment of insurance premiums will be continued so long as he is carried in a missing status. The Navy Department is aware of the anxiety experienced by the relatives of those men whose fate remains undetermined. You are assured that you will be promptly informed upon receipt of further information concerning your husband. Sincerely yours, a. S. Jacobs, Commander, USNR, Head of Casualties and Allotments. Barbara reread the letter. On the one hand, she was thrilled to learn that Bob had not been declared dead. But what if he was alive? She was now in love with another man, a man she was convinced could provide a better future, a man to whom she'd made love and written love letters. Bob had Berry Berry. By his estimate, half of the 275 prisoners at Ashio had it, the ones who had it the worst, paralyzed from the waist down. Those men were housed in the sick room, or as the other prisoners called it, the death hut. Bob wasn't ready to check himself into the death hut, not yet anyway, but he knew his condition was deteriorating. On this morning, instead of going to work at the smelter, he headed for the death hut in search of some sort of treatment. It wasn't his first visit. Like all the prison camps in Japan, the medical facilities and treatment at Ashio were severely lacking. Red Cross medical parcels had been received, but the supplies were limited. On a couple of occasions, Bob had received a vitamin B1 shot, and although the shots had not eliminated the beriberi, they had at least provided him with enough relief that he could go back to work. He appreciated that, because no work meant less food. The word beriberi derives from a Sinhalese phrase meaning I cannot, I cannot, which seemed fitting to him. Because of his impaired sensory perception, weakness and pain in his limbs, irregular heartbeat and swelling in his legs, the long walk to the smelter felt like climbing Mount Fuji. Some days he just couldn't do it. Another symptom was a weakening of his emotional state. For most of his life, even back in high school when his stepmother Cora was treating him badly or Barbara's father had forbidden her to date him any longer, 
he'd somehow kept his spirits up. But lately, especially since being transferred from Ofuna, he felt a gathering sense of hopelessness and doom. Approaching the sick room, he hoped Dr. Dullin would be there. He wasn't sure how Dr. Dullin had been captured, but he knew the doctor had little to work with in terms of supplies. If Dullin wasn't there, he would have to see Katoku, one of the guards, or Kato as the prisoners called him. To them he was a bit of a comical figure, often strutting officiously around camp carrying a riding crop that he liked to beat against his shiny black riding breeches. He also served as a medical practitioner and liked to experiment on prisoners with what some of the men referred to as his voodoo medicine. He'd treated Bob several times by shredding some sort of herbal root and rolling it into a ball, and then placing it on Bob's leg, arm, or stomach and lighting it with a firecracker-like punk. It would smoke and stink and burn, and, as far as Bob could tell, accomplish nothing except to leave a blister on his skin. Cato's treatments seemed more humorous than anything else especially the time Bob watched him treat a prisoner for hemorrhoids by placing one of the balls on the man's head. After it was lit, the prisoner looked like he had smoke pouring out of his ears. He got no relief from the hemorrhoids. Bob's heart sank as he entered the sick room. Cato was right there to greet him, telling him that he wasn't going to use the burning herb treatment. Today, he was going to try acupuncture. Bob had never heard of it. When Cato pulled out a very long needle, Bob winced, guessing it was two feet long. Already leery of Japanese medical treatment, he knew that Japanese doctors were using Americans for medical experiments, and he didn't want to be part of it. But he also knew he had no choice. He recalled the time he'd held down Pappy Boyington while the quack operated on him without any anesthesia. Certainly this couldn't be that bad. Cato stuck the pin in his swollen abdomen, then removed it and made two more punctures in the form of a triangle. The pin went in easily. There was no fat in the way. It wasn't painful. Cato repeated the process in Bob's knees and elbows. That didn't hurt either. In fact, to Bob, the procedure didn't seem to be doing anything except annoy him. Cato had Bob sit on the edge of a table while he stuck the needle into the back of his neck and began angling it down his spine, deeper and deeper, until it was almost all the way to his tailbone. Then slowly he removed it. Cato then felt Bob's face. Very swollen, he said. This help. He pressed the needle into Bob's temple, breaking the skin, and then wiggling it back and forth, pushing it deeper. Bob held his breath. Dozens of Chinese prisoners were working in the mines at Ashio, and Bob suspected that they had taught acupuncture to Cato. However he had learned it, Bob's condition hadn't improved. At least this procedure had no ill effects other than rattling his nerves. Even though he sometimes had difficulty telling the Chinese from the Japanese, he was sympathetic to the Chinese prisoners' fate. In some ways it seemed as if they had it even worse than the Americans. Indeed, the Japanese had adopted a practice known as laborer hunting, abducting Chinese from their North China farm fields at Bayonet Point and bringing them to Japan as slave labor. A high percentage of these laborers died in transit to the Ashio worksite. Many arrived physically weak, and even though they were starving, they still had to work. Japanese prison camp officials gave detailed instructions covering all aspects of camp life for Chinese prisoners throughout Japan. The specific directives given to control the Chinese prisoners at Ashio included the following. 1. Be overpowering as method of control. 2. When you capture runaways, do not let them return to the camp and work again. If they are allowed to return, other workers will be relieved to see that runaways are not killed, causing others to flee. 3. Make their living quarters as shabby as possible. 4. Make the food as poor as possible and consider it to be fodder. They should be given mostly bran, corn, or leeks, not rice or wheat. Feed them according to the diligence of their work. It was November 1944, and the snow was already falling at Ashio. Given his steadily declining physical condition, and the woefully inadequate clothing for the cold, Bob worried that he wouldn't be able to survive the winter. 
At night, the temperature in his barracks fell below freezing. Still, he continued to work. To determine if a POW was still fit to work, they were required to stand naked in front of a guard and do a knee bend. Those that could worked. Bob's jobs at the smelter varied. Some days he loaded the furnace. On others he helped push the ore cars up to the blast furnace. And on the days the furnace wasn't working properly, he helped repair it. Because of the fumes, he had to wear a respirator. One evening, Bob sat down next to Ed Keller, one of the twenty surviving men from the crew of the Sculpin. That sub's captain, John Cromwell, had ordered it scuttled after it had been hit and had gone down with his ship. Keller knew why Bob was there, to drool over his latest creation. Since arriving in camp, Keller had kept a diary filled with recipes for pies, cakes, and other desserts. He called it the POW Cookbook, the recipes were detailed masterpieces listing every ingredient and step of the procedures. Like other prisoners, Bob liked to read the recipes. He imagined sitting down at a table with Barbara and slowly savoring every delicious, mouth-watering bite. Every week he anxiously awaited Keller's newest pie recipe, each one providing another escape for him. Almond, chocolate custard, peach, pumpkin, raisin nut, rhubarb meringue, peanut butter, eggnog, strawberry chiffon, strawberry mousse. What you got today? asked Bob. It was a cheese pie, explained Keller, handing Bob the recipe. Fill pie shell with mixture of one-half pound cottage cheese, one-half pound Philadelphia cream cheese, one cup sugar, two tablespoons melted butter, eight egg yolks, six egg whites, one-half cup cream, one-half teaspoon vanilla, one-half teaspoon baking powder, and one-half cup of pineapple. Beat mixture until fluffy with rotary beater. Chill unprepared pie in icebox, then bake in 400-degree oven to glaze pastry, then reduce heat to 275 for about 20 minutes. Bob finished reading the recipe. I'll take two, he said. Bob sat on the edge of his bunk, trying to finish the scripted postcard to Barbara. Since arriving at Ashio, he and the other crew members had been registered as prisoners of war. On a couple of occasions, they'd been allowed to share a Red Cross parcel. They were also allowed to send a card home once a month. Bob had written faithfully, but he had no idea if the cards had been sent. A few of the men had received letters from home, but he'd received nothing from Barbara. Today he was having trouble focusing. Maybe it was the cold. The previous day, the guards had made him and the other prisoners stand out in the snow naked for seven hours, making him wonder if the guards weren't sexually perverted. Or maybe he was depressed, finally going over to the dark side. For the past couple of months, he'd felt his mind slipping almost as much as his body. Every morning he woke up and wanted to just play dead. No thoughts, no anything. The idea of working another day in the smelter was almost too much to bear. His beriberi had gotten worse, and his legs were so swollen that every step felt like all the capillaries in his body would explode. Life had become an endless crawl through a fog. He'd thought about going to the death hut and just letting himself die with as much dignity as possible. But then he thought about Barbara, and he willed himself to survive the day, and the next one, and the one after that. But on this day, he was too weak to finish his letter or even think about another slice of cheese pie. Part 7. Saved by the Bombs 37. Tim Skeeter McCoy, Fukuoka No. 3 Jarred out of sleep in the middle of the night by the air raid siren, Tim McCoy rolled out of his bunk to join the other hundred men lining up by the front opening of the barracks. It was mid-March, 1945. These middle-of-the-night air raid alerts had become an almost nightly feature of life at Fukuoka No. 3, and they were increasingly irritating for Tim and everyone else. It was the same drill every night. Spend two or three hours huddled and shivering in the shelter, return to the barracks, and then get up in a couple of hours and trudge off to work in the steel mill, exhausted and sleep-deprived. Part of what made the air raids wearisome was that nothing ever happened. Rumor had it that a lot of other parts of Japan were getting bombed, 
but so far not Fukuoka or Yawata. Surprisingly, at least to the POWs, the Americans hadn't bombed the nearby power plant, which seemed to be such an inviting target with its six huge smokestacks. Not that the men were complaining. They all knew that a bombing raid on the power plant most certainly would spell doom for them. With the American invasion and capture of Saipan, Guam, and Tinian in the Marianas, America's bombing strategy had changed. The first attack launched from the Marianas targeted the Nakajima Aircraft Company's Musashi engine plant just outside Tokyo on November 24, 1944. A total of 111 B-29s took off, but engine problems, cloud cover, and a jet stream with winds as high as 200 miles per hour at precisely the high altitudes the planes were flying made accurate bombing impossible. Only 24 of the planes dropped their bombs anywhere close to the intended target. Damage was minimal. In December and January, the bombing raids across Japan continued, but in addition to the other problems faced by the American planes, Japanese defenses were becoming more effective. The Americans suffered considerable losses, and many of the captured downed airmen were beheaded. In late January 1945, General Curtis LeMay was transferred to run the B-29 campaign from the Marianas and improve the success ratio. LeMay temporarily suspended the raids on Japan, diverting the B-29s to capture Iwo Jima, considered vital to the air campaign because it could be used to base fighters capable of escorting the B-29s to Japan as well as provide an emergency field midway between the Marianas and the Japanese targets. On February 19, 1945, LeMay decided to destroy industrial feeder businesses and disrupt the production of weapons vital to Japan. Instead of using the high explosive bombs that had been previously employed, he would switch to incendiary bombs, which he hoped would cause general conflagrations in the large cities. The high-altitude daylight attacks would be replaced by low-altitude, high-intensity incendiary raids at night. To increase bomb loads, the B-29s were reconfigured, reducing their structural weight. The new strategy was to drop the bombs from altitudes of only 5,000 to 6,000 feet. By flying lower, the planes would no longer have to struggle against the jet stream and could fly below most cloud covers. This would save wear and tear on the engines and preserve fuel. LeMay was confident that the Japanese night fighter forces were weak, although he admitted that flak losses could be substantial. Another new strategy had been added to American bombing. At the beginning of the war, FDR directed that only military targets be bombed. This differed from the British approach, which targeted cities following the German bombing of Rotterdam in May 1940. But with the American bombing of Berlin in March 1944, the rules had changed. Cities and civilians were now targets, including those in Japan. In the dark, the guards hustled the men out of the barracks, assembling them next to a fence behind the kitchen building, not far from the power plant. On the other side of the fence was a small hill. A guard opened a gate in the fence, and the men passed to the other side, ducking and crawling into a deep, dark hole, the bomb shelter. The only illumination was the guard's flashlight. The roof and sides of the shelter were corrugated metal propped up with tree trunks and branches. To Tim it seemed like even the slightest shock wave would bring tons of earth crashing down, burying the POWs inside. Once everyone had crammed together on their haunches, the guards backed away, closing and locking the door behind them, leaving the men no escape. In silence, the men waited. They had been through this many times before, and each time there was no attack, only the discomfort and dirt of being penned together inside the shelter. Tim felt the sand fleas crawling up his ankles. Adding to their tension was the knowledge that the Japanese had lined the edge of the shelter with dozens of sticks of dynamite, with a fuse running back inside the camp. Should the guards choose, they could light the fuse and bury the POWs leaving little trace that they were ever there. An hour in the shelter stretched to two, then three. The men became more claustrophobic, everyone fidgeting, trying to stay calm, but nervously waiting for the all-clear. Finally, the siren sounded and the guards opened the door. Tim was one of the first to crawl out. 
he couldn't help but wonder if getting bombed would be easier. Near the end of the lunch break at the mill, a small crowd gathered in the open pavement area. On one side were a dozen prisoners, and on the other were guards and civilian workers. In the middle were Rooster Boy and Tim, about to face off in a wrestling match. Tim hated Rooster Boy. A young man in his early twenties, he was the most athletically built of all the guards. Rooster Boy had singled out Tim as the primary target for his cruelty and sadistic treatment. On several occasions, Rooster Boy pulled Tim out of the roll call line and hit him for no particular reason other than to humiliate him. When Tim had been locked in the guardhouse after he was caught stealing soybeans, it was Rooster Boy who wrote Dazu de Robo, Bean Thief, on a sign and posted it next to the cage. He'd also been the one to hose Tim with freezing water while he was locked inside. But nothing that Rooster Boy had done angered Tim as much as an incident the previous week. Tim and one of the pushers in the welding shop had been trying to teach each other vocabulary when Rooster Boy approached and signaled Tim to get back to work. When Tim didn't move fast enough, Rooster Boy picked up a brick with a pair of tongs and heated it up in a nearby furnace until it was white hot and then launched it at Tim from close range. Somehow Tim managed to duck, and the brick missed the side of his face by inches. Now crouched in a wrestling position, he eyed Rooster Boy, who crouched a few feet away. This showdown had been Tim's idea, and it surprised him that Rooster Boy had accepted. Tim figured it must be a matter of personal, if not national, pride. Tim had said that there'd be no judo, but he didn't trust Rooster Boy to abide by any rules. Although Tim had not wrestled in high school, he had been to a lot of professional wrestling matches in Dallas as a vendor selling soft drinks and candy. He had no illusions of lifting his opponent over his head and body-slamming him to the pavement like Gorgeous George might do, though thanks to his ability to steal food and the extra portions of bento that he finessed out of the young boys he worked with, he was in better shape than most of the other POWs. He still weighed only about 120 pounds, but that was about 10 pounds more than most of the men. Speed and agility, not strength and endurance, would be his weapons. Tim's strategy was to go in low, take Rooster Boy's feet out from under him, and then use his wiry quickness to get on top and pin him. Cautiously, the two men circled each other, looking for an opening. Behind them, Tim's fellow prisoners watched nervously. To a man, the other prisoners had tried to dissuade Tim from challenging Rooster Boy. If he won, he could expect to get punished, or even worse, a defeated Rooster Boy could choose to take out a loss on everyone. As far as Tim was concerned, one small victory against the Japanese, even if he had to pay dearly for it later, would be worth the risk. Rooster Boy faked a judo chop, and Tim, spotting an opening, lunged at his legs, catching him off guard. With both arms wrapped around Rooster Boy's knees, he lifted him slightly and drove him backward, forcing him to the pavement. Seizing the moment, he quickly kneeled on Rooster Boy's chest and, using the heels of his hands, pinned his shoulders to the pavement. Ichi, ni, san, he counted, and then jumped off Rooster Boy's chest, thrusting his skinny arms into the air in victory. It was April 13, 1945, two weeks after Tim's wrestling victory. Returning from another twelve hours at the welding shop, he saw a large crowd of prisoners congregated near the cage. He figured some poor guy was getting the crap beat out of him and the guards were making sure other prisoners watched. He knew the feeling. To his surprise, Rooster Boy had done nothing to punish him or any of the other prisoners following the match. It was as if he'd lost so much face in front of the other guards that he'd decided to back off. As pleased as Tim's buddies were about his victory, they had all advised him to lie low. And that's what he'd been doing, except today. Inside the false bottom of his stool, he'd stashed some extra rice that he'd scrounged from the boys in the welding shop. He planned to give it to Gordy. Tim was worried about his crewmate. Gordy had not been to work in over a week, his health continuing on a steady downhill slide. His stomach was swollen from beriberi. During the day his feet and legs would swell, and sometimes when he woke up in the morning one side of his face would be all puffy and make him look lopsided. 
Because he couldn't work, his portion of rice had been cut, and each day he grew weaker. Other than an occasional nod hello while they were on the grenadier's final patrol, Gordy and Tim barely knew each other prior to getting captured. And although they had different temperaments, Gordy quiet and reserved, Tim brash and Texas cocky, their individual brands of toughness connected them. On the train ride back from the steel mill, they often sat together. The winter of 1944 to 1945 had taken its toll on the camp, with three or four men dying each day. Only four men from the Grenadier had died, but there were now a dozen in dire shape. Recently, several survivors of the Bataan Death March arrived in camp, as well as a group of Javanese prisoners. These men looked even worse than the men in Fukuoka's sickbay. For Tim, watching the dead being hauled out of camp to the crematorium was a daily reminder that he wanted to survive no matter what it would take. His second anniversary as a POW was a week away. Tim thought about what his life might be like if he made it home alive. The first thing he would do was take a long, hot bath. Then, of course, he would gorge himself on good old American food with plenty of ice cream and pie. He would drink beer and dance and live life to the hilt. He'd worry later about the moral issues that had been instilled in him by the Baptist Church. After he'd lived it up a little, he'd send a one-way ticket to Valma. Or maybe he'd go straight to Australia after his release and bring her back to America with him. Of course, it had crossed his mind that maybe she thought he was dead, or that maybe she'd met somebody else, but he never allowed those thoughts to linger. What helped him to stay positive were the reports on the progress of the war now filtering into camp. He'd heard that the American bombing raids had started to seriously hinder the Japanese's ability to supply their troops, including food, and that U.S. troops had retaken Manila and Corregidor. He wondered if any of the Filipinos who'd bravely come down to the dock at the start of the war and helped load the gold and silver onto the trout had survived, or had they been part of the Bataan Death March and died like so many others. Holding tightly to his stool, he arrived at the edge of the crowd gathered near the guardhouse. What's going on? he inquired. The Japs posted a sign claiming FDR died. At first, Tim didn't believe it. This wasn't the first time that story had gone around. But judging from the reaction of the other men, today it seemed more credible. For the most part, Tim was apolitical, but he worried that if the rumor was true, some of the POWs would lose hope. For the moment, however, his bigger concern was getting past the guard standing near his barracks. It was Rooster Boy. Walking toward the guard, Tim kept his eyes straight ahead. This wasn't the time to get too cocky or shoot Rooster Boy a defiant glare. He could feel Rooster Boy's eyes boring a hole right through him. He continued on his path, and when he was a few feet away, he switched the stool to his left hand and issued a salute with his right, just like all the prisoners did when approaching a guard. He made sure it was snappy and by the book. Rooster Boy didn't respond, letting Tim pass. No smile, no snarl, no salute back. Tim and his stool entered the barracks. He looked around for Gordy, but there was no sign of him. 38. Gordy Cox, Fukuoka No. 3 some guys let each bite of rice linger in their mouths, trying to suck the nutrients out of each grain. Others wolfed it down like dogs. Gordy's approach was somewhere in between. On this evening, however, he was devouring the large serving of rice Skeeter had brought him, trying to polish it off before a guard spotted him with the extra serving. He'd been in the Benjo when Tim first returned. Outside the barracks, he heard several guards jabbering in excited voices. He didn't know exactly what they were saying, but he could decipher enough to know it was about FDR's death. Gordy felt the tears start to well up. Spotting Skeeter, he motioned him closer. He wanted to thank him for his generosity. Skeeter had put his own safety on the line for Gordy's health, not to mention that he was giving away food he could just have easily taken for himself. If the guards had caught him, they would surely have thrown Skeeter back into the bunker. Gordy reached out and grabbed Skeeter's hand, but the words wouldn't come. The lump in his throat was too big. 
Finally, he whispered, I'll make it up to you. Just stay alive, said Skeeter. That's all you need to do. June 10th, 1945. Gordy watched his crewmate, Tom Courtney, a thoughtful guy from Michigan, making another entry into the little journal he had stolen from a supply room and kept hidden under his bunk. Back at the convent on Light Street, Courtney had been one of the sickest men, but he had rebounded. Now his occasional jottings were the only written documentation by any of the crew at Fukuoka No. 3. Gordy asked if he could read it. Courtney hesitated, then handed him the journal. 3 four forty five. Dope coming in about big raids on Tokyo and other big cities. Pray we live through own bombs. 4 one forty five. Alarms daily and nightly now. Hitting close. Saw my first B-29. 4.28.45. Dope Germany fell again. One of these times will be true. 5.8.45. Alarms still go every day, but nothing happens. I pray that I won't be in the factory when Sam does hit it. 5.27.45. Uncle Sam comes every other night. Dope coming in all the time about big raids and battles. Our fleet said to be out here in mass. I miss home and Elise more than ever. Received Red Cross cheese. Slopes treating us better now. They see the end now. I expect to go through another hell before this is over. 5.30.45. All kinds of scuttlebutt coming in about the war and how it will end. But it's all bullshit to me. 6.3.45. Something is up. Received a chocolate bar per man today. Boy, you can tell this is drawing to a close. No more beatings. Well, not many. Chow is better. Clothes, too. If we were treated same two years ago, a lot of my friends would still be here. These hounds of hell have a hell of a lot to answer for. 6.10.45 God, how I pray this will end. This time of year makes me homesick more than ever. The way things look, this will last forever. Dawn was breaking, and a guard ran through the barracks, screaming for everyone to get up. Gordy struggled out of his bunk. He wasn't sure if it was from the extra rice Tim had been giving him, but he felt well enough to go to work at the steel mill, even though he was still moving slowly. Exiting the barracks, Gordy tried to quicken his pace but it was not fast enough for the guard who ran at him from behind, slamming his rifle butt hard into Gordy's back. The force of the blow knocked him off his feet, driving him face first into the baked dirt. As he struggled to get up, the guard kicked him, his boot drilling Gordy square in the ribs, knocking the wind out of him. The guard raised his rifle butt over his head and swung it hard at Gordy again. Gordy rolled to his left, the blow glancing off his arm. Quickly he scrambled to his feet and fell into line with the other men nearby, escaping further injury. Now he probably had a cracked rib. From Gordy's point of view, the punishment from the guards had escalated again in June. He was sure it had to do with the relentless pounding Japan was taking from the almost daily B-29 bombings. The more extensive the destruction by the bombers, the more the guards took it out on the POWs. On March 9th and 10th, 302 B-29s had taken off from Guam and hit Tokyo with their incendiary bombs, igniting a firestorm that killed 84,000 civilians and torched 16 square miles. Only 14 B-29s were lost. The next week, the cities of Nagoya, Osaka, and Kobe were hit, killing 120,000 with 20 planes lost. In April, the Japanese aircraft factories in Nakajima and Nagoya were destroyed. LeMay's new strategy of incendiary bombing was having a devastating effect. In April and May, Tokyo was hit again, with an estimated 200,000 killed, and although 43 B-29s were lost, over 50% of the city was completely destroyed. And then on May 29th, 454 B-29s, escorted by P-51 Mustangs flying from Iwo Jima, targeted Yokohama. Although four B-29s and three P-51s were lost, 26 Japanese Zeros went down and a large portion of Yokohama was laid to waste. A week later, Kobe was hit so hard again that it was no longer listed as a target. By mid-June, 
Most of the large Japanese cities were so thoroughly gutted that LeMay switched targets, ordering the incendiary raids on 58 smaller Japanese cities. By the end of June, the Japanese civilian population was in full panic. For the first time, the imperial cabinet considered negotiating an end to the war, but the Japanese military rejected the idea, determined to fight to the bitter end. 6.16.45 Uncle came again last night. Comes almost every night. Even slopes tell us that it will end soon. By all scuttle, Uncle is pretty close. Red Cross tobacco and medicine came in yesterday. This Red Cross is a big shameful joke. Uncle sends it and the slopes take it. If we get it, we're lucky. 6.22.45 Sirens went six times in last 24 hours. God, when will this end? 6.24.45 Sirens went all night. No sleep now. 6.29.45 Dope on invasion soon. Bullshit. Also country around here leveled. 7-3-45. Raids every night. Close enough to here, but still not here. 7-8-45. Boy, this is really getting me down. It's got to end someday. Lots of action tonight. I hope Sam comes. The dirty sons of bitches really beat up some of the boys for contraband. They will soon pay for it. Gordy waited in the sick call line to see the Japanese doctor. He was desperate. In mid-July he had come down with dysentery, draining what little energy he had left. He was afraid he would develop pneumonia, from which very few POWs in camp had recovered. When a POW died of pneumonia, the Japanese listed them as having died from natural causes. Twice Gordy had been to see the Japanese doctor, and each time the doctor just shushed him and ordered him to go back to work. Now Gordy could barely walk. He had a fever, intestinal cramps, and blood in his stool. It wasn't just Gordy's physical condition that was slipping fast. Each new bombing raid and every new rumor raised his hopes that the end was in sight. The air raids would keep the men in the shelter all night, but in the morning there would be no visible damage around the camp or the steel mill. All that would happen was that four or five more men would die, and Gordy would get more depressed. He hated the Japanese doctor. Gordy was determined to get the doctor to take him seriously. This morning he deposited his bloody stool into an old rag and brought it with him to see the doctor holding it behind his back. Slowly, he moved forward in line, until finally it was his turn. Standing in front of the doctor, he laid the cloth down on the desk and unfolded it. Caught off guard, the doctor sprang out of his chair and yelled. Two guards appeared immediately on either side of Gordy, bayonets pointed. Maybe this wasn't such a good idea after all, he thought. Sitting nearby, Dr. Markowitz heard the commotion and came running to intervene. He quickly examined the contents of the rag and had a conversation with the Japanese doctor. A few minutes later, Dr. Markowitz checked Gordy into the camp hospital. Doc, you saved my life, said Gordy. Gordy knew that the hospital was usually considered the last stop in camp before the crematorium, although in the last couple of weeks, Several of the crew had spent time there and still made it back into the workforce. Dr. Markowitz diagnosed him with amoebic dysentery and also confirmed he had a cracked rib. But you may be in luck, he said. The most recent Red Cross packages included medicine for the treatment of amoebic dysentery. For the next three days, Gordy took two white pills twice daily, and by the end of the week he was well enough to be released from the hospital and returned to work duty in the camp. He continued reading Courtney's journal. 7.10.45. Uncle came last night and blew hell out of area. Very close. One shot down. 7.14.45. Chow went down today. Going down daily. Back to starvation rations. The end must be near. Four men died in four days. 7.22.45. The chow is low and getting cut all the time. Scuttle coming in all the time about invasion. 
If this thing doesn't end soon, these sons of bitches will starve us to death. They are all hungry now, too. Too bad. 8-1-45. Uncle Sam has been raising hell. Every day, B-29s and dive bombers. Still, we're spared. Everyone says very soon we will be with our loved ones. There are beans on the job. For a few butts, a hatful. Really been eating lately. 8-7-45. Uncle dropped pamphlets saying we are next. Dope coming in that it should be over damn soon. On the morning of August 8th, the air raid sirens blared again. Gordy had heard rumors in camp that the area around Yawata and the steel mill would be next, but he wasn't sure how nervous to be. Twenty-eight months as a POW had taught him not to believe anything until it happened. He was worried, however, that if it was true, Skeeter, Chuck, and a lot of the crew would be sitting ducks at the mill. The prisoners in camp were hustled out the gate into the shelter. Pretty soon Gordy heard the ACAC fire and the sound of planes overhead, but strangely he heard no bombs exploding. He wondered what was happening. It didn't take long to find out. Bombs started to fall, big bombs, and far more than ever before. From the sound of it, they were hitting the steel mill. 39. Bob Palmer, a Shio. In early August 1945, Bob Palmer checked himself into the little wooden shack the prisoners at Ashio called the Death Hut, the place where the sickest of the sick went to die. His weight, which had been 160 pounds at the start of the war, was now down to 80. Despite several vitamin B1 shots, as well as experimental treatments with acupuncture and burning herbs, his beriberi had worsened. He could not continue with the back-breaking work or endure the noxious fumes at the smelter. His legs were too swollen for him to walk. He could only crawl. The relentless bombing that the B-29s had inflicted on Japan had spared the small mountain town of Ashio from any direct hits, but it had knocked out its main railroad supply line, effectively cutting off the flow of rice into town for the townspeople as well as the prisoners. The guards routinely stole the Red Cross parcels meant for the POWs. On one occasion, in a desperate attempt to add some substance to their soup, a horse bone that a POW found walking back from the smelter was added, but it only resulted in several prisoners choking and gagging on splintered bone. On another occasion, small bits of baby shark were mixed into the soup, but the smell of ammonia was so strong that Bob couldn't eat it. One of Bob's last jobs before entering the death hut was helping to scrounge around the camp for edible plants and bulbs to add to the prisoners' small ration of soup. It was an exercise in futility. Decades of poor mining practices had poisoned the area's soil and robbed it of any agricultural value. Bob managed to bring back only a handful of weeds. He got diarrhea from the soup made with his gleanings. The camp doctor treated it by having him eat charcoal. Of all the prisoners at Ashio, it was the Javanese Dutch who suffered the most. The Javanese had been imprisoned the longest, and in the spring and summer of 1945, they were, as Kevin Hardy, one of the grenadiers' officers at Ashio, put it, dying like flies. Perhaps none of the deaths had impacted the camp as much as the passing of a Javanese man who had been an opera singer before the war. According to the other prisoners, he died in the death hut just after singing a beautiful aria, his voice soaring above the camp, lifting everyone's spirits. They had no idea what language he was singing in or what the words meant, only that the music seemed to come from heaven. Bob had no memory of it. Bob knew his mental condition was almost as bad as his physical health. During the first two years of his imprisonment, he had kept his mind active with a variety of mental escapes, taking fishing trips in the Cascades, eating delicious desserts from recipes concocted by a fellow prisoner, rebuilding a 36 Ford from the ground up, building a house in which to live with Barbara. Now, as death closed in, he couldn't focus, mired in depression and hopelessness. Even thoughts about Barbara could no longer lift his spirits. All he could do was stare out the window of the death hut 
and mindlessly watched the prisoners and guards walk past. 40. Chuck Vervalen, Fukuoka No. 3 On the cloudless morning of August 8, 1945, Chuck Vervalen trudged from the train to his job in the pipe shop. This morning shaped up to be like all the others, a struggle to get through the day. Soon after the prisoners arrived at the shop, the morning calm was shattered by the warning blast of an air raid siren. Nobody paid it much attention, including the pushers and guards. Despite the constant sounds of planes passing overhead and the rumbling of bombs exploding in the distance, there hadn't been a daylight bombing raid over Yawata in more than a year. Reaching his workstation, Chuck was startled by a second siren, the one the POWs called Burping Betsy. This was unusual. Almost immediately he heard a racket on the roof, like it was being hit by a million BBs. He looked through the large entrance to the building and saw hundreds of smoking white sticks falling from the sky and peppering a nearby building where many of his friends worked. To the west he saw the most incredible sight. Row after row of glistening four-engine B-29s coming in low and silently over the rim of the mountains and gliding down into the valley. They were so close that he could see their Bombay doors open and large black canisters the size of train cars fall from their bellies. The canisters quickly burst apart, scattering thousands of small fire bombs in every direction each stick leaving a trail of white smoke behind it. All around him, frightened men, POWs, guards, civilians, pushers, ran for cover from death pouring from the sky. For all the POWs talk and worry about being killed by American bombs one day, that day was now here. Incendiary bombs fell in every corner of the factory and all over the city of Yawata to the south. Anti-aircraft fire erupted from a mountaintop to the north of the mill, but before the ak, -AK could find its target, three P-51s swooped down like hawks and wiped out the emplacement. Chuck sprinted toward a shelter, but it was quickly filling to capacity. He returned to the pipe shop and took cover under a large stack of pipes piled against a wall. Trying to catch his breath, he felt something move next to his legs. Looking down, he did a double-take. Crouching next to him was a guard, a man he'd seen around the steel mill many times, but whose name he didn't know. The guard was shaking hard. It occurred to Chuck that there was really no difference between them at this moment. They were just two human beings, petrified that they were about to die. It seemed like everywhere and everything was on fire. The factory, machines, supplies, nearby houses, flames leaping across roads and railroad tracks. The sound was overpowering. Like a strong wind, crackling and snapping everything in its path, great billows of black smoke rolling through the valley, choking the air, turning the sky from a beautiful blue to a dark haze. Chuck wondered about Gordy back in camp. He knew that those wooden barracks would go up in flames like bone-dry kindling if the incendiaries hit there. Nothing near the steel mill escaped the devastation. Trees, buildings, and animals all on fire. At the water's edge, small boats, docks, and a fishing village erupted in an inferno, impossible to extinguish. Ashes fell like snowflakes. The sun disappeared. The ground shook as a second wave of planes unleashed more destruction, in the form of huge 500-pound bombs. Relentlessly they came, whistling to the ground like freight trains, tearing gaping craters. After twenty-eight months in captivity, Chuck was overjoyed that these evil bastards were finally getting what they deserved, a fiery, excruciating pounding. But fear had a bigger hold on him. Cowering under the stack of pipes, pressed up against his enemy, he had never been so scared. It was late in the afternoon when the all-clear finally sounded. The prisoners were rounded up and told to head for the train to take them back to the camp. Chuck didn't know what to expect. The guard who'd been next to him had disappeared. Maybe there would be another raid. Or maybe the soldiers, or even the civilians, would turn into an angry mob and attack them. In the semi-darkness there was an eerie stillness. Other than a couple of guards herding them to the train, the whole area was deserted. 
none of the Japanese pushers, workers, or civilians were in sight. They had likely fled to their homes to see if anything was left. In every direction that Chuck looked, the earth was scorched. Huge pieces of metal lay scattered on the ground. Where earlier in the day buildings had stood, now there were only piles of glowing embers. Entire sides of factories had disappeared, the equipment inside smashed to bits. Black, billowing smoke still swirled around the smoldering ruins. Accounts of the devastation quickly spread. The death toll in Yawata was over 60,000. Entire neighborhoods had been wiped out, the tightly packed houses made of straw, bamboo, rice paper, or cheap wood shooting up in flames. Miraculously, only one POW was killed. He had taken a direct hit on the back of his head from a firebomb. Another prisoner lost an arm. But nobody from the Grenadier was seriously injured. Back at camp, which had escaped damage from the attack, Chuck and the other men spent the night huddled together in the shelter. Nobody slept. For Chuck it was a better option than sleeping in the barracks, where a new infestation of bedbugs now covered everything. The morning of August 9th dawned bright and sunny, but soon a northeasterly wind started blowing the thick layer of smoke that had drifted out to sea overnight back toward land, spreading a blanket of haze from Yawata to Kokura. At the same time, a B-29 named Box Car was winging across the Pacific toward Japan, its designated target, Kokura, less than three miles from the camp. In its belly, it carried an atomic bomb. The remaining 670 prisoners at Fukuoka No. 3 did not know that three days earlier the Enola Gay had dropped an atomic bomb on Hiroshima, 50 miles to the north. An estimated 45,000 people out of a population of 250,000 perished in the initial blast, and another 20,000 died within four months. Kokura, because of its stockpile of military arms and equipment, had been designated as the target for the second bomb. Before taking off from Tinian in the Mariana Islands, the crew of Box Car discovered a malfunctioning fuel pump on an auxiliary fuel tank. The pilot, Major Charles Sweeney, decided the extra fuel would not be essential and disconnected the auxiliary fuel tank. The plane took off, and upon reaching Yakushima, an island off the south coast of Kyushu, it was supposed to rendezvous with an instrument plane as well as a photographic plane. But the photo plane was late, so after circling for almost an hour and using up considerable fuel, Major Sweeney proceeded toward Kokura without the photo plane. An advance weather report forecast clear skies over the target area. Box Carr was under specific orders to drop the bomb, named Fat Boy, only if the arsenal storage facility could be visually spotted. But upon reaching Kokura, Sweeney found that the target was hidden under the thick layer of smoke from the previous day's bombing raid. The plane circled, looking for an opening, then circled again, taking a third pass over the target. Still the view was obscured. With the fuel running low because they had disconnected the auxiliary fuel tank, Sweeney decided to abort the Kokura mission and change course for the secondary target of Nagasaki. Tom Courtney continued to write in his journal. 8845. Uncle came today. Blew hell out of factory. Incendiary bombs all over. Thousands of them. The hand of God was over us. He will see us through. 8945. Stayed in camp today. Sirens went five times this morning. Uncle hasn't come back, though. He better be here tonight or we go back tomorrow. God be with us in that factory. Everyone optimistic now. Think it will end soon. Please, God, end it soon. 8.12.45 Shelter again. Still no work. Heard factory hit again. Also heard Russia at war and well in Manchuria. Also Red Cross coming now. This war about over. It is so hard to imagine what it will be like to be free again to America that is hot dogs, hamburgers, and ball games, freedom and home, the sweetest words in the world. 8.13.45 Uncle again. 
dive bombers, shelter almost all day. Some jobs went back to factory. God, I hope I never see it again. They want to kill us for sure. Keep praying. 8 45 23 years old today. No work today. Also no more work in factory. The scuttle really strong and spirits up. Maybe war is about over. All parties come in from factory at noon. Everything points to the end. God in heaven, make it so. You've been with us through it all, Father, and have answered my prayers. On the morning of August 16th, a Japanese soldier entered the barracks and ordered everyone to assemble outside in the quadrangle near the guards' barracks, the largest open space in the camp. There was something ominous in his tone. Chuck noticed several men close to him offer a quick prayer. Chuck wasn't relying on prayer or God in heaven for his strength. Since the bombing of the factory and with the end of the war and of their captivity possibly near, he was doing his best to keep his mind focused on the same thing he had for the past two years and four months, that honor would come in his survival and in seeing the Japanese defeated, that and making sure he got enough to eat. More than at any time since the crew's capture, the rumors were flying. The American invasion was set to begin. A big bomb had wiped out an entire city. There would be mackerel for dinner tonight. There were only enough rations to last one more week. The rumor Chuck worried about the most, of course, was the one that had been circulating the longest, that an Allied invasion was imminent, and as soon as it started, the POWs would all be lined up and gunned down. Certainly the Japanese had done their part in spreading this fear, including every day since the factory was bombed. He took a spot at the rear of the quadrangle. Every prisoner in camp who could walk was there, the crowd spilling out of the quadrangle and down the main street. None of the men had slept more than a few hours in over a week. A stepladder was placed at the front of the crowd. Behind it stood the guards, all of them armed with rifles and bayonets. Maybe this is where they finally kill us, thought Chuck. A Japanese colonel climbed the stepladder, which was steadied by a sergeant major. The colonel looked out over the prisoners, his glare slowly shifting from one side of the silent crowd to the other. Finally, in almost perfect English, he spoke. The war is over, he said. Japan has lost the war. He paused, waiting for a reaction from the POWs. There was no shouting, no rejoicing, no slaps on the back. Chuck wasn't sure how to react or what to think. For too long he'd gotten his hopes up that this nightmare would end, and the one thing he'd come to know for sure was not to believe anything until it happened. Was this just another cruel hoax? Given the destruction and devastation the Japanese had suffered recently, it certainly seemed logical that they would surrender. But Chuck remembered the countless times he'd heard his captors talking about the code of Bushido, and how true warriors never give up, only cowards surrender, and that a Japanese soldier would never put down his arms. The colonel continued, His Imperial Majesty, in an effort to put an end to the death and bloodshed, has agreed to an unconditional surrender and cessation of war. All hostilities have been terminated. His Majesty and your General MacArthur will sign the terms of surrender on September 2nd, 1945. I have been ordered to inform you that as of this moment you are no longer prisoners of war. You are free. I have also been instructed to ask that you all remain here until your authorities come for you after the surrender has been signed. Please do not think harshly of those who were in charge of you, your guards. Have compassion for them. Many have lost their entire family and homes. Food is scarce. I would suggest that Red Cross food parcels in the warehouse be given to them, that they might have food to eat, while they too readjust. They were only doing their duty, as you would yours. He stepped down off the stepladder and returned to the office, followed shortly by the guards, leaving the prisoners still staring in stunned silence. It was hard for Chuck to fathom. 
Was he really free? If he wasn't, then the colonel had done an amazing job of acting. And what was he to think about the colonel's request for the POWs to be forgiving of the guards? Could that Jap possibly be serious to think that all these prisoners who'd been surviving on a cup of rice a day for more than two years were going to give what little rations were left to the same men who had treated them worse than dogs? Was there no end to these people's audacity? That night the 670 former POWs dragged their blankets out of the barracks and set them on the hard dirt of the street. They would all sleep out under the stars, leaving the barracks to the bedbugs. As midnight came and went, most stayed awake talking, their first night of freedom spent in dazed and elated conversation. The next morning Chuck awoke to one of the men running down the main street of the camp yelling at the top of his voice, the Japs are gone! The Japs are gone! Sure enough, in the dark of night, the camp commandant and all the guards had snuck away unnoticed, leaving the prisoners on their own. Many of the POWs went scrounging for food, but found little. Later that morning, the top-ranked officer in the camp, Army Major W. O. Doris, addressed the prisoners, cautioning them to sit tight until American forces arrived. I'm not sure how long it'll take them to get here, a week, maybe two, he said, but I can assure you that anyone caught leaving camp early will be court-martialed. He nodded toward the perimeter of the quadrangle, where six American Marines, armed with sabers the guards had left behind, stood guard. Chuck glanced at Tim McCoy, who was sitting next to him, perplexed. Many times they had talked about what they would do when and if they were ever free again. Nowhere on either man's list, however, was anything about hanging around the prison camp after the war was over. I don't know who's coming to get us, said Chuck, but they better get here soon or I'm leaving anyway. They wouldn't dare court-martial us. 41. Bob Palmer, Ashio. It was August 15, 1945, six days after the atomic bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. Lying on his straw mat in the death hut and floating in and out of sleep, Bob was awakened by his friend and crewmate, Len Clark. Using Clark as a crutch, Bob shuffled across the wooden floor to the door, his swollen legs throbbing. In the middle of the dusty compound, all the guards stood at attention in a circle around the camp commander. They all carried rifles, and they were all wearing white gloves. On the ground next to them, a voice blared from a radio. Emperor Hirohito was addressing the nation. Every few sentences the guards bowed toward Tokyo, their expressions as solemn as those seen in a funeral procession, as Hirohito's words sunk in. Indeed, we declared war on America and Britain out of our sincere desire to ensure Japan's self-preservation and the stabilization of East Asia, it being far from our thought either to infringe upon the sovereignty of other nations or to embark on territorial aggrandizement. By now the war has lasted for nearly four years. Despite the best that has been done by everyone, the gallant fighting of our military and naval forces, the diligence and assiduity of our servants of the state, and the devoted service of our ten million people, the war situation has developed not necessarily to Japan's advantage, while the general trends of the world have all turned against her interest. Moreover, the enemy has begun to employ a new and most cruel bomb, the power of which to do damage is indeed incalculable, taking the toll of many innocent lives. Should we continue to fight, it would not only result in an ultimate collapse and obliteration of the Japanese nation, but also it would lead to the total extinction of human civilization. After several more minutes, the Emperor's voice stopped, and the guards closed their circle around the camp commander. Soon they backed away and started walking toward their barracks, each leaving behind his rifle stacked upright with all the others. It would take several more minutes for the camp commander to confirm to the barracks leaders that the war was indeed over. As word spread through the camp, members of the grenadier crew came to the death hut to share an embrace with Bob. Bob smiled, the first time he'd done so in months. 
Ten days after the emperor had announced the Japanese surrender, Bob hobbled across the camp, steadying himself with a tree limb Len Clark had crafted into a crutch. He was heading toward a large box. It had just been dropped in the center of camp by a low-flying F-4U, which had come swooping down out of the sky with its pilot canopy open and wheels down. This wasn't the drop of supplies. Immediately after the surrender, the prisoners had painted a large POW sign on top of one of the barracks and had spelled out POW in white rocks in the middle of the compound. One of the drops had included army-issued clothes with more than enough to go around. Bob was one of the first to reach the new box. He had been feasting on packages of Canadian Red Cross food that the prisoners had found in a storage room after most of the Japanese guards had fled the camp. For the last three days, Bob had been splurging on bacon Hershey bar sandwiches. He'd also been getting heavy doses of vitamin B1, likewise found with the Red Cross food. Although he'd gained five pounds and his physical condition had improved enough that he'd moved out of the death hut back to the barracks, he was still easily confused. He'd been told that he could try to contact Barbara when he reached Guam in a few more weeks. What's Guam? he asked. Bob and the other prisoners quickly opened the box. It was full of viceroys. Wrapped around the cartons was a handwritten note. Frank Sinatra, number one. Bob furrowed his brow. Sinatra is president? he asked. The next day, several POWs met and made a list of Japanese mine workers who had treated them nicely. They rounded up as many of these men as they could find and brought them to the center of the camp, where they presented them with supplies that had been dropped from planes. Every one of the mine workers cried when given their gift of American food and clothing. So did the ex-prisoners. On the morning of September 5, 1945, thirty days after the dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima, Bob limped out of the Ashio prison camp, using a newly carved tree limb as a cane. Along with the other prisoners, he walked two miles to the train station and boarded a train for the Yokohama-Tokyo area. The tracks had been repaired. At the station, he saw no civilians. Only members of the Kempeitai posted menacingly around the station. Climbing aboard the train, Bob felt an overwhelming sense of joy and relief. Over the twenty-eight tortured months as a POW, he'd survived on less than a cup of rice a day, received more beatings than he could remember, spent nine months in solitary confinement, performed slave labor in a smelter, watched other prisoners die, lost half his body weight, had no contact with the outside world, and battled beriberi, amoebic dysentery, and dengue fever. And now he was heading home. Despite his sense of liberation, he knew one hard truth still remained. I'm not capable of a logical decision, he admitted. That did not, however, stop him from asking when he'd be allowed to try to contact Barbara. In Guam, he was told, he could barely wait. Part 8. Going Home 42. Tim Skeeter McCoy, Texas In the days immediately following the end of the war, Tim was practically coming unglued waiting to leave Fukuoka No. 3. There were promises of B-29s dropping in supplies, but so far nothing had arrived. There were also daily threats of a court-martial to anyone leaving camp. I'm not sticking around much longer, he vowed. Some men had bribed the posted guards to let them out of camp so they could walk around the town or go down to the ocean for a swim. A few even talked about going out and killing some random Japs. As much as he hated the Japanese, Tim didn't want any part of that. He was, however, interested in making a raid on the nearby sake plant, for his first unguarded venture outside the camp, he and Chuck walked a mile to the sake plant and traded a Red Cross parcel for a couple of bottles, and then came back to the camp and got drunk. Top military officials in all branches had determined that POWs would return to America and be assigned to a hospital, and then be reassigned to a base. Tim had it all figured out. As soon as he got home, he would bring Valma to America with the help of the War Brides Act, and then get married. 
he'd buy her a one-way ticket with the back pay that all the POWs were rumored to be getting. As for a career after the Navy, he wasn't sure. Maybe he'd talk to his uncle about going into the insurance business. Or maybe he'd stay in the Navy. Either way, he figured he'd have plenty of time to make a decision. There was a rumor that all the POWs would be getting a 90-day leave once they were stateside and had been checked out at a hospital. He was looking forward to seeing his mom again, too. As for his father, he wasn't sure if he'd even bother to see him. Being a POW hadn't healed that wound. With each day that passed without a food drop or word about when they would be able to start their journey back home, Tim's frustration and impatience grew. He talked to Chuck about joining him in escaping. He said he'd wait one more week, and then he was leaving. Approaching the main opening of the prison camp, Tim whispered to his two accomplices, Elwood O'Brien, a Grenadier crew member from Fort Dodge, Iowa, and Chuck, don't look suspicious. They were sneaking out of camp dressed in army uniforms and hats that had been dropped into camp. On their sleeves they wore black armbands on which was printed MP in large white letters. Their plan was to catch a train to Tokyo and, crazy as it seemed, find General MacArthur and get him to expedite their return home. Despite the leaflets that had been dropped into camp advising POWs not to leave and that they would soon be repatriated by the army, Tim's impatience had gotten the best of him. It didn't matter that B-29s had finally dropped multiple cases of food, candy, pall malls, gum, and medicine. Passing one of the posted sentries, they all saluted and kept walking down the dusty street that led to the train station. Tim was surprised at how calm he felt. The three men were feeling fit for their journey. Food had indeed arrived at last, packed inside fifty-five-pound drums that floated gently to earth under multicolored parachutes. It had been a beautiful sight, and the men had gorged themselves. A few of the prisoners had cut out pieces of a lavender parachute and crafted them into elegant coverings with fringed edges to be draped over the boxes containing the ashes of the men who had died. The covered boxes would be shipped home to the families of the deceased prisoners. At the station they were surprised not to see any Japanese soldiers, and even more surprised to see a large pile of rifles stacked on a platform. Maybe we should each grab one, suggested Tim. There are three of us and millions of them, countered Chuck, and he reminded Tim that Emperor Hirohito had instructed the military to put down their arms and treat the Americans with dignity and respect. None of the three men had any money, so without tickets they boarded a train bound for Tokyo, located about 400 miles to the north. The train was standing room only, all the other passengers were Japanese. The relentless bombing by the Americans had displaced millions of civilians, and now many of them were on the move, hoping to relocate with family or friends elsewhere in the country. Three Japanese men got up from their seats, bowed, and offered the seats to the men of the Grenadier, who returned the bow and took the seats. A few minutes later another person offered bowls of rice. Tim and his companions accepted this goodwill gesture graciously, although Tim saw the irony of being given a bowl of rice as a peace offering when they had existed on nothing but rice for more than two years. The train continued rolling northbound, stopping in Hiroshima. Tim looked out the window at the devastated city. It looked pretty much like all the other cities and towns they'd passed. It was after midnight when the train arrived in Tokyo, the men walked to the temporary army headquarters, arriving at 4 a.m. We're here to see General MacArthur, Tim announced. MacArthur wasn't there, but the next day General William Curtis Chase paid them a visit, assuring them they would get anything they wanted. For the next 24 hours they were treated to beds with clean white sheets, beers, and huge amounts of mashed potatoes and pork chops. Then they were driven to Yokohama and taken to a hospital ship where army nurses greeted them. Y'all are just about the prettiest sight I've ever seen, offered Tim. After being de-loused and given navy dungarees to wear, the men waited to be taken to the airport to catch a transport plane bound for Guam. During their wait, Tim and Chuck spotted Commander Barney Siegel 
under whom they'd briefly served aboard the submarine tender USS Pelias. Siegel pulled out his wallet and handed each of them ten dollars. I'll repay you, I promise, Tim told him. The ten dollars was more than he'd made during his eighteen months of labor in the steel mill at Yawata. Getting off the C-147 transport plane in Guam, Tim was greeted by warm tropical air and a large sign that proclaimed, Guam, where America's day begins. The largest and southernmost of the Mariana Islands, Guam was the only American-held island in the region before the war. Occupied by Japan from December 1941 until July 1944, it was also the only U.S. soil ever to be occupied by a foreign military power. Its recapture had been crucial in establishing the Marianas as a launching site for the B-29 raids on Japan. For the next two weeks, Tim and the many POWs who had been sent to the American hospital in Guam were examined by doctors and questioned about their experience in captivity. They were also given large amounts of food. I've never seen so much ice cream observed Chuck. For Tim, it seemed like every time he turned around he was filling out another form. One asked him to detail his treatment at each of the places where he'd been imprisoned, Penang, Singapore, and Fukuoka. Another was to authorize a request of the Japanese government for compensation for labor performed as a prisoner, a request Tim figured would never be honored. He also filled out a form agreeing not to talk to any representatives of the media or to allow his photo to be taken for publication without first receiving authorization from the military. Somebody told him that it was because General MacArthur didn't want to get the American public any more riled up about Japan than they already were. He and President Truman had figured out that it would be the Russians and Chinese who would be America's most formidable challenge in the years ahead, and America would eventually need Japan as an ally to help stop communist expansion. I'll sign whatever they want if it'll help me get home, said Tim. He spent a lot of time in the recreation center with the other men, sharing stories and talking about what they were going to do when they got home, as well as drinking copious amounts of beer. The more beer he drank, the less he dwelled on the hell he had just survived. Tim sent two telegrams, one to Valma in Perth and another to his mother in Dallas. Because his name had shown up on a POW list after he'd been transferred to Fukuoka No. 3, they both knew he was alive. He wrote Valma that he would check into the War Brides Act to bring her to America as soon as he got back home. His mother sent him a return cable in response. She and his father were back together, and they had been corresponding with Valma. Tim wasn't sure what to make of this, but his first reaction was that it was good. The next day he was on a ship, heading home to America. 43. Gordy Cox, Yakima, Washington His tray heaped with food, including a large T-bone steak, Gordy sat alone at a table in the empty mess hall at the Navy Hospital in Pearl Harbor, it was September 5th, 1945, and tomorrow he was leaving for America and the homecoming he'd been dreaming about. He glanced up and spotted an attractive young woman carrying a tray into the mess hall. Her presence startled him. By her uniform he knew she was a wave, women accepted for volunteer emergency service. When he'd first joined up there were almost no women in the Navy, but now at war's end there were almost 90,000. 2.5% of the Navy's total strength. Mind if I join you? she asked. Gordy nodded okay, suddenly feeling awkward and uncomfortable. He hadn't talked to an American woman since 1941, and he wasn't exactly the smoothest of operators back then. As she sat down, he stared at his steak. The past three weeks had been a whirlwind. For Gordy, the first realization that the war was truly over was when he walked out of the barracks in Fukuoka No. 3 and surprised a Japanese guard who quickly turned and ran away. A week earlier, that same guard probably would have hit him for failing to bow or salute. A few days after that, he'd sat in the barracks listening to several POWs talking about going in search of guards to hang. He said no thanks, believing the greater punishment would be to let the guards continue living in this godforsaken hell. 
In the last month, his health had dramatically improved. The swelling from the beriberi had gone down, and after the food drops began, he'd gained almost ten pounds and regained some of his energy. In fact, when one of the drums had landed fifty yards out in the ocean, he swam out and pushed it back to shore. Where are you from? asked the woman. Gordy contemplated his answer. Should he tell her he was a POW just returning from a living hell in Japan? Yakima, he muttered. Two other waves entered the mess hall and sat down at his table. He didn't greet them. Taking a small bite of his steak, he was suddenly not hungry. Like everyone else in Fukuoka No. 3, Gordy had become impatient to leave the prison camp and start his journey home. A few days after Tim and Chuck took off on their own, he and two other crewmates did the same, catching a train to Yokohama. He wore the tattered dungarees in which he'd been captured, wanting to leave the country the same way he'd arrived. On the train ride, he was surprised by the large number of Koreans on board, including women who'd been forced to work as comfort women, providing sexual services for the Japanese troops. At Yokohama, Gordy had been one of the lucky ones to be flown to Guam. There he finally learned that the twenty-nine men who'd been separated from the rest of the crew when they'd first landed in Japan, including Captain Fitzgerald, had survived. Along with all the other POWs, he was asked to fill out a war crimes report against the guards who had tortured him. He declined, saying that as much as he hated them, he didn't want to have to return to Japan to testify at a trial. After ten days of physical exams, clean clothes, and heaping mounds of food in Guam, he'd gotten lucky again and been put aboard a transport plane to Pearl Harbor. Most of the men, including Tim, Chuck, and Bob, would have to make the journey home aboard a ship. You stationed here at Pearl? asked one of the waves. Gordy shook his head. He took another bite of his steak, but now it was hard to chew. Did you serve in the war? asked another. Without answering, Gordy picked up his tray and left the table, dumping the half-eaten steak and the rest of the food into a trash can as he left the mess hall. Sitting at the bar in Bimbo's 365 Club on Market Street in San Francisco, Gordy stared into his beer, feeling out of place. It was two days after his return to America, and so far it wasn't quite the joyous return he'd envisioned. There'd been no bands or parades to greet him, although two men from a submarine relief organization had met him when he got off the plane and took him into San Francisco, offering to treat him to anything he wanted. He turned down the offer, explaining he hadn't done anything that thousands of other POWs hadn't done. They drove him to Oak Knoll Hospital in Oakland, where POWs were taken for more physicals and reassignment. Gordy's biggest disappointment upon returning home was that his mom and dad weren't there to greet him. He'd sent them a telegram from Pearl, letting them know he was coming to the Naval Hospital in Oakland, but so far he hadn't seen them. He'd concluded that his mother wasn't well enough to travel. Unbeknownst to him, his parents had driven the 900 miles from Yakima to Oakland, but had gone to the wrong hospital and were now frantically trying to find him. Gordy had taken a bus into San Francisco on a 12-hour Liberty Pass from Oak Knoll, and come to Bimbo's because he'd heard it was a hangout for Navy men. Indeed it was, but when he got there everyone was sitting in groups, laughing and having a good time. He tried making conversation with a sailor at the bar, but it went nowhere and the sailor got up and left, leaving Gordy to stare into the last sip of his beer. He quickly headed for the exit. On the sidewalk in front of the bar, a wino approached him. Hey sailor, how about buying me a bottle of wine? Sure, why not, Gordy replied. Using money the Navy had advanced him on his back pay, he bought a bottle of the cheapest rot gut he could find at a nearby liquor store and handed it to the wino. Want a swig? asked the wino. Sure, answered Gordy. For the next hour he and the wino sat on the curb, passing the brown paper bag-wrapped bottle back and forth, barely saying a word. When it was empty, Gordy stood up, thanked the man for his time, and then caught a bus back to Oakland. The next day he was awarded a Purple Heart. Gordy beamed as he drove his shiny 41 Buick down Main Street, accompanied by his brothers Willie and Larry and a friend, Ray Vanderver. 
It was October 1945, and he was back home in Yakima. He'd paid the pretty penny of $1,500 for the Buick, using up almost a third of the back pay he'd gotten from the Navy. To Gordy, it seemed everyone back home had changed, especially his mom. Her hair had turned completely gray. Having three of her four sons in the war had taken its toll. They'd all received Purple Hearts. When the brothers picked Gordy up at the bus depot upon his return, he barely recognized them. They were grown men, not the boys he remembered. Since he'd been home, his routine was pretty much the same every day. Sleep late, eat a big breakfast, and then go cruising in his new Buick with his brothers and friends. In the evenings, they'd usually end up at Dopey's, a restaurant and hangout for young people. If they were lucky, they'd meet some girls. With his back pay in his pocket and a nice car, he had lots of new friends. He rarely talked about the nightmare he'd been through. Once a woman asked him what it was like in prison camp, but when Gordy started to tell her about the starvation, beatings, and death, she screamed, Stop! Stop! I don't want to hear about that! After that, he decided to stop talking about it concluding that most people would rather ignore the fact that people could act that way or hope that it never really happened. Gordy wasn't sure what he wanted to do with his life after his leave was up. One option was the Navy. He'd started dabbling with taking pictures, so maybe he could try to be a photographer's mate. But he wasn't confident that he was good enough or that the Navy would agree to it. Staying in the submarine service was another possibility, but that seemed unlikely too given that he hadn't been able to pass the qualification tests prior to the sinking of the Grenadier. Going to college was another option. The passage of the GI Bill in June 1944 now made it possible for returning servicemen to have their entire education paid for. It was being hailed as one of the most significant pieces of social legislation of the century for its positive impact on both the economy and its recipients. Many economists were predicting a post-World War II economic depression as the country tried to convert its wartime production levels to those of peacetime. Gordy went to Yakima High to check his transcripts, but left discouraged. For one thing, he learned he was still a year and a half short of getting his diploma. But what dissuaded him even more was seeing all the high school kids in the halls. He was only 22, but after what he'd been through, he felt decades older. The prospects of finding a job didn't look too rosy either. With so many returning GIs flooding the market, jobs were scarce. Gordy's previous work history was unimpressive. Jobs in high school delivering papers, picking fruit, and cleaning an ice rink weren't likely to impress potential employers, and four years in the submarine service without learning any real marketable skills wasn't likely to have employers lining up either. He figured he couldn't count the two years he'd spent slaving in the steel mill at Yawata. He laughed at the thought of writing them for a recommendation. On this day, he was content to do a little joyriding. Heading north out of town, Gordy had no real destination other than to be back in town that evening to go to Dopey's. Suddenly, a Chevy coupe coming in the opposite direction turned left immediately in front of him. Gordy slammed on the brakes, but it was too late. The cars collided launching Larry through the front windshield and Gordy into the steering wheel. Laws requiring seat belts were many years in the future. Gordy staggered out of the car to survey the damage. The other car was crushed, and its young driver and his girlfriend appeared seriously injured. Larry was bleeding profusely from the cuts to his head. Willie and Ray, although badly shaken, appeared okay. But Gordy's Buick, his pride and joy, was beyond repair, and he had a stabbing pain in his side. Plus, a witness was accusing him of driving drunk. Gordy sat at the side of the road, watching the ambulance speed away with the injured couple. Adding to his problems was the fact that he was driving with no insurance. This was not the homecoming he'd dreamed about. 44. Chuck Vervalen, Sodus, New York before Chuck left prison camp, he wrote Gwen a letter using a pencil and lined paper he found in the abandoned Japanese officers' quarters. In the nearly two and a half years he'd been held captive, he'd written her several times, but she had not received any of the letters. 
Gwen had read a story in the Perth newspaper about the grenadier being missing in action, and although she tried to be optimistic, she assumed the worst. She began dating again, eventually getting engaged to another American sailor, Adolf Kornberg from Chicago. Chuck gave the letter to Arthur King, an Aussie POW from Perth whom he'd met in camp. King promised to deliver it to Gwen in person. Darling Gwen, as I sit here outside my so-called home, or what has been my home for twenty-eight months, which also seemed to me a lifetime, I am taking my first opportunity to write to you and try to tell you just why we have been away from each other so long. After we parted that night of March 19, 1943, which has been a long time, but never did I once quit thinking of you, because I knew that some day the war would end, and I only prayed I would make it. On the morning of the 20th, 43, March, we did not leave Fremantle Harbor until 11.30 a.m., and as we went out of the channel, I got one of the fellows to stay in the engine room so I could take my last good look at the barracks where you were. I never thought it would be such a long time before I could see you again. Also, I got a good look at the Ocean Beach Hotel in Leighton Beach, where we had gone several times. My buddy said, take your last good look. So I then went below, saying to myself, I sure will be glad to get back. After many days of patrol, on the morning of April 21, we were bombed by a Jap dive bomber and sunk off Pilgrim Island. We were captured on the 22nd and taken to Penang. We arrived in Japan on the 9th of October. I have worked in a factory here at the town called Yawata on the island of Kyushu. We worked hard and worked right up until the 16th of August when we heard that the war was over. It came as a very sudden surprise, and as yet it is quite hard to believe. I will not tell you my hardships during this time, but you can imagine they were not easy. It sure seemed good to watch the B-29s come over and give these people hell, because that was the only way we knew it was getting close to an end. I understand that there is a battleship and transports just outside the channel, awaiting the word to come in. It cannot be too soon for me. I am writing this letter now to give to Arthur King to bring to you. He is one of only three Aussies in camp. I was sure glad to see them when I first came to this camp, as they are all swell fellows. The only thing I had when I was captured was a pair of pants, a shirt, and that Catholic medal. I still have the medal, and as I told you, I would keep it always. Do you remember me saying on that last night that I had a feeling that something was going to happen? I believed it, because once I had found the one I loved, I knew something would happen. But all that time I have not changed my mind, and I want you to write and tell me just how you feel, and what you did while I was away. How did those pictures you had taken turn out? Please send me one as soon as possible, because I am very anxious to get it. I will also do the same as soon as my hair grows out. Right now I have none. I now weigh about 150, but at one time I only weighed 105, and when I left Australia I reached 160. All I need to get my strength and weight back is some good steak and eggs and Aussie bread. I sure hope somehow to get home by September 25th. Well, Gwen, I will have to say goodbye, but not for such a long time as before. So many thanks to Arthur King to take this letter to you, but he is like all Aussies willing to do a good turn for a Yank. Please send photos and write as soon as possible. Love, Charlie. Returning POWs from the war in the Pacific were required to spend two weeks at the Navy's Oak Knoll Hospital in Oakland, California. Chuck sat in a doctor's office at Oak Knoll. He'd been back in America two weeks, and this was supposed to be the last exam before getting discharged and heading home to see his parents in New York. It had been over a month since he and Tim McCoy had walked out of Fukuoka No. 3, and he was anxious to get home. He and Tim had been the only Navy men on an Army transport ship carrying 900 soldiers on the long ride across the Pacific. Chuck spent a lot of the trip drinking beer and playing poker. He won over $1,200, money he planned to use to bring Gwen to America, if she'd come. He hadn't received a reply to his letter yet. Aside from not hearing from Gwen, his first two weeks in America had gone well. 
He and Tim had been topside when the ship sailed under the Golden Gate, their arrival greeted by huge white letters on the Marin side of the bay that spelled out, Welcome Home. He got goosebumps. At the pier at Hunter's Point in San Francisco, the men were welcomed by a large contingent of wax, waves, and a handful of female marines. After a few dockside speeches, they were taken to Oak Knoll to begin their two weeks of debriefing, which to Chuck just seemed like more of the same that he'd been through in Guam. For the first time, he was allowed to call home. He talked to his sister Yvonne and his mom, who both cried at the sound of his voice. They told him about the article that appeared in the local paper headlined Dundee Boy Lost in Action, about the memorial service that had been held in his honor, and how happy and hopeful they were when his name later showed up on a POW list. Chuck had no complaints about Oak Knoll Hospital, commissioned by the Navy in 1942. It consisted of 25 wooden barracks built on the site of the Oak Knoll Golf and Country Club in the Oakland Hills, and was the primary regional hospital for handling battle casualties returning from the Pacific War and naval personnel requiring specialized care. The best part of Oak Knoll was that he received a pass almost daily. He and Tim had found plenty of opportunities to chase fun in San Francisco and Oakland, doing their best to make up for lost time. The debriefing and examinations had been mostly physical in nature, poking and probing, lots of blood tests, urine samples, blood pressure monitoring, and making sure that the beriberi was under control. Chuck met with a psychologist briefly, who asked if he was having any nightmares or negative effects from his 28-month imprisonment. Chuck reported that other than some pain in his back, he was doing fine. He did mention that he was pissed off that the Navy charged him five dollars for the phone call he'd made home. Chuck was ready to get on with his life. On the fourteen-day voyage home, he'd been asked about his imprisonment by the soldiers on board. The Japs treated us like shit every day, he replied. Beyond that, he didn't go into many details. He preferred talking about the upcoming 1945 World Series between the Detroit Tigers and Chicago Cubs, and whether the Tigers' Hank Greenberg would be rusty coming back from serving in the Army. The doctor had summoned Chuck to his office for this last exam primarily to make sure his leg was healing properly. On the voyage home, he had slipped off a steel ladder and injured his leg, the one that had bothered him since getting pounded with the stairway railing on the Asama Maru. The doctor had diagnosed a hairline fracture and put Chuck's leg in a wraparound cast, but that had done little to slow him down. The doctor re-examined him and authorized his release. Back in his barracks, Chuck found Tim sitting on the edge of his bunk, head in his hands. He'd seen Tim the previous night at Sweet's Ballroom in Oakland, a popular spot for dancing, music, and drinking with returning servicemen and local young women. When it had come time to leave, Chuck, with an attractive nurse from Oak Knoll on his arm, went looking for Tim and finally found him passed out on a bench in the upstairs VIP mezzanine. Chuck tried to rouse him, but when Tim didn't stir, Chuck took off with his new friend. I've got a huge favor to ask, said Tim, glancing up through bloodshot eyes. I need to borrow three hundred dollars. What happened to all your back pay? asked Chuck. I wired a lot of it home, and you're not going to believe what happened to the rest, replied Tim. He then explained that while he was passed out at Sweets, Somebody had taken a knife and cut open the pocket of his pants and stolen his wallet. I'll pay you back, promised Tim. Chuck counted out three hundred dollars. I know you're good for it, he said. Chuck and his friend Buck Deacom sat in Buck's car in front of Irene Damien's apartment building. Buck was Irene's cousin, and he'd been the one to encourage Chuck to pay her a visit, against the advice of Chuck's mom. I'll knock on her door, said Buck. If she's there, I'll signal you to come up. Okay, Chuck replied nervously. He'd finally made it back home, hitchhiking the last leg of his long journey to Sotus, New York, where his parents had moved after he'd joined the Navy. Sotus, a small town on the shore of Lake Ontario between Rochester and Syracuse, prided itself in being the birthplace of Arbor Day. For the Vervalens, Chuck's homecoming was a joyous reunion. His mom and sisters all cried. His dad wanted to know what his plans were for the future. 
Chuck wasn't sure yet. Right now, all he wanted to do was just relax and hang out. When pressed, he talked about making a career in the Navy and becoming an officer. His dad thought that was a good idea. Chuck still had dreams of being involved in harness racing, but that just didn't seem practical. He was going to need steady employment, especially if he was, as he was hinting, going to bring Gwen over from Australia and get married. A letter from Gwen had been waiting when he got home, and it gave him hope. Arthur King had delivered Chuck's letter to her just as he'd promised, and it had turned Gwen's world upside down. Until she received it, she'd assumed Chuck was dead, although she admitted to him that she had never given up hope or stopped thinking about him. Her fiancé, Adolf Kornberg, had returned to America after the war and hoped to bring her over and get married under the War Brides Act but when she received Chuck's letter, she started to have second thoughts. In the three weeks Chuck had been home, he'd received three more letters from her. He'd also received a letter from King, telling him how lucky he was to have found someone so pretty as Gwen. You Yanks have all the luck, he said. To his mom, Chuck extolled Gwen's Aussie charm, and he told her that he was thinking about proposing. Then why do you want to go see Irene, she countered. Good question. Irene was his high school sweetheart, the girl he'd sent his buddy to pick up on dates, and in the first few months after he'd joined the Navy, she had written regularly, sometimes three or four times a week, signing every letter with All My Love Forever. But the letters started coming further and further apart until they eventually stopped altogether. At first it had been hard to deal with, but at least it was better than getting the Dear John letter like so many of his friends. Of all the Dear John stories he'd heard, the worst involved his crewmate George Stauber, the guy who'd been on watch the morning they went down. Stauber thought about his fiancée constantly when they were in the camp. When Stauber got back stateside, she came to visit him in the hospital with her new husband. Stauber ended up having to be restrained in a straitjacket. At least that's the way Chuck heard it. Chuck watched Buck climb the stairs to Irene's apartment. He knew that Irene had married and had a child while he was gone, but still he wanted to see her. She was his first brush with love. He remembered how pretty she was. Did she know he'd been a POW? Heart pounding, Chuck peered around a corner of the building and watched Buck knock on her door. What if her husband answered? The door opened. I have somebody I want you to meet, he heard Buck say. Irene stepped outside, and Chuck moved to the bottom of the stairs in full view. Irene stared in disbelief, her hand covering her mouth. Chuck! Chuck! she exclaimed, running down the stairs. I thought you were dead! You're alive! You're alive! She threw her arms around him, tears streaming down her face. Chuck hugged her and they embraced for what seemed like forever to Chuck as her tears turned to joyful sobs. Finally, Irene took him by the hand and led him back up the stairs and into the apartment. Toys covered the living room floor. She quickly explained that her two-year-old son was asleep in a back room and that her husband was at work. As Chuck sat down on the couch, he let his eyes wash over her. She was just as pretty as he remembered and she was pregnant. Buck excused himself, saying he'd be back in a couple of hours to pick up Chuck. The two hours sped by. Irene told him that she'd stopped writing because she'd met her husband and just couldn't make herself write a Dear John letter, figuring that Chuck would eventually figure it out. Her husband had been in the Army Reserve, but didn't see combat, and was now selling insurance. She talked about what a nice, considerate man he was, and how hard he worked to support her and their son. When the boy woke up from his nap, Chuck held him on his knee while Irene fixed lunch. Buck returned to pick up Chuck. Hearing Buck come up the stairs, Irene grabbed Chuck's hand and clutched it tight. I really did love you, Chuck, she said, tears filling her eyes. Two weeks later, Chuck sat across from his mother, holding a letter from Irene. What should I do? he asked. You're a grown man, Chuck, she replied. 
I can't tell you what to do, but I hope I raised you well enough so that you know what's right. Chuck glanced down at Irene's letter. It had caught him completely off guard. In it she confessed that she had never stopped loving him and had gotten married because her husband was just so nice and promised he would take good care of her, but it was Chuck who truly owned her heart. But what took him totally by surprise was that she said that she would leave her husband and marry Chuck if he would still have her and her children. She said that she wanted to have more children with him. I thought you wanted to marry the Australian girl, said his mom. I thought I did, replied Chuck. 45. Bob Palmer, Medford, Oregon Bob stood on the deck of the transport ship, staring out at the ocean. He couldn't remember if they'd been sailing for ten or eleven days. A lot of things were still fuzzy to him. But he did know they'd be arriving in San Francisco in a couple of days. He hoped his beloved wife Barbara would be there to greet him. Before leaving Guam, he'd sent a telegram to the apartment on Pine Street where she'd lived when they got married on December 16, 1941. He didn't know if she still lived there, but he was counting on the telegram being forwarded if she didn't. He'd also sent a telegram to his dad and stepmother in Medford, telling them to make sure Barbara knew he was coming home. When he'd walked out of the death hut, he weighed barely 80 pounds. Now, a month later, He'd already gained back about thirty pounds, although he still had little muscle tone. His various physical ailments, including the beriberi, were greatly improved, but he was still struggling psychologically. On a couple of the days aboard the ship, he'd been so depressed that it was all he could do to get out of his bunk to go for chow. He kept reminding himself not to let his mind go to the dark places, to keep it positive, to think about holding Barbara in his arms once again but it was a struggle. Barbara tried to digest the news. What should I do? she asked. You know what I want, replied Robert Coonhart. They were sitting in a motel room in Escanaba, Michigan, on the shores of Lake Michigan in the state's upper peninsula, the latest stop on the USS Merrow's goodwill tour of the Great Lakes. Barbara had just received the telegram from Bob, Edna, her former roommate back in San Francisco, had forwarded it to her. His ship would be arriving in San Francisco in seven days. For over two years, Barbara had not known whether her husband was dead or alive. She had repeatedly tried to get information from the Navy Department without success. When other names of Grenadier crew members showed up on the Red Cross's list of POWs, but not his, her hopes sunk even lower. When Barbara initially started dating Coonhart, eight months after the grenadier went down, she wondered whether she'd waited long enough, and if she'd been persuaded to start dating again because of the package of Bob's belongings that she'd received from the woman in Australia. Barbara was, of course, greatly relieved to find out Bob was still alive, but now she was almost two years into a relationship with Coonhart and in love with him. The next day, with the wife of another Merrow officer as her passenger, she took off for San Francisco in Coonhart's 41 Ford. She was going to do the right thing and be there to meet Bob when he got off that ship. Beyond that, she wasn't sure. Barbara heard the knock on the door and groggily rolled off the couch. It was 11 a.m. on September 29, 1945, and she was in her former apartment on Pine Street in San Francisco where her friend Edna now resided. She'd arrived at 3 a.m. after driving straight through from Salt Lake City and dropping off the other wife at a friend's house. Bob's ship was due in four hours. She opened the door, surprised to find her father standing there. He'd taken a Greyhound bus from Medford and then a cab to the apartment. Before leaving Michigan, she had sent her parents a telegram telling them she was going to meet Bob. She recognized the look on her father's face. It was the same one he'd worn when he and her mother told her back in high school that they didn't want her dating Bob. Your mother and I don't think you should meet that ship. Don't get me wrong. We're happy to know that Bob is still alive. But we just think you'd be making a big mistake if you show up to greet him. It'll send the wrong message. 
The truth is, your lot in life will be infinitely better with Robert Coonhart. We don't even know what Bob will be like. I've seen some of these returning G.I.s, and most of them have battle shock. They're not the same as they were before the war. That's probably going to be the case with Bob. Barbara looked overwhelmed. I think you and I should drive home to Medford, said her father. When Bob stepped off his ship, finally back in America after all those months, nobody was there to greet him. Bob handed the bus driver a hundred-dollar bill. I can't change this, the driver said. Don't you have a dime? Bob shook his head. At Oak Knoll, he'd received over $3,000 in back pay paid in $100 bills. He was trying to catch a bus from Oak Knoll to San Francisco. He needed to get to the Navy outfitter. All he had was the Army uniform he'd been given in Guam. He had been back in America for over a week. He was glad to be back home, but his state of mind wasn't good. Every day in prison camp he had fantasized about what it would be like when Barbara greeted him when he stepped off the ship, even down to the clothes she'd be wearing. When she wasn't there when he walked down the gangway, he was crushed. He stood on the pier for minutes, shoulders sagging, hoping she would appear. He wondered if maybe she hadn't gotten his telegram, so he took a cab to the Pine Street apartment where he talked with Edna, the woman now living there. After several awkward moments, she explained that Barbara had met another man, an Annapolis grad from a prominent family back east, and was now up in Medford with her parents. He thanked Edna for the information and left. The next day he reached Barbara by phone, telling her that when he was released from Oak Knoll in a couple of days he would be transferred to Camp White near Medford and hoped to see her. She said nothing about Coonhart. He said nothing about being a POW. She did, however, agree to meet. The bus driver handed Bob back the hundred-dollar bill. Did you serve overseas? he asked. Bob nodded. Then you're a hero in my book, and heroes ride for free. Barbara's father opened the door and let Bob inside, shaking his hand. We were so happy to get the news that you were alive, he said. How are you doing? Fine, thank you, sir, replied Bob turning to also greet Barbara's mother. Then he caught his first glimpse of Barbara. She was even cuter, shapelier than he remembered. Tears welled in his eyes. His knees felt as if they would surely buckle. He tried to speak, but the words stalled, his long-rehearsed speech vanishing back down his throat. He just stood and stared. Tears also rushed to Barbara's eyes, Bob looked so much older. The last time she'd seen him, he was a young twenty-one-year-old, bright-eyed and sure of himself, even as he was about to go off to war. Now, standing there in his new blue navy uniform, he looked tired, puffy, uncertain. She giggled nervously, and then moved to give him a hug. Bob hugged her back, but the moment was stiff, uncomfortable. In his dreams of this moment, he never saw Mr. and Mrs. Kohler standing two feet away. Nor did he imagine seeing another man's engagement ring on his wife's finger, a ring that probably cost twenty times more than the one Barbara had bought just before they got married. They all sat down in the living room, and Barbara sensed his discomfort. Shall we go for a drive and look around the old town, she offered. Soon they were driving south of town on Highway 99, through Ashland and up into the Siskiyou Mountains, Bob just staring at the road. What happened to you? asked Barbara. What happened to your ship? How come you were never on any Red Cross POW list I saw? Don't know. How did they treat you? Did they beat you? He didn't answer, and just kept driving on the narrow road up Mount Ashland in silence. He lit another cigarette, flicking the ashes out the window. Are you okay? she asked. Fine, he answered. But clearly he wasn't. His silence and his refusal to tell her anything about what had happened scared Barbara. She didn't think that he was going to hurt her physically, but she was afraid that he had come back so emotionally scarred that he would never be the same. The last three weeks had moved so fast. The telegram that he was alive, the decision to meet his ship, 
the cross-country drive, the intervention by her father, the return to Medford, the cables from Coonhart, and now seeing the shell of a man who was still her husband. You just seem, uh, um, she stuttered. Seem so what? I guess sad is the word I'd use. Can you blame me? He said. I survived by thinking about you, and I come home and find you run off with somebody else. Bob, I thought you were dead. Well, I hear this is the age of gold diggers, so I guess that's what I can expect. That's not fair. So what do you want me to do? He asked. Do you want a divorce? She hesitated, and then replied softly, I suppose. He turned the car around and drove back to Medford in silence. Two weeks later, Barbara parked Coonhart's Ford in front of the Medford Hotel and went inside, heading directly for the bar. A friend had told her that Bob had been spotted drinking there the past couple of nights. Barbara had also heard from mutual friends that at one point Bob had been put in a very small hospital room, almost like a cage, and spent most of the next forty-eight hours curled in the fetal position in a corner. A nurse had come into the room, and Bob proposed to her. Despite this behavior, Bob had improved enough that he was regularly given twelve-hour leaves, which he used to go to the Medford Hotel bar and get drunk. One of the reasons Barbara wanted to talk to Bob was to tell him that she was driving back to Michigan the next day to rejoin Coonhart. She also wanted to tell him that her father had offered to pay the two hundred dollars necessary for them to get a divorce in Reno and she just wanted to see how he was doing. She truly cared about him, even though she was worried that what he'd been through was just too hard for him to cope with, and would be for her as well. Entering the dimly lit bar, Barbara spotted Bob sitting alone on a stool at the end of the bar. Mind if I sit down? she asked. I hear it's a free country, he slurred. She quickly told him she was leaving the next day. He awkwardly put his arm around her, does this mean I'll never see you again? he asked. Who knows what the future holds, she said. Well, if we aren't ever going to see each other again, then how's about let's get a room here? And, you know, for old time's sake? The offer completely surprised Barbara. She studied him to see if he was serious. He was, at least to the extent he could be after drinking for three hours. She saw those beautiful blue eyes and the hint of that devilish smile she'd loved so much as a teenager. Taking his hand, she led him out of the bar to the front desk. There was a knock at the door. I'll get it, said Barbara, getting off the couch. It was mid-December 1945, and she was visiting with Edna in the apartment on Pine Street in San Francisco. After leaving Medford, she'd driven back to Michigan and rejoined Coonhart. They'd traveled to New Orleans, where the Merrow was temporarily stationed prior to shipping off to Pearl Harbor for several months. From New Orleans, she had driven back to San Francisco. Coonhart would join her there in the early spring when they planned to marry. She opened the door, surprised to find Bob standing there. She hadn't talked to him since the night at the Medford Hotel in October, a night that had not gone well. Whether it was the alcohol or performance anxiety, or not having been with a woman for so long, Bob was not able to perform. Barbara was amazed at how much better he looked. He was no longer puffy, his eyes bright and clear, his smile back. You look great, she said. So do you. He was still on his ninety-day leave, on his way to Reno to get a divorce with the two hundred dollars that Mr. Kohler had given him. He had taken a big detour to San Francisco, in truth, he'd come to the apartment to ask Edna out for a drink, but not now. Why don't you come to Reno with me? he asked. Barbara thought for a moment. Sure, she answered. The snow was still falling when they awoke. For Bob, everything seemed perfect. The drive from San Francisco to Reno in Coonhart's car had been so romantic, a light snow falling the last few miles. Along the way, Barbara had scooted across the front seat and snuggled up next to him, her hand on his leg, kissing his neck and cheek. By the time they checked into the hotel, they were in full heat. This time, Bob was able to finish what he hadn't been able to in Medford, 
four times. Although they interrupted their lovemaking long enough for Barbara to send a telegram to her parents, letting them know where she was. They also went out dining and dancing, stopping at several places and each time requesting the band play the Anniversary Waltz. It was December 16, 1945, four years to the day that they got married. Let's just stay in bed all day, suggested Bob. Barbara sat up. If Bob was not 100% the man she'd fallen in love with, he was certainly better. His spark and his humor were back, reminding her of what had attracted her to him in the beginning. She found him so damn cute. She was attracted to Coonhart, too, but the sexual chemistry she had with Bob was not there. We can't stay in bed all day, she replied. Why not? First of all, you wore me out. Second of all, we have to go file for divorce. Bob's mouth fell open. She couldn't be serious. They'd made love all night long, and she still wanted a divorce. Barbara's heart was telling her to stay with Bob. There was passion there and history. She had cried on her pillow for months after she received the telegram telling her he was missing in action. And when he finally got back, he'd confessed that he'd survived his nightmarish imprisonment only because of the hope of seeing her again. With all of that, not to mention the incredible sex, how could she not be with him? But her brain was telling her something else. She was convinced her parents would never accept Bob and would surely disown her if she chose him. Coonhart would obviously provide a more secure future. He talked about how he was going to make Admiral one day, and she loved the thought of being an officer's wife and the prestige that went with it. Bob, on the other hand, didn't seem to have a clue where his life was heading other than to the next bar. Coonhart's family had been so warm and welcoming, something that she'd never felt with Bob's. And as affectionate and passionate as he'd been last night, there was something that told her he still wasn't whole. He had not said one word about what had happened to him, brushing off every attempt she made to get him to open up with either you wouldn't want to know or you couldn't possibly understand. Bob, I know this is hard for you to understand, she said but I still want to go through with the divorce. An hour after getting their divorce, they headed out west of Reno on US-50. Bob eyed a hitchhiker up ahead. Barbara, I'm asking you one last time, he said. Let's turn around and get remarried. I can't do it, Bob. But how can you tell me you love me like you did last night and not want to be married? I thought people who were in love were married. Or did that all change while I was away? I don't understand all of this myself, but I just think I'm doing the right thing. He swerved to the side of the highway, motioning for the hitchhiker to climb aboard, instructing the man to sit in the middle between him and Barbara. For the rest of the way to San Francisco, Bob talked occasionally to the hitchhiker, but not to Barbara. Six hours of icy silence between them. Back at the apartment, Barbara read the brief but to the point telegram from her parents. Your recent escapade leaves much to be desired in the way of comportment. She set it down and took a deep breath. She was twenty-four years old, but her parents' opinion still meant everything to her. Her parting with Bob in front of the apartment building had been as silent as the ride home, but in some ways that had been for the best. As Barbara put the telegram in a drawer, the phone rang. It was Coonhart, calling on a two-way radio from Pearl Harbor. Yes, she reassured him, she really missed him and still loved him. I can't wait for us to be married, she said. The next day, Bob boarded a bus and headed back to Medford and an uncertain future. 46. Tim Skeeter McCoy of Texas Tim peeked out the blinds of his parents' house in Chula Vista, California, a growing suburb in southern San Diego County. He was impatiently waiting for Gordy Cox, who'd called to say he was visiting from Yakima and needed to see him. They hadn't talked since prison camp. After his release from Oak Knoll, Tim had been transferred to the Balboa Naval Hospital in San Diego, although he was spending most of his time in Chula Vista with his parents. During his imprisonment, Harold and Cappy McCoy had begun talking to each other for the first time since they'd divorced when Tim was in ninth grade. His dad had divorced his second wife, remarried Cappy, 
and moved to California for the climate. He seemed devoted to Cappy and proud of Tim. This was all good news to Tim, especially how happy his mom seemed. Tim was doing his best to forgive his dad. Tim was trying to keep a positive attitude, not just about his dad, but about everything. On the days he had to go to Balboa Naval Hospital for tests, however, it was tough. Located next to scenic Balboa Park in San Diego, the hospital had become the primary care provider for thousands of military families in Southern California and now housed nearly 20,000 war wounded. A walk down a hallway could be depressing. The facility was so short-staffed that on some rotations young doctors were overseeing as many as a thousand patients. For Tim, who was born impatient, the wait seemed endless. He glanced out the window again, hoping to see Gordy arrive. There was still no sign of him. Bulldozers and contracting crews worked on a new subdivision across the street. Chula Vista was on the front edge of suburban expansion in Southern California, and with the return of thousands of servicemen who wanted to stay in the area, the lemon tree orchards that once covered the landscape were now giving way to low-cost housing developments soon to be financed by the G.I. Bill. Tim spotted the postman, and his hopes soared, just as they did every day. Maybe there would be another letter from Valma. Since his release, he had reconnected with her by mail, telling her that he'd thought about her every day in prison camp and that he still wanted to marry her. To his great relief and happiness, she'd written back, telling him how she'd never taken off the engagement ring he'd given her the last day they were together in Perth. He was also happy to learn that she and his parents had been exchanging letters for over a year while he was in prison camp. She'd even sent them a picture of herself, which was now framed and sitting on a shelf in the living room. But Tim was even happier when she agreed to his proposed plans. He'd already sent her the money for the trip to the States. She had said that she wanted to get married in Los Angeles. She'd never been to America, but she'd read about L.A. in magazines and seen it in movies, and it seemed so romantic, the perfect place to be married. L.A. was fine by Tim. Now he just had to wait for the red tape to be removed. According to reports, Congress was about to pass the War Brides Act, which would make it easier for servicemen to bring their foreign girlfriends to America to wed. There was still a lot of paperwork they would have to complete before it could happen, but Tim was impatiently counting the days. On this day, however, there was no letter from Valma, for the tenth day in a row. Finally, a car arrived and Gordy stepped out, accompanied by a woman. At first glance, Tim figured his crewmate had gotten married, but upon closer examination, Tim saw the gray hair and wrinkles. It was Gordy's mom. Tim ushered them into the living room and introduced his parents. Gordy explained that he and his mother and youngest brother Willie had driven down from Yakima to deliver Willie to Navy boot camp. But that's not why we came to see you, added Mrs. Cox, looking first at Tim, then at his mother. She paused, choking back tears, and pointed toward Tim. Young man, she said, as a mother, I want to thank you for what you did for my son. He tells me you saved his life. Tim remembered smuggling portions of rice back into the barracks to feed Gordy when he was close to death. We all did what we had to do to survive, he said. Mrs. Cox turned to Tim's parents. Your son's a hero, she said. They're all heroes, said Tim's dad, beaming. Tim checked the mailbox again, hoping for a letter from Valma. This time there was a nice thick one. He was nearing the end of his ninety-day leave, and soon he'd have to make a decision on what he wanted to do next. He'd always admired his uncle's success in the insurance business and considered the possibility of going to work for him. But his uncle was back in Texas, and with his parents now living in California, that might be a harder transition. It was more likely that he would stay in the Navy and try to become an officer. Before he had been captured, he really liked the life the camaraderie, structure, job security, and feeling of being part of something special, especially as a submariner. But he didn't know whether he would qualify for training as a naval officer. He hadn't completed high school, and although the Navy would count the time he'd spent as a POW toward a commission, he didn't feel confident that he'd learned the skills necessary to advance, at least not yet. His second and bigger concern was Valma. 
It would be hard enough on her coming to a new country and culture without knowing anyone, but to have her husband away from home and out to sea for long periods of time seemed a truly daunting way to start a marriage. He opened the envelope, smelling the letter as he pulled it out. He liked the way her letters always were written on scented stationery. Congress had just passed the War Brides Act, and Tim was just one of tens of thousands of U.S. military personnel now involved in bringing their potential mates across the Atlantic and Pacific to marry. America was now experiencing an unusual new wave of immigrants, dubbed petticoat pilgrims by the press, women who'd first met American servicemen during a time of war and chaos. These women were now arriving daily on converted warships. It wasn't an easy transition. Prior to leaving, they had to fill out mountains of forms in triplicate and endure sometimes humiliating physicals. They were also often the target of anger and scorn from returning servicemen in their own countries, who were resentful that the women were chasing after a romanticized version of love in America. And now these war brides were quickly encountering difficulties for which love in wartime hadn't prepared them. They stepped off the ships and discovered men much different from the ones they'd met during the war. Some were battle-scarred, some had gone from romantic to abusive, some were broke, some were jobless, some were drinking too much. And now, on top of all that, these women were far from home and incredibly lonely, with no money for return passage. But unfolding Velma's letter, Skeeter wasn't worried about any of that. What he knew was that she was the prettiest girl he'd ever met, with an accent so sweet and lilting that he would never get tired of listening to her. In his eyes, for her to be willing to give up everything she had to come halfway across the world to be with him, well, she certainly had to love him an awful lot. He began to read, Dear Tim, It is with the deepest sorrow that I am returning your engagement ring and the money you sent for my trip to America. He stopped reading. No, no, he gasped. It felt like someone had sucked all the air out of his lungs. How could this be true? His mind flashed to their last night together, and how he'd shouted for joy when she accepted his proposal. And all those nights in prison camp when he lay in his bunk and thought about her and dreamed of their life together. It didn't matter that they had probably spent less than ten days together, or that they had never made love. This couldn't be happening. Maybe he'd misread that first line. But no, it was true. He continued reading. Valma's mother had cancer, and Valma needed to be there for her. His first thought was that Valma had just made up the story to let him down easy. His second thought was that maybe her mother would die soon and Valma could come to the States then. But the more he reread the letter and the more he thought about it, the more hopeless it felt. Nothing he'd suffered in prison camp, the starvation, the days in the bunker, the constant battle with the guards, had ever caused him to lose hope. But this was pushing him to the edge. Part 9 Sixty Years Later 47. Chuck Vervalen, Concord, California As far as Las Vegas buffets go, it was pretty pathetic. Skinny chicken thighs, lumpy mashed potatoes, soggy green beans. But the tasteless food didn't matter to the grenadier survivors men familiar with eating rice one grain at a time. It was December 2000, and they were gathered for their annual reunion within the Subvets reunion at the Imperial Palace, a low-rent hotel on the Vegas Strip. Chuck Vervalen was holding court, his deep voice rising above the low din of slot machines and gamblers on the other side of the wall. Of the dozen survivors at the reunion, he seemed the most robust, a cross between Ernest Borgnine and Ed Asner. Has anyone heard from Johnny Johnson? he asked, inquiring about his bunkmate at Fukuoka No. 3. For Chuck, seeing Johnny Johnson had been a big incentive to attend this reunion. They had not seen each other since the day in 1945 when Chuck and Tim walked out of the camp. They'd each sent a few Christmas cards over the years, but there had been no other contact. Johnson lived in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, Chuck in Concord, California. Since Bob Palmer organized the first Grenadier reunion in 1975, Chuck had been to all but one. 
Now, with most of the survivors in their early eighties, there was a greater sense of urgency. Fewer and fewer men attended each year, their ranks depleted by death and illness. A bottle of Dom Perignon was being held in safekeeping by a son of one of the crew, to be delivered to and shared by the last two remaining survivors. During dessert, Bernie Witzke, who now lived in San Diego, brought up the subject of reparation. He had recently written Senator Orrin Hatch of the Armed Services Committee, inquiring about the status of a proposed bill to make restitution to all former POWs. He pulled a sheet of paper out of a folder. I got this form letter back telling me the same old bullshit they've been telling us for years, said Witzke, passing around the letter. It's funny how our government has been able to somehow pay $25,000 to all those Japs that had to go into internment camps, but has never given us a dime. I'm not saying those Japs didn't deserve compensation. It's just that we were the ones fighting for our country. As Chuck pushed back from the table, ready to call it a night, he glanced across the room and spotted a handsome, elderly man with thinning silver hair entering the room, escorted by an elegantly dressed elderly woman. Chuck studied the man, trying to place him. Suddenly a light of recognition went on, and he quickly headed toward the couple. Johnny! he exclaimed, his voice cracking. The two men walked toward each other, meeting in the center of the room. They paused ten feet apart, each trying to peel away five decades. It was Chuck who spoke first. You old blanket hog, he said. Friend, drawled Johnson, I do believe it was you who hogged the blanket. Chuck and Johnny embraced, tears rolling down their cheeks. After his visit with Irene Damien and her letter telling him that she wanted to get a divorce and be with him, Chuck wrote back and gently told her that he just couldn't do it. Instead, he continued exchanging love letters with Gwen in Australia, and in May 1946, he brought her to America on the War Brides Act. Three days after her arrival, they were married in a small wedding ceremony in Chicago, where Chuck was first stationed after deciding to pursue a career in the Navy. His best man was Eugene Lutz, the Marine he'd met at Fukuoka No. 3. At Gwen's request, Chuck converted to Catholicism. Their wedding night at the Blackstone Hotel was a disaster. Like many young men who'd gone off to war, Chuck had not yet learned a more gentle approach to lovemaking. For Gwen, a virgin, the experience was painful and traumatic. She screamed so loudly for him to stop that hotel security came to the room to make sure everything was okay. Chuck assured them that it was, but it was an inauspicious start to the marriage. Over the next couple of months, Chuck tried to introduce Gwen to life in America, taking her to a Cubs game at Wrigley, midget auto racing, a Sinatra concert, and even an opera. But for Gwen, the transition was difficult, and she had serious doubts about her decision to move to America. Chuck took her to parties with other Navy personnel and their wives, but she didn't drink and found it hard to fit in. Six months after they were married, Chuck was transferred to Pensacola, Florida, by this time, Gwen was pregnant, so she stayed behind in Chicago, living in a thirty-dollar-a-month one-room hotel studio, sleeping on a Murphy bed. With no friends or family for support, one lonely day passed into another. When their son, John, was born in July 1947, Chuck did not return to Chicago, and Gwen became deeply depressed. She thought about getting a divorce but she couldn't reconcile that with her strict Catholic upbringing. For the next twenty-five years, while Chuck traveled the globe with the Navy, including a stint in Vietnam, and climbed to the rank of lieutenant commander, Gwen stayed home and raised their children, John and a daughter, Marilyn, born in 1954. Chuck's career took him out to sea for months at a time, and Gwen resented his long absences. After thirty-eight years, they divorced in 1984. Neither remarried. It was June 2002, and Chuck was at his daughter Marilyn's house on a cul-de-sac in Walnut Creek, a suburb twenty miles east of Chicago. His car, a Japanese-made Toyota with a WW2 POW and submarine vet license frame, was parked in front. Marilyn was at work at her job as an insurance adjuster, 
and her two children, Paige, a fifth grader, and Jonathan, an eighth grader, were at school. Chuck, who lived five miles away in nearby Concord, was at the house to supervise the installation of new windows, for which he was paying. Chuck's son-in-law had died of a stroke three years earlier, at the age of 42. That same night, Chuck suffered a heart attack after he rushed over to Marilyn's house. He spent a week in intensive care and missed his son-in-law's funeral. Adding to the family's grief, his son John died a year later at the age of 53. Wearing khaki pants and an Old Navy t-shirt, Chuck sat outside in the sun-splashed backyard, proudly pointing out the deck that he had built. I wasn't the best husband or father, he admitted. I was never around when my kids were growing up. I guess I'm trying to make up for it now with Marilyn and her two kids. He pointed toward a new flat-screen TV he'd just bought for his daughter. I pulled a groin muscle trying to unload that damn thing, he said. But I did a good job negotiating down the price. The salesman was Jewish. They know how to deal. Over the sound of hammers and skill saws in the background, Chuck talked about his life over the last sixty years. When he talked about Gwen, he was gruff and surly, but when talking about Marilyn and his grandkids, he was thoughtful and borderline sweet. He also showed signs of the devilish sense of humor that had repeatedly gotten him into trouble as a child, and despite being in his eighties and having suffered a number of physical setbacks, he was clear-minded. When the conversation turned to his time in prison camp, he furrowed his brow and stiffened. Those little bastards were fucking evil, he said, almost snarling. I'll never forget what they did to us. He paused, considering his next words carefully. But I can forgive them. A few of the guards and pushers were actually nice to me. When you think about it, they were just doing what they'd been trained to do. It was all that Bushido bullshit. It's like the Palestinians today. They don't know any other way. Chuck planned well for his retirement. He was collecting a Navy pension, Social Security, disability compensation, and another pension from the 15 years he worked for the Contra Costa Humane Society after retiring from the Navy. In total, his income was almost $6,000 a month, plus his house was paid off, and he was making a little money from investments in the stock market. He claimed he broke even on his regular excursions to the racetrack, in addition to being able to contribute to remodeling and other household expenses for Marilyn, he still made monthly support payments to Gwen, even though they'd been divorced for nearly twenty years. He co-owned her condo in Concord a few miles away. Chuck vividly recalled the details of the sinking of the Grenadier and how Captain Fitzgerald had been waterboarded. That's one thing I can't forgive him for, he bristled. That was inhuman. Believe me, Fitzgerald was one tough son of a bitch. Chuck was interrupted again, this time by a phone call from Gwen. They still talked on the phone or saw each other almost daily. Perhaps it was because of a shared grief over the loss of their son, or because they were both deeply involved in the lives of their daughter and grandkids, or because they had met and fallen in love in the frenzy of wartime. Whatever the reason, the connection was still there. When Chuck was sick the previous week, Gwen had brought him meals and done his laundry. The day before, he had gone to her condo to fix a leaky kitchen faucet and help get her car repaired. Although hard-pressed to say anything nice about Gwen, even about her parenting skills, he generously gave her his time and provided a big part of her financial support. Two weeks ago is a perfect example, he said. I spent almost the whole day taking her to get her medicine up at Travis Air Force Base because it's cheaper there, but when I asked her for three dollars for bridge fare, she acted as if I was some sort of serial killer. And I'll tell you something else that pisses me off about her. From the day we got married, she has constantly told me how I ruined her life. If you listen to her, I practically kidnapped her from her beloved Australia. Well, if that's the case, why didn't she move back? I'll tell you why. She'd rather stay here and bitch at me and remind me what a bad father and shitty husband I was. I've tried to be nice, but it doesn't work. I tried not talking to her, and that didn't work either. She just keeps complaining. Just once, I'd like to talk with her when she doesn't complain about something. She goes to church every week, but as far as I can tell, it doesn't do her any good. 
The final straw that destroyed their marriage was when Gwen found out Chuck was having an affair. She picked up a pitcher of orange juice and dumped it on him, then tried to slap him. Chuck flew into a rage and grabbed her, he explained, partly because of all the times he'd been slapped as a POW and a vow that he'd never let anybody slap him ever again. Gwen called the police, who ordered Chuck to pack his suitcase and leave. He did as ordered, bringing his golf clubs as well. For the next two weeks, he slept in the back of his car in the parking lot of the Humane Society, where he was working at the time. When he finally went to rent a room in a cheap motel, he discovered that she'd wiped out their joint checking account. When the topic changed to his career in the Navy, however, he talked with pride. I was a real hard-ass, by-the-book kind of officer, he said. My men like to call me Big V, although not to my face. Looking back, I think the Navy and the government treated me fairly. They didn't originally give me combat disability for the injuries I received as a POW, but overall, I can't complain. One tough time in his career was when he got home from Vietnam. He'd volunteered to go and served in the Mekong Delta supplying riverboats. He injured his neck in a helicopter accident, and when he came home, the sight of hippies from Berkeley and San Francisco with their long hair and protest signs didn't sit well with him. Neither did Jane Fonda. But what was I going to do about it, he said. Tell them I was an ex-POW and convince them how much I sacrificed for this country? It was during the mid-1960s that John started acting out. Chuck was trying to be a good father, even joining a father-son bowling league when they were stationed in Hawaii, but it was hard to make up for all the lost time. The low point came when Chuck slammed John against a wall for staying out all night. Later, when John married and had a child, Chuck did not have a good relationship with his daughter-in-law, which further limited the time he spent with his son. I wouldn't give her a nickel to blow her ass to hell, he scowled. Eventually, John separated from his wife, and then, a year after that, he died. According to Chuck, it was cancer. It just spread through his whole body, he said. Chuck left Marilyn's house to run errands, and while he was out, Gwen stopped by to check on the progress the contractor was making. In her eighties now, it was easy to see the beauty that made Chuck fall in love all those years ago. Gwen wasted little time before complaining about her lot in life. My whole life has been a wreck, she claimed, and it's his fault. And now I have emphysema and he's to blame. All those years he smoked and I had to breathe it all in. He knew I had asthma. I almost died from it. And yet it didn't stop him from smoking two packs a day. He was inconsiderate. But at least he finally quit. When I first met him during the war, he wasn't that way. He looked like Gary Cooper, and he was very gentlemanly and well-behaved. I thought he carried himself well and looked great in his uniform. He took me to movies and skating. We'd go to Leighton Beach and just sit on the beautiful white sand and talk. I was proud to point to him and say he was with me. Because of the war there was rationing, and new clothes were hard to come by, so most of the time I'd wear my military uniform, and if I do say so myself, I looked quite good in it. I still have that uniform, and it still fits. She struggled to recall her fondest memory of their marriage. I don't have any, she finally said. During our marriage, he never took me out to dinner or movies or anywhere. He never got me anything for my birthdays or gave me a Mother's Day card. I gave him a St. Christopher's medal just before that last patrol, and he said he'd wear it forever. Well, he lost it and didn't even care. He didn't know how to show affection. He was like his dad, gruff, a man's man, but not easy for me to be around. He was always bossing me. He still does. We were married thirty-eight years, and he was home maybe five of those years. He was married to the Navy. But I'll say this about him. He never hit me. He still ruined my life, and it started right from our wedding night. He was rough. He didn't know he was doing anything wrong, and he just didn't care. Years later, we were watching a video of the movie Ryan's Daughter, and there was a scene where a man was forcing himself on a woman. Chuck turned to me and said, I did that to you. At least he admitted it. Not even my family understands how hard it's been for me. My sisters fall all over him and think he's wonderful. I have to admit he's very likable and has a fabulous personality. 
but he never saw me for who I was. We were strangers when we wed, hadn't seen each other in four years. We had no business getting married. We're just too different. He likes to drink. I've never touched a drop. I'm a Republican. He's a Democrat. I'm a strict Catholic. He never goes to church. About the only thing we had in common, other than our children, was that we both have bad tempers. It was the Irish in me that made me always yell at him. She told the story of how she met and got engaged to Adolf Kornberg after Chuck's ship was reported lost at sea. I probably made a mistake by not marrying Adolf, she said. Chuck was always jealous of him. He found a picture I had of him and tore it up. Adolf's the reason he doesn't like Jews. Despite her age, she still wanted to return to Australia. I've lived too long apart from my family, she said. In my heart, I'm Australian. I don't want to die here. Nor do I want to die with it being on my soul that I was mean to Chuck. He told me many times that he survived prison camp because he was so determined to marry me. Even when she talked about the death of her son, her anger and resentment were unmistakable. Chuck likes to tell everyone that John died of cancer, she said. That's not true. Our son died of AIDS, and Chuck knows it. He's just too ashamed to admit it. It was so hard to watch John waste away, said Gwen. The nurse told me that he was afraid he wasn't loved, so every time I came to see him I told him I loved him. Two hours before he died, he opened his eyes and looked at me, and nobody else. I left to go home, and then after Marilyn called to tell me he had passed, I came back. And when I saw Chuck, I put my arms around him, and he just stood there like a statue. I didn't get any comfort from Marilyn either. I'd just lost my son, and nobody cared about me. It broke my heart. John was my life. Then I had to watch him die the way he did. He said to me at one point, Mom, I'm dying in shame. After he died, I was at Bingo one night and told a woman there that my son died of AIDS, and she said he deserved to die. Can you imagine saying that to the mother? But John didn't get AIDS like people suspect. He was married and had a child. He told me he got it from a prostitute. It was a scorching summer day in Concord in 2004. The surrounding hills were parched, as were most of the lawns on Chuck Street in a working-class neighborhood of modest houses built in the 1960s. But his lawn was green, and the sprinkler was beating out a rat-tat-tat, disturbing the stillness. Answering the door, he was shirtless, his breathing labored. A scar from his open-heart surgery ran down the middle of his chest from his neck to his belt line. I feel like shit today, he said. His doctor had him on a special liquid diet in preparation for an exam tomorrow for a new intestinal pain. He had to drink a phosphate sodium solution and a bottle of water every hour. In the past twelve years, he had endured a heart attack, stomach cancer, kidney stones, high blood pressure, open-heart surgery, bad knees, an operation to fuse two vertebrae, loss of feeling in a couple of fingers, and a pacemaker implant. When he was diagnosed with stomach cancer, his doctor told him he most likely had six months to live. That was seven years ago. Thank heavens for the outstanding medical coverage I have through the Navy and VA, he said. Over the years, he'd also taken medication to help him cope with the nightmares and flashbacks from his POW experience. In the mid-1970s, he also took part in group therapy sessions at the VA with 15 POWs from World War II and Vietnam. It was a tough time for me, he recalled. I was still having nightmares, plus my marriage was falling apart and I didn't want anyone to know. I was depressed. They put me on Valium, and I was chasing it with stiff bourbon and water. I'd wake up the next morning feeling funny. This went on for six or seven months. The shrink was this Jewish guy. He classified me with post-traumatic stress, although I don't think he called it that at the time. At one point, these other guys in the group were all complaining that they'd been treated poorly and the doctor was reinforcing them. I went off. Uncle Sam don't owe you nothing, I told them. I almost hit that son of a bitch of a doctor. They kicked me out of the group. Chuck sat in a well-worn easy chair watching the San Francisco Giants on TV berating Barry Bonds. 
On the fridge in the kitchen was an Oakland Raiders magnet, his favorite team. The phone rang. It was Gwen calling to tell him that there was a piece on Fox News right then about World War II submarines. He thanked her, but by the time he switched to Fox, the story was over. He continued to watch the game. At least I have to give her credit for trying, he said. Clearly his grit helped him survive prison camp. I took what they dished out and accepted it the best way I knew how, he explained. I try not to think about it too much, because I'd go nuts if I do. But there probably hasn't been a day that's gone by since then that I don't revisit it. Gwen said to me once that it was like being married to a guy with a mistress, only worse, because I took the POW thing with me everywhere I went, even to bed. But you know, when I was in prison, I always believed that one day we'd get to go home. If you didn't believe that, you wouldn't make it. The doorbell rang. It was a couple of Jehovah's Witnesses. Chuck told them no thanks, but they persisted. He politely but firmly interrupted their spiel. I spent three years in prison camp to give you the right to preach whatever you want, he said, but that doesn't mean I have to listen to you. Goodbye. And then he closed the door. Chuck was busy helping Marilyn get ready for a car trip the next day. She was taking Gwen, Jonathan, and Paige to Disneyland, and then on a cruise to Mexico. His list of tasks was long. Fix the weird noise in Marilyn's van, help Paige count her nickels and dimes for the trip, coerce Jonathan into cutting the lawn. He also had no shortage of tasks for when they'd be gone, take care of the dog and cat, water the plants, feed the gecko, wash and fold the laundry. I don't mind doing it, he said, anything to get Gwen out of town. Nothing in his life brought him more joy than his grandkids. Almost every day he chauffeured Paige, a cute, quintessentially California sixth grader with blonde hair, blue eyes, and freckled cheeks, to ballet or other after-school activities. Jonathan, a middle schooler, regularly tested him. Today, Jonathan, wearing a Metallica t-shirt, was refusing to clean his room, including the gecko's cage, or pick up his skateboard off the kitchen floor. His dad's death has been hard on him, said Chuck. John was his little league coach, and since he died, Jonathan hasn't picked up a baseball. Gwen claims I spend so much time with the grandkids because I'm trying to relieve my guilt for not being around as a father. Maybe there's some truth to that. I worked my ass off for all those years trying to support Gwen and the kids, he continued. But it's like none of that mattered to her. She'd rather whine. And that makes it hard for Marilyn to want to be around her. I just hope Marilyn and the kids don't want to kill her by the end of this trip. Despite his guilt for being a less-than-perfect father and husband, Chuck took great pride in other endeavors. For a guy who didn't finish high school, I think I've done all right for myself, he said. He talked about the handyman projects he'd done at his house, as well as Marilyn's, and described his role in getting the Contra Costa Humane Society to provide a more humane form of euthanasia for its animals. He could recall the exact cards he'd held sixty years ago when he won the big pot in the poker game on the trip home from Guam, and he puffed out his chest when he told of bumping into Commander Barney Siegel in 1965 and repaying him the twenty dollars Siegel had given to him and Tim when they were leaving Japan after the war. He honored the promise he made to himself in prison camp to apologize to his teachers for causing so much trouble, and laughed when he told how, finally, twenty-five years later, Tim paid him back the three hundred dollars he'd loaned him after he was robbed at Sweet's Ballroom. He even took pride in the one time he had smoked pot. He had promised his son that when he retired from the Navy he would give it a try, so when John invited him to join a couple of friends on a boat trip up the California coast to a cove near Mendocino, Chuck agreed to go. After anchoring, the young men fired up a joint and passed it to Chuck. He took only a couple of hits. I saw the way the other guys were twisting and scrunching up their faces when they took a drag, and I thought, that doesn't look like fun, he said. But at least I kept my word and I tried it. Standing in his garage, he showed off a model submarine that John had made for him and pulled down from a shelf a bowling trophy John had won as a boy when they participated in the Father-Son League in Hawaii. He paused, trying to stay composed. You really never get over losing a child he acknowledged. 
Chuck reluctantly admitted the truth when told that Gwen and Marilyn had both said John died of AIDS. It was not an easy admission, but once the burden of secrecy was removed, he spoke candidly about his son's final year. In 1995, Chuck accompanied John to a farmer's market in Stockton to help him set up a table to sell Dungeness crabs that he'd caught. At the time, John was making a living catching and selling abalone and crab. As they were setting up, John turned to his father and with tears rolling down his cheeks, said there was something he had to tell him. I've got AIDS, he revealed. John was certain he'd gotten it when he and two friends spent the night with three prostitutes in San Francisco. He was still married at the time. His two friends were lucky and didn't get it. Neither did his wife. Eventually, as John's condition deteriorated, Chuck volunteered to provide hospice care in his own house, buying a hospital bed, hiring a part-time nurse, and fixing all John's meals. John spent the last six months of his life at his dad's, except for one three-day period at Christmas when he insisted on going to Half Moon Bay for one last abalone dive before he died. He could barely walk, recalled Chuck. He loved the ocean, and I figured he was going to just dive down and never come back up. But he came back home. One of the hardest parts of the final weeks of John's life was the tension in the house when Gwen came to visit. At one point, John had gotten so frustrated at his mom that he ordered her to leave. He couldn't take her constant whining, said Chuck. He just wanted to die in peace. Shortly after returning from Half Moon Bay, John started going downhill fast, getting out of bed only to eat. To help ease the constant pain, he'd grown a small crop of marijuana in Chuck's backyard and smoked a couple of joints each day for relief. Chuck learned to roll the joints for him. During his last month, John's cat spent most of each day sleeping on his chest. It was weird, Chuck mused. That cat slept on John's chest every day, but in the two days before he died, the cat wouldn't go into the room. It knew. 48. Gordy Cox, Culver, Oregon It was 2003, and another submarine vet's reunion this one held at the Hilton in Reno. Gordy Cox leaned against his walker, taking in the scene. The place was swimming in octogenarians, underwater heroes filling the lobby, lounges, and elevators with their camaraderie and liver spots. There must have been over a thousand men, many with canes, walkers, and a slap on the back for a long-lost crewmate. Many of them proudly wore a blue vest embroidered with patches and insignia denoting the ships served on and hometown. It was a gathering of the tribe, a confirmation of belonging to a special fraternity. The crew of the Grenadier, or what was left of it, was just one part of the gathering. Since the previous reunion in Las Vegas, two more survivors had died. Gordy pulled a pack of Pall Malls from the pocket of his blue vest and lit a cigarette. He flicked the ash into an ashtray he'd customized into his walker and blew the smoke into the stale air of the hotel. A little bit late to try to quit now he observed. Indeed. He'd been smoking two packs a day since he'd first started during the war. The previous week, his doctor had discovered a growth the size of a baseball on one of his lungs. He was scheduled for more tests the following week, but now he was enjoying the reunion and the idea of being one of the dozen grenadier survivors. His frail, sallow appearance belied his feisty demeanor. Standing next to him, his wife Janice, equally feisty, lit up her own cigarette. Twenty-two years younger than he, they were married in 1968, not too long after she interviewed for a job as a bartender waitress at the Tavern Gordy owned in a working-class neighborhood on the east side of Portland, Oregon. He gave her the job, and now, almost forty years later, they were rarely out of each other's sight. The view from Highway 97 approaching Gordy and Janice's house just outside of Culver in central Oregon is spectacular. To the west sits Mount Jefferson and the Three Sisters, and to the east are rolling hills, alfalfa fields, red barns, and giant stacks of hay. The irrigation sprinklers work hard to keep it lush. Gordy's blue prefab house sits alone on the ten-acre parcel of land he owns, a former mint farm. Eight of those acres are rented out to a local farmer to grow alfalfa. 
He and Janice moved here in 1982 and were now both retired. A sign greets visitors. Two people live here, one nice person and one old grouch. Indeed, Gordy in his 80s could be a bit of a grouch when he talked about reparation for POWs or the lazy shits who don't know anything about an honest day's work. For most of his adult life, he was a loyal punch-the-clock employee for a host of manufacturing companies in Washington and Oregon. On this warm summer afternoon, however, he sat in his living room, lighting up one Pall Mall after another and recalling his work history since the war. By his recollection, he'd had well over a dozen employers, not counting the jobs that lasted only a week or two or his time spent in the tavern business. As he talked, Janice was in the kitchen preparing lasagna for dinner. She, too, was smoking, and the house reeked of cigarette smoke. They had both enrolled in a stop-smoking clinic fifteen years ago, shelling out six hundred dollars each, money that went straight out the chimney when they quit the clinic after the first session. Janice is Gordy's second wife. He met his first wife, Jean, at Dopey's, the drive-in restaurant popular with Yakima's young people after the war. She was an attractive nineteen-year-old telephone operator, five feet two inches, brunette, dark brown eyes, one-eighth Indian. When he first asked her out, she turned him down, choosing to go out with one of his friends instead. On a double date, however, she decided she'd rather be with Gordy, and the switch was made. Soon they began seeing each other regularly, although she put the brakes on when it came to going all the way. He asked her to wait for him when he went off to Seattle to check into re-enlisting. Gordy wasn't gung-ho about a career in the Navy, he was still a seaman first class, but without a high school diploma, his job prospects were limited. He'd thought about becoming a cop, but when he applied to the Yakima Police Department, they told him that at five feet five inches, he was too short. He'd been fooling around with photography and hoped that if he re-enlisted, he could be assigned as a photographer's mate, but at the Navy office in Seattle, he was told they wanted him to work shore patrol for two years and then possibly move up in rank. He didn't like the officer's attitude, so he asked for his discharge and headed back to Yakima, eager to get back to partying. He had no clue what he would do for work. The first thing he did back in his hometown was drive to the telephone company to see Jean. As he wheeled into the parking lot, she was getting into a car with another guy. Impulsively, Gordy angled his car to block their way, a move that impressed Jean. She hopped out of the other guy's car and climbed in with Gordy, signaling him to drive away. A couple of weeks later, they eloped to Lewiston, Idaho, consummating their relationship on their wedding night. The next day, he learned that she'd lied about her age. She was 17, not 19. When they returned to Yakima, he discovered that her father was looking for him, possibly with a shotgun. Jean was able to calm her father down, and soon she and Gordy moved into a dumpy one-bedroom apartment. Desperate for work, Gordy returned to a job he'd had as a kid, picking fruit. With Jean now pregnant, he knew he needed to do better. So, taking advantage of the newly enacted GI Bill, he enrolled at Perry Trade School in Yakima, focusing on aircraft maintenance. Upon completing training in late 1947, he, Jean, and their infant son Ron moved to Ellensburg, Washington, where Gordy got a job painting aircraft parts for $1.25 an hour. A couple of months later, everyone at the plant got laid off, but Gordy got lucky and was hired as a mechanic by United Airlines in Seattle for $1.55 an hour. At United, he worked the graveyard shift. Jean stayed home with the baby. To help make ends meet, Gordy also worked days, selling vacuum cleaners door to door, or at least trying to sell them. He quickly learned that being a salesman wasn't his thing. Between the two jobs, plus his beer drinking, he was often exhausted, sometimes falling asleep on the job or in the middle of a conversation. He also suffered from nightmares, usually about being trapped or unable to move. He'd wake up kicking and flailing. Jean was having problems, too, trying to cope with severe headaches, the cause of which doctors couldn't pinpoint. In 1949, they had a second child, Sharon. Gordy continued to work as a journeyman mechanic until the spring of 1953 when he packed up the family and moved to California, where he heard that Douglas Aircraft in Santa Monica was hiring. On the drive south, they stopped in Portland to visit with Jean's sister and husband. They all got to drinking and partying, 
and pretty soon Gordy's money for the move was gone, so he had to go out and find a job in Portland. For the next several years, he worked jobs in manufacturing, including one for a plastics company that took him to Houston to work on the project to build skylights for the Astrodome. He tried looking up Tim McCoy, but was not successful. He learned later that his old shipmate was on a ten-day bender at the time. Gordy was likewise doing quite a bit of drinking during those years. He and Jean were spending so much time at the Rockwood Tavern that they thought maybe they should look into buying a tavern of their own. The kids were now in school, and Jean was restless. Their marriage was shaky. Jean had a bad temper, especially when she'd been drinking. Her headaches had not gone away, not even after she had surgery on her nose in an attempt to open up her sinuses. Eventually they found another couple, their drinking buddies, to go in half with them on a tavern. After shopping around for months, they finally found one in a working-class neighborhood on the east side of Portland, Gordy scrounged up the $1,000 for their share of the down payment, but then the other couple bailed. Jean insisted that they go through with the deal, so they refinanced the fixer-upper home they'd recently purchased. During the day, Jean ran the tavern while Gordy continued his job as a supervisor at the plastics company. At night and on the weekends, they both worked behind the bar. There was a side room where the kids slept while they worked. At closing time, they'd bundle up the kids and head home. Neither Gordy nor Jean was shy about having a drink on the job. In the summer of 1962, Jean had to be hospitalized for her headaches. She wasn't the easiest patient, throwing tantrums, berating the staff, and physically attacking other patients. Gordy wasn't sure if it was because of the headaches, the alcohol, or just her personality. Because she was unable to work at the tavern, Gordy convinced Jean that they should sell it. In October of that year, her condition worsened. Gordy and his 13-year-old daughter Sharon took turns staying home during the day to take care of her. But within a few days, Jean suffered a seizure and died on the way to the hospital. The doctor listed the cause of death as a swelling of the brain caused by acute alcoholism. She was 32. Gordy was now a widower, responsible for raising a 14-year-old son and a 13-year-old daughter, a task for which he knew he was completely ill-equipped. It was another beautiful day in central Oregon. Gordy reached for the remote control. Most days he sat in his easy chair, switching channels and smoking. Not much of a sports fan, he preferred the History Channel or old movies. He got up to let his Australian sheepdog into the house, then sat back down in his chair, waiting for a coughing jag to pass before lighting another Pall Mall. On shelves behind him sat dozens of Avon beer steins that Janice had collected over the years. My motto was, I drink it, she saves it, he said, but that was before I sobered up. My drinking was at its worst after Jean died. I pretty much went on a five-year drunk. Probably had something to do with why I wasn't a very good parent. The mementos of his war experience sat in a small display case, his POW photo, eight medals including a Purple Heart and a Prisoner of War medal, and several photo albums with pictures of his old war buddies. It's depressing to look at those now. So many are dead. For thirty years after the war, he didn't see any of his grenadier crewmates. But in 1975, he attended the crew's first reunion held in Nashville, Tennessee. Twenty-two men showed up, including Captain Fitzgerald, who was thinking about writing a book about his experiences. At the reunion, Fitzgerald tried interviewing several of the men, but his tape recorder kept malfunctioning, and he ended up with nothing. During the reunion, Gordy overheard several men talking about Fitzgerald, and he realized that some of the men had changed their attitude about the captain since the war. They still held him in high regard for the torture he endured as a POW, but they now questioned his decision to take the ship to the surface in daylight. Late one night during that reunion weekend, Gordy was walking back to the hotel and encountered Captain Fitzgerald on the street. Gordy couldn't recall having ever talked to the captain while he was on the sub, but on this night Fitzgerald was in a talkative mood, perhaps loosened up by the large amount of alcohol everyone had been consuming. He asked Gordy if the men blamed him for their getting captured. It seemed almost sad to Gordy that this man, whom he respected so much, and who had gone on to reach the rank of rear admiral, 
was still tormented by guilt that he might have been responsible for his crew's fate. Gordy decided to tell the captain that wasn't the case, and the two men walked amiably through the Tennessee night back to the hotel. Following Jean's death, Gordy struggled to raise the kids. Sometimes his mother or father traveled to Portland to lend a hand, but for the most part the responsibility of fixing the meals and keeping the house in order fell to Sharon. In school and at home, she was never a problem. The same couldn't be said for Ron. Soon after Jean's death, Ron started acting out, skipping school, drinking, hanging with the wrong crowd. Every time he'd get in another scrape, Gordy would bail him out, rationalizing it by conceding that Ron had been close with his mother, maybe even a bit of a mama's boy, and her death was especially hard on him. The tavern and Jean's spending had put Gordy in debt. Life was a constant financial struggle. When Sharon was sixteen, she came into the tavern where Gordy was drinking one evening and announced that she and her boyfriend were eloping. Gordy had no choice but to wish them good luck. That same year, Ron dropped out of school. Gordy warned him that he was on a path that would surely end up in prison. Gordy was in a grumpy mood. It was an overcast, dreary day in Portland, and he'd spent the morning at the VA Medical Center for a follow-up visit to the doctor who had diagnosed him with lung cancer several months earlier. It wasn't the diagnosis that had him in a bad mood as much as it was dealing with the VA bureaucracy. He and Janice were grabbing a bite to eat at a Denny's before the return three-hour drive to Culver on the other side of the Cascades. As usual, Janice would do the driving in their Dodge Caravan. At least the VA and the Navy aren't as bad as they used to be, he said. He was referring to the difficulties he and other Grenadier crew members, as well as vets in general, had had in collecting benefits. Despite being plagued with back pain ever since being beaten on the Asama Maru, he did not receive any compensation until 1974, and not until he was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, in 1999, was he able to receive 90% disability compensation, even though he'd been haunted for decades by nightmares and physical problems relating to his imprisonment. But it wasn't just his lack of compensation from the Navy or VA that he was venting about. A registered Democrat, he was blasting away at whatever came to mind. George Bush, he made me want to move back to Canada. Government, I haven't trusted our government since LBJ had Kennedy killed. Shrinks. Now, that's another good way to make a living without working. When I got examined in 1999, the guy asked if I had any friends to go fishing or do other things with. I said no. He said, that's it, you have PTSD. I said, whatever you say. POW speaking engagements. One time my daughter's teacher asked me to come to the school and talk about my experiences. I said that I would, but I wouldn't sugarcoat it. I'd tell them about the starvation, beatings, death, and torture. The teacher said she didn't want her students to hear all that, so I decided I'd never speak publicly about it. Osama bin Laden. Bush let him escape because it gave him another reason to be over there trying to steal their oil. God. I don't believe in a heaven above and a hell below. If you get to go to heaven... Does your dog get to go with you? Your horse? If there was a god, why has he made so many errors? At this point, Janice, a regular churchgoer, interrupted to call him a pagan. He told her to mind her own business. Death. I believe there's a big pool of energy that invades everything. It's what makes the grass grow, the trees, people. Our bodies and spirits become part of that energy. We become dust but that becomes part of the soil, and that supports life. My theory is you do what you have to do for as long as you do, and that's the end of that. Barbara Palmer. She claims that she didn't know Bob was a POW and still alive. But if he wasn't reported as a POW, he was the only one out of the entire crew of 76 who wasn't. I've talked to a lot of people about this, and it's true that the prisoners who went to Ofuna including Fitzgerald, didn't get reported. But they eventually all got transferred from there to Omori or Ashio, and all those prisoners got reported. 
Whatever Gordy tried, it did little to straighten out Ron's miscreant ways. He was constantly in and out of trouble. When he turned twenty-one, Gordy put him to work in the tavern, which he'd reacquired, but that proved to be a mistake. Ron borrowed money from the till and conveniently forgot to pay it back. He instigated fights. In one barroom brawl with members of a motorcycle gang, he lost two teeth and then tried to recruit his father and friends to help him get even. Gordy and the friends turned down that offer. When Ron stole a Corvette Stingray and got caught, Gordy reluctantly bailed him out. But it was hard for him not to get discouraged. Ron stole his tools and sold them. He started using drugs. He couldn't keep a job even when Gordy pulled strings to get one for him. Gordy concluded that his son was one of those guys who thought it was easier to steal than work for a living. It bothered Gordy that every time Ron got into another scrape, he conveniently used his mom's death as an excuse. But there was also a part of Gordy that felt guilty that maybe his own shortcomings as a parent contributed to his son's behavior. When Gordy married Janice in 1968, she was a single mother with a five-year-old daughter. Janice seemed to have a steadying influence on him. He got out of the bar business and continued his work in plastics manufacturing, and he and Janice acquired all the burdens of a typical blue-collar working-class couple in the late 1970s and 1980s, debt, blended families, and disaffection with a government they felt had not properly supported Gordy for his sacrifice during the war. His emotional and financial load was lightened when Ron drifted to the Bay Area and moved in with a girlfriend and her child. In 1980, Gordy and Janice left Portland and moved to Central Oregon, and two years later they purchased the ten acres and prefab home near Culver. When they first moved in, there was no plumbing or electricity, but Gordy's handyman skills helped build them a comfortable home. They were, however, $91,031.18 in debt, the big majority of it owed on the house. Within ten years, though, they paid off their loan and became debt-free, owning their land and house outright. In 1991, Gordy retired and started collecting Social Security, which supplemented his VA compensation. Janice retired in 1997. Ron's move to the Bay Area did not solve his problems. He spent a couple of years in prison on a drug charge and then was busted again on charges of fixing cars with stolen parts. As badly as Ron's life had gone, Sharon's was a success story. She was still married to the man she eloped with at sixteen. They had raised a family and made good money running a storage tank business in Klamath Falls, Oregon, with nice cars, boats, and a big house to show for it. Then, in October 1991, Gordy got a call from Ron's ex-girlfriend, saying that Ron was in a hospital and close to death. When Gordy got to the hospital, he learned that Ron was infected with HIV. According to Ron, he had gotten infected from a shared needle. Gordy stood next to his son's bed, holding his hand. He felt Ron squeeze back. Gordy felt it was as if Ron was letting his father know that everything would be okay. Ron died later that day. Gordy had him cremated and then brought his ashes back to Portland, where he buried him in the cemetery next to Jean. Gordy and Janice had made the trip back to the Portland VA Medical Center again for another series of tests. Vets filled the waiting room. Every seat was taken by men waiting to be called for their appointments. There were canes, walkers, wheelchairs, and oxygen tanks, but no smiles. One man was so fat that he couldn't button his pants, leaving his belly exposed. Most of the men looked like they had served in Vietnam, maybe a few from Korea. In the cancer ward, where as an inpatient Gordy shared a room with a Vietnam vet, he was the only World War II vet. The tumor in his chest had continued to grow, but the doctors had decided not to operate. They said that Gordy's lungs weren't in good enough shape. But it was now over two years since he'd been diagnosed, already doubling the doctor's prognosis for survival, and Gordy was nowhere close to throwing in the towel. He stepped outside to a courtyard to smoke. Leaning against his walker, he looked frail and sickly, but he'd clearly lost little of the orneriness that had served him well during his hardscrabble life. Over the past few months, he had poured his energy into writing a detailed account of his life in longhand. 
Janice entered the text on a computer and assembled the pages, including photos, maps, and statistics on American prisoners of war, in an 8x10 spiral-bound notebook with a powder-blue cover. The narrative began with an apology. Knowing that flunking English in school does not qualify for great writing, I'll proceed. On the final page was a drawing of a pelican with a squirming frog hanging out of its mouth. The caption read, It ain't over till it's over. Gordon Cox was that squirming frog. Toward the end of his account of his life, he wrote this. It irritates me when I hear someone from Vietnam complaining today that they had no parade when they came home like the World War II vets did. There were no parades for most of the soldiers and sailors that fought that war. The celebrations were over by the time we got home. How long did it take to get over the effects of prison camp? My answer is that you never get over it. You just live with it. Any man who served in a war on the front lines where men are killed, shelled, blown to bits, whether he is doing the shelling or the dying, will never get over it. These things change a person. You just live with it in your changed condition. My injury is a constant reminder of what happened and where. I got it on the Asama Maru in 1943, and it still plagues me six decades later. As the body gets older, these old injuries make their presence known. I have always believed that the government should have done more for the returning soldiers, sailors, and other fighting men. It spends a fortune to make them into killers, and then, when they returned, they were just turned loose on society. I guess what gripes me is how our government tried to sneak out from under its responsibility to returning vets, and especially the POWs. We as POWs had in our mind that once we got out of prison camp, everything would be all right. All our ills would clear up. The doctors had to know that wasn't so. 49. Tim Skeeter McCoy, Austin, Texas. Although he was physically absent from the last two Grenadier reunions, there was no shortage of conversation and speculation about Tim McCoy. Over the years, he had taken on an almost mythical status with his old crewmates. One story had it that he got court-martialed for punching another sailor through a portal. Another one said he'd given away over a million bucks to his church. It was hard to know what to believe. Like many of his crewmates immediately after the war, Tim felt uncertain about what to do next. He'd dropped out of high school, and because the war had broken out shortly after he enlisted, he had never really had the time to learn a trade. So he re-enlisted. Until he retired in 1965, he spent his entire Navy career assigned to some form of submarine-related duty, including submarine rescue vessels, submarine tenders, and submarine support activities of the Pacific Fleet. By the time he left the service, he had reached the grade of second lieutenant. Tim had first thought about an insurance career as a teenager in Dallas. He had even moonlighted selling fire and casualty insurance in Chula Vista during his last couple of years in the service. After his retirement from the Navy in 1965, he moved to Austin, Texas, and became the director of the military division for National Western Life Insurance, before being promoted to director of all its marketing divisions. Tim's financial star started to skyrocket in 1973 when he founded NEAT, National Employees Assurance Trust, a niche insurance company specializing in policies for seniors, specifically to cover burial costs, cancer care, Medicare supplement, and supplemental support for current and retired military personnel. Although he turned the running of the company over to his son, Tim Jr., when he retired in 1999, he continued to serve as chairman of the board and showed up at the office every morning at 7.30. In the entryway at Neat Management Group in Austin hangs a ten-foot-high painting of Tim McCoy, the old-time cowboy movie star. It's impossible to miss. Tim, now in his early eighties, pointed to the painting with a self-satisfied grin. Tim McCoy, larger than life, he said with a big old Texas accent. That's me. In his ready-for-inspection office, the phone rang. It was his wife, Jean. He spoke to her briefly, then stood up and excused himself. She has an appointment at the beauty parlor today, and it's my job to get her there, he said, smiling, pleased with his assignment. I'm a honeydew husband. He met Jean in San Diego in December 1945. Three months after returning from the war, 
and after Valma had returned his engagement ring and money for the trip to America. He had moped around for a couple of weeks after he received her letter, but quickly decided to move on. Like so many returning vets, he was drinking pretty hard and searching for love. He and Jean were set up, their parents knew each other in Texas, and for their first date Tim took her ice skating, figuring he could impress her with his slick moves on the ice. For him it was pretty much love at first sight. Jean had light brown hair, a great smile, and a nice figure. In his eyes she was the marrying kind, but there was a problem. She was only fourteen years old. Patience was never Tim's strength, but he and Jean did wait a year and married on December 27, 1946. She was fifteen, he was twenty-two. A year later they had a son, Chuck. Five years later they had another son, Tim Jr. Tim spent most of his Navy career on shore duty, a majority of it stationed at Pearl Harbor. Jean was the quintessential Navy wife, staying home to raise the boys and support her husband, while Tim gained notoriety for his athletic skills, hot temper, and drinking. On the base football team, he played defensive back, earning a reputation as one of the most hard-nosed players in a league that included many former college stars. He took up handball and within a couple of years won the Pacific Region All-Service Championship. He traveled to Washington, D.C. to take part in the Navy's deep-sea diving training and soon became known as one of the best divers around Hawaii. To keep fit, he regularly went on 10- and 15-mile runs, long before the jogging craze struck. To help earn extra cash, he worked at an ice skating rink and was never shy about demonstrating his fancy spins and jumps. When Chuck reached Little League age, Tim took on coaching duties, and in 1960, he led the Pearl Harbor team all the way to the Little League World Series in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. They didn't win the championship, but it wasn't because they hadn't been drilled in the fundamentals. Tim put as much energy into boozing as he had into outmaneuvering the guards in prison camp. He often overindulged, either blacking out or staying out all night. The carousing took a toll on his family. On several occasions, Jean warned him that if he didn't quit, she was leaving. He'd be contrite and promise never to do it again, but then he would. With his sons, he was a demanding, gruff, no-nonsense, intimidating disciplinarian. He wouldn't tolerate lying and maintained strict rules. If the boys didn't come home by the assigned time, day or night, there was a good chance they were going to get their butts beat with a belt. From their mom, they heard a lot of, wait until your dad gets home. But the one thing the boys always knew was that he loved them. He could be fiery mad one day, but over it a day later. They came to understand that it was just the way he was, passionate about everything he undertook. When he was coaching Little League, Tim was famous for getting the team pumped up with his motivational pep talks. He could be tough on his players, especially Chuck, who was an excellent shortstop and catcher, but he would also give him or the other players a hug when he thought they needed it. He wasn't afraid to tell his sons he loved them. On long drives, he often reached into the back seat and affectionately tugged on their legs. He required that they go to church every Sunday and take part in family prayer. He also demanded a strong work ethic. He'd worked hard as a boy, learning the value of a nickel, and he was determined they would too. He didn't give them an allowance, and by the time they were teens, they were expected to earn their own money, whether it was by mowing lawns or by flipping burgers. If they went out on dates, they were expected to use their own money to pay for the evening and behave like perfect gentlemen. Tim frequently lectured them. The subject might be money or manners or morals, the talks often taking the form of mini-sermons. There could be no backtalk. He demanded respect, something he'd learned from his father and in the military. He was the commanding officer of the house, and his orders were not to be questioned. After an afternoon visiting the National Museum of the Pacific War in Fredericksburg, Texas, Tim eased his big new Cadillac onto Highway 290 and headed east toward Austin and home. He swerved to miss an oncoming car that he hadn't seen. No fear, he offered. We're as safe as if we're in the hands of Jesus. Located on a six-acre site in the heart of the Texas hill country, 
The museum is dedicated to perpetuating the memories of the Pacific Theater of World War II in order that the sacrifices of those who contributed to our victory may never be forgotten. Tim had come to the museum to tour its many exhibits, but he was even more interested in seeing his new plaque embedded on a wall next to the Veterans Walk of Honor. Donated by his family, it included a picture of him in his dress whites and commemorated his Purple Heart, Silver Star, and service on the USS Trout and Grenadier. The visit had put him in a reflective mood. I'm a better man for having been a POW, he claimed. It taught me so much about myself, primarily that I possessed the inner strength to survive real adversity. When I lost my eldest son, I think I was able to call on that same inner strength. I'm sure some of my crewmates thought I didn't always do the smartest thing in camp, but I was not going to cut the guards any slack. I was not going to be intimidated by them, nor was I going to let them break my will. If anyone was going to return from a Japanese prison camp, it would be me. Unlike many of his fellow survivors, he said he held no grudge against the Japanese. At the time, I kept thinking that if this was another time and place, I'd kick your ass, he continued. But at some point after the war, I made a decision. As much hate and resentment as I'd built up against those people, I knew I had to do something or I would never get over it. I prayed a lot for guidance. Most of the Japanese were extremely cruel to me, but a few actually tried to help me, despite risking serious punishment by their superiors if they got caught. To some extent, they were victims, too. When I was going to deep-sea diving school, I met a Japanese man who was a little younger than me. I asked him what he remembered most about the war, and he told me that on his 14th birthday in 1944, his mom gave him a full bowl of rice. He hadn't had a full bowl in over a month. That was his most vivid memory of the war. That drove home the fact that they had also truly suffered. When I left prison camp and headed for Tokyo, I saw the damage our bombs had inflicted, total devastation. I came to realize that we were all prisoners in one way or another. We might be trapped by cancer or financial hardship or a bad relationship. I knew that to forgive would be to set the prisoner in me free, and that all the hate I had for those people and trust me, nobody hated them more than I did, could only keep me a prisoner of my own thoughts. So I forgave them. I could do it because I was a Christian. I simply forgave them and put it all behind me as best I could and got on with my life. He also held no negative thoughts regarding his treatment by the Navy. I receive a generous pension and benefits, he said. I had a wonderful career in the Navy, and when I retired they honored me with a special ceremony. Men whom I'd served with all wore dress whites and formed an arc with crossed swords. It was very emotional. He disagreed with his shipmates who felt the U.S. government had not done enough in pursuing the Japanese companies that used brutal and exploitive practices in building post-war fortunes on the slave labor of American POWs. That's another one I had to let go, he acknowledged. I could go nuts thinking about all the injustice. When asked about Captain Fitzgerald, his tone and posture shifted. He sat up straight behind the wheel. It's easy for all the Monday morning quarterbacks to question the captain's decisions that led to our capture, but that doesn't change a thing as far as I'm concerned, he said, his voice now choked with emotion. That man was as fine a captain as I ever met. Nobody endured more punishment than he did. It was inhuman. As far as I'm concerned, he deserves the Congressional Medal of Honor. As we reached the outskirts of Austin, the topic changed again, this time to his fight with Trigg in prison camp. The more he talked about it, the more worked up he got, his tone and voice peeling away the years and the Christian tolerance he'd been espousing a few minutes earlier. He was a son of a bitch, he concluded. Trigg stayed in the Navy after the war, eventually receiving a dishonorable discharge when he was caught stealing morphine from a base hospital. After that, he moved to Dallas, found religion, and became a Baptist minister. In the early 1990s, he was diagnosed with terminal cancer and moved to Austin, his hometown, to be with a daughter. He'd heard that Tim lived in town and called him. It was a surprise to get a call from him, said Tim. He told me he was a changed man and had been for a long time. He'd confessed his sins and accepted Christ as his personal savior. 
I told him what a wonderful thing that was. He admitted what he'd done in camp and apologized. I asked if I could take him out to lunch, and he said yes. But when I called back a couple days later, his daughter told me he'd passed. I was sorry I didn't get to see him. Tim waved a greeting to an acquaintance as he entered his favorite lunch spot, Rudy's Country Store and Barbecue. Located a few blocks from his office, Rudy's is famous for its collegial atmosphere, friendly staff, and big slabs of beef served on butcher paper and in Coke crates. Tim ordered the brisket. By golly, this is the best brisket in the good old U.S. of A., he informed a lady standing behind him. Sliding his tray down to the young woman at the cashier's stand, he gave her a wink. Dad gummit, y'all must have the prettiest smile in Texas, he said, handing her a twenty. Keep the change and buy yourself something frilly. Known by his friends as a terminal flirt, he carried his lunch to one of the communal picnic tables and offered a greeting to anyone within range. Taking a sip of his iced tea, he scanned the room, looking for familiar faces, and spotted a local car dealer. He shouted a greeting across the room. He's a good man, he said, pointing toward him, a deacon at our church. The Baptist church had become a large part of Tim's life. It had been when he was a child growing up in Lubbock, but in the years following the war when he fell into the clutches of alcohol, he strayed from the church and his own moral code. In 1977, when he was 53, he finally hit bottom after a long binge. He quit drinking and hadn't touched a drop in 30 years. In his sobriety, he turned more to the church. It wasn't that he just showed up every Sunday to pray. He became involved in a variety of community projects. He donated money. He gave the church two houses. He set up a scholarship fund for disadvantaged students. He mentored. Although he claimed not to impose his religious beliefs on others, I'm no holy Joe. I try to let my actions speak for me. He certainly took to heart one of the basic tenets of the Baptist religion, as stated in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. In the past twenty years he had given countless motivational speeches at business conferences, seminars, conventions, and schools. His most often delivered speech was titled, One Moment of Glory, Then What? I believe that if you don't believe in God and a future existence, then you are bound for hell, he asserted, taking a last bite of brisket. I guess that's what helps me behave better as an adult. I'm dumbfounded by people who are agnostic. Where do they go when they need a higher voice to tell them what to do? Like Bob Palmer. Every time I saw him after the war, he seemed so disconnected, not just to the people around him, but to any sense of life and spiritual guidance. It was this moral rectitude that directed him to seek out Doug Graham, one of his former crewmates on the trout, the sub that had transported the Philippine treasure to safety. For fifty years he held the memory of Graham taking coins out of one of the bags of silver and slipping them into his pocket. When Tim learned that Graham now lived in Houston, he tracked him down and called him to tell him he didn't think what he did was right. He admitted that he'd done it, but told me he'd given the coins to his daughter, said Tim. He said he'd call her and get the coins back and then mail them to me. I would donate them to the museum in Fredericksburg. Well, I waited and waited, and he never sent them to me. Guess that's something he'll have to deal with on Judgment Day. Tim McCoy, Jr., Tim's younger son and the CEO of NEAT, sat behind the desk in his office. In comparison to his father, he is far more laid back. A small framed picture of his older brother Chuck hung on the wall behind him. I'm sure it was my dad's faith that allowed him to get through what happened to my brother, he said. He was devastated. Chuck died in 1994 at the age of 47. The cause of death was listed as a heart attack, although friends of the family have sometimes wondered if there wasn't something else involved. At the time, Chuck was going through some difficulties, a divorce, business failure, and dependence on alcohol and prescription drugs. Years earlier, Tim Sr. had gotten him involved in NEAT, but that didn't work out. Then he loaned him the capital to start his own business, McCoy's Lawn Equipment, but the shop hemorrhaged money. Maybe the father had pushed the son too hard for too many years, some people speculated, 
And in the end, the stress of trying to live up to a war hero slash self-made millionaire father just caught up with him. By Tim Jr.'s account, Chuck was never quite able to meet his father's high standards. In high school, Chuck challenged his dad to a foot race and lost. As a young adult, he got into drugs, a vice few parents from Tim's generation could understand. The more Chuck's personal life fell into disrepair, the greater the tension between them. My brother and I had a good childhood, said Tim Jr. Yes, Dad was a disciplinarian and pretty strict, but really there weren't many tough times. At the time of Chuck's death, he didn't really go into a deep, dark depression. His faith got him through, and he also threw himself into his work. He never took a day off. He stayed focused, pouring himself into his job rather than sitting at home and dwelling on it. For a long time I felt like I lived in his shadow, especially here at work, he explained. But he's let me come into my own. Now I feel like I stand in his light. He's been one hell of a mentor. I think one of the things that helped me through some of the tough times is that I have hobbies. I play golf, and I've played guitar in rock and roll bands around town. Dad's even come to see me play. But he doesn't have any hobbies of his own. His work and being with my mom. Well, I guess you could count the church as a hobby. And he's been a mason for over fifty years. Perhaps it was the lack of a physical outlet that contributed to Tim's health issues after his son's death. He suffered a case of vertigo, and on a business trip to Chicago he had an anxiety attack and had to get off an airplane just before it took off. But with each setback he fell back on his faith to help him through. There are quite a few sides to his personality, Tim Jr. continued. He can be gruff, giving to a fault, or deeply religious. And he's definitely a big teaser, especially with his grandkids. He's a fantastic grandparent, very involved in those kids' lives. He likes to take them on trips with him. It could be to the zoo in San Antonio or snorkeling in Hawaii. He's a big hugger. But maybe the thing I noticed most about my dad is that he's really mellowed out. Maybe it was my brother's death, or maybe it's just age, but he is definitely a lot calmer. Maureen Bright, or Mo, as she's known to friends, has an office down the hall from Tim Sr. She has worked for him for over twenty years, starting as a secretary and working her way up to senior VP. Outside of his family, probably nobody knows him better, although in some ways they are very different. She speaks with a British accent. He has a thick Texas drawl. She's divorced. He's been married for over sixty years. He was a vigorous George W. Bush supporter. She thought Bush was a fool. But over the years, they have forged a deep mutual respect. He's an upfront kind of guy, she said. Honest, full of integrity, big heart, level-headed, great family man, completely devoted to his wife. Just an all-around nice guy. As a boss, he was demanding, very no-nonsense, very forceful. He ran the business like a ship. Everything had to be tidy and ship-shape. He'd walk around picking up staples off desks. He couldn't tolerate clutter. And he wanted it done yesterday. He also can't tolerate people being late. He fired his own grandson because the kid thought he could keep getting away with showing up late. Yes, he was tough, but he always treated his employees really well, although he kept a professional distance. He's as generous as anyone I know. I've watched him loan employees money. He bought one man a set of dentures. And I can't even begin to estimate how much he's given to the church. He bought new Dell computers for the office and gave all the old ones to the church. He set up a foundation. And it's not just money he gives. It's also his time and energy. For all the success and money Tim earned in the business, he also suffered setbacks. In the late 1980s, his company encountered significant financial problems. He lost his office, agents, just about everything. But he converted the bottom half of the split-level house in which he was living at the time into office space. He didn't draw a salary for over a year, getting by on his Navy pension. He and Mo diligently worked the phones and sent out mailers, and in time they rescued the business and built it back up bigger than ever. I think his attitude during that difficult time, and with the loss of his son, was that if he could survive being a POW, he could get through anything, Mo concluded. 
Tim steered his customized van into the driveway of his million-dollar home in an Austin suburb and flipped a switch under the dash, activating a lift for the side rear door. He hurried around the car and waited for the lift to fall into place, then stepped into the van to lend a hand to Jean. Since being diagnosed with multiple sclerosis in the mid-1990s, she has been confined to a wheelchair. During that time, Tim has dedicated his life to providing her care, shopping, running errands, making sure she gets to lead as full a life as possible. It's payback, he said, for all the years she took care of him. On this evening, they had just returned from dining out at a local steakhouse, Tim working the room like he was the newly elected mayor, a wave, a slap on the back, a quick visit to a table of suits, with Jean smiling all the while, well accustomed to her husband's big as Texas style. He followed her motorized wheelchair into the house and pushed the button to the elevator he'd had installed to make it easier for her to navigate the large house. As she headed upstairs, he walked to his office, a room with an expansive view of the rolling mesquite hills to the south. If this office was a testimonial to the life he had led, with plaques and pictures of his careers in the Navy and insurance, one memento stood out. A framed, handwritten letter to him from Chuck, written a couple of months before he died. Its last sentences read, You've always been there for me, Dad, even through the hard times. Thanks. I love you. 50. Bob Palmer, Ocean Pines, Maryland. 81-year-old Bob Palmer sat in an easy chair in the living room of his modest house in Ocean Pines, Maryland. Slowly, arduously, he got up to get himself a drink of water. His breathing labored. His body might have been a little wobbly, but his mental acuity was still sharp. When Barbara and I drove up to Reno after I got back from the war, he said, sitting back down, I thought we would get back together especially after we spent that night dancing to the anniversary waltz and making love. Didn't work out that way. He stared wistfully off into space, thinking of what might have been if the love of his life hadn't deserted him. Dressed in slacks and a white golf shirt, he was still a handsome man despite his failing health, with clear blue eyes and a thick shock of silver-white hair. Peeking out just beneath the right sleeve of his shirt, was a tattoo of a sailing ship riding the waves of a red reef. He got it back when tattoos were the province only of military men and convicted crooks. I was a little drunk when I got it, he admitted. Okay, I was real drunk. Bob regained his physical health after the war and decided to make a career of the Navy. His mental health slowly rebounded too, although rarely an hour went by that he didn't think about Barbara, who married Robert Coonhart on March 2, 1946. His primary coping mechanism was alcohol. In late 1947, while stationed at Treasure Island in the Bay Area, he met Jean Town, a divorcee who worked as a secretary in the same naval office he did. She did little to hide the fact that she was looking for a husband. She wore her reddish-brown hair in pigtails and had a personality 180 degrees away from Barbara's, Spirited and independent, she loved sports, especially baseball. She had worked as an usherette at Seals Stadium in San Francisco for the city's Pacific Coast League team and liked to boast of seeing Joe DiMaggio before he got famous. Her quick temper and sassy mouth often got her in trouble. On a previous job when she was told to take her hair out of pigtails, she responded by telling her boss to kiss my ass and walked off the job. She brought this impertinence to her relationship with Bob. From the very beginning, they argued, often over his flirty ways with other women. She shared his fondness for alcohol, and she wasn't afraid to start an argument. Bob's usual way of coping was to head off to the nearest bar. Nevertheless, they married in 1948, and a year later, while stationed in Saipan, they had a son, Marty. Like many POWs after the war, Bob filled out an affidavit detailing his imprisonment. Prison conditions, torture, medical care, food, exercise, and Red Cross supplies, taking great care to provide an accurate account of his time in the four camps, Penang, Singapore, Ofuna, and Ashio, where he had been held. 
He made little effort to hide his hatred for his captors, and whenever possible he provided names or descriptions of the guards at each of the sites. Bob's affidavit would become part of the mountain of evidence compiled by the U.S. investigative group to assist in the prosecution of Japanese war criminals in what would become known as the Tokyo War Crimes Trials, which stretched from 1946 through 1948. He did not testify in person, although Captain Fitzgerald did, specifically regarding the brutality at Ofuna. Other POWs, among them Gordy Cox, had no desire to participate. The past was the past, and all they wanted to do was get on with their lives and not dredge up those painful memories. In the end, 920 Japanese military personnel were executed, including officers responsible for ordering waterboarding and other excessive torture. Another 475 received life sentences, and another 2,944 drew prison time, with 1,018 being acquitted. Tojo, the prime minister and war minister, was executed, but General MacArthur ordered that Emperor Hirohito be exonerated. It was a decision second-guessed by many who believed it distorted the Japanese understanding of what it was to lose a war in which the country's supreme commander went unpunished. Bob was particularly interested in the sentences handed down to the 33 officers and enlisted men from Ofuna who were put on trial. Three officers received death sentences, one committed suicide. The rest were given prison sentences of various lengths. In some small measure, the war crimes trials and punishments they meted out helped Bob feel like his treatment had been avenged, but it did not erase the memory of all those horrible days and nights when he was convinced he was going to die. For that, alcohol was a better eraser. But even more than a case of beer, what helped him move forward with his life the most was his son, Marty. The same wasn't so true with his feelings about Jean. The first year of their marriage went well enough, but after that their relationship rapidly deteriorated. Bob was drinking and running around with other women. Jean was constantly yelling and screaming about his miscreant ways, each blaming the other for their behavior. They not only slept in separate beds, they moved into separate rooms. But they both felt a sense of obligation to stay married because of Marty. As bad a husband as Bob was, he was as good a father, wrapping his life around Marty. He took him everywhere with him. He even welded a special seat for him into the back seat of his Navy-issued Jeep. Marty looked up to his dad, admiring the way he looked in his Navy uniform and the way he could fix just about anything. How many times did he hear Bob repeat his little mantra for getting things done? Do it now while you're thinking about it. In the Philippines, Bob bought and rebuilt an old sailing junk and took Marty sailing with him. He also bought and tinkered with motorcycles, and with Marty riding behind him, he loved to go for rides in the countryside. When Marty was old enough to drive a motorcycle, Bob always encouraged him to let out the throttle. To Marty, it seemed that everyone loved to be around his dad, except his mother. Once, while Bob was stationed at Pearl Harbor, Jean woke Marty up in the middle of the night and brought him out on the front porch and pointed to his father passed out on the front lawn. I want you to see what a drunk your father is, she said. On Marty's 18th birthday, Bob took him to a bar in the Philippines. After a few beers, Bob confessed that he hadn't always been faithful to Jean, an admission that didn't surprise Marty, but one he still wished he hadn't heard. But the one thing Bob rarely talked about with his son was his experience in the war. Marty knew very little about what had happened to his father and didn't ask. Bob made it clear that he believed that it had been his patriotic duty and honor to serve his country no matter how badly it had turned out for him. Nor did Bob talk to Marty about Barbara. Bob eventually became a chief warrant officer for CW04, the highest rank below the commissioned officers. Primarily, he served on the office staffs of commanding officers throughout the Pacific. His duties included overseeing motor and boat pools, controlling correspondence throughout the staff, coordinating VIP tours, and maintaining personnel records. He consistently received high grades from his commanding officers. With each new transfer or assignment, he checked the duty rosters and phone books, looking for Barbara's name. He knew that her husband was a Navy officer on track to become an admiral, 
and that she'd had two children, a boy and a girl. They both ended up stationed in Hawaii, where Bob was careful to avoid situations where they might run into each other. But once, after a night of heavy drinking, he drove to their house at 3 a.m. and parked across the street. He just sat behind the wheel, staring at the house, tears rolling down his cheeks. After an hour, he drove away. Most of the time, he felt like he was just going through the motions with no purpose to his life. Barbara was always a ghostly presence in his marriage. In the heat of an argument, he told Jean he would do anything to get back with Barbara and would never be happy without her. I'd crawl back to her on my hands and knees if she'd take me, he blurted out, effectively ending what little affection Jean had left for him. Still, they stayed together for Marty. In 1967, Bob suffered a heart attack. He was convinced that it was related to the stress and physical toll his years as a POW had taken on him, but the Navy didn't see the connection and refused to give him disability compensation. He soon retired and settled in San Mateo, south of San Francisco. Bob wasn't bitter. He was immensely proud of his nearly thirty years of service and the stack of letters of commendation. Although he hadn't gone to college or become a commissioned officer, he felt that the education and travel he'd experienced during his career had served him well. With the war in Vietnam escalating rapidly, Marty enrolled at Sonoma State College and received a college deferment, but he flunked out after his first year and was immediately reclassified 1A. To avoid getting drafted into the Army, he followed his dad's advice and enlisted in the Navy, eventually volunteering for the Riverine Forces, a joint U.S. Army and U.S. Navy force that helped transport troops and saw combat in the Mekong Delta. The boats often came under heavy fire from Viet Cong units dug in behind trees and foliage along the riverbanks that ran through the Delta. For Marty, being part of such a dangerous assignment was a way to show his dad that he was every bit as brave and tough. Marty survived his tour of duty, but like many returning Vietnam vets, he struggled with re-entry into civilian society, falling into the grips of dope, including heroin, and a deep depression. Bob struggled to understand, and he and his son began to drift apart, the closeness they shared during Marty's childhood giving way to an uneasy tension. Bob suspected Marty of stealing from him. Marty believed that Bob was not sympathetic to the difficulties he was experiencing in readjusting after Vietnam. In one heated argument, he blamed Bob for his problems. In 1970, Bob's marriage to Jean finally disintegrated. He packed his few belongings, took their two small dogs, and moved back to southern Oregon, where he'd grown up, renting a single-wide mobile home in the hills west of Jacksonville, near Medford. He got by on his Navy pension and small savings. He dabbled with the idea of writing a book about his POW experience, but whenever he sat down to work on the project, he was overwhelmed with the enormity of the task and soon abandoned the idea. Mostly he drank beer and did nothing. He rarely talked to Marty. Even the task of taking care of the two dogs seemed too much to handle, and he returned them to Jean in California. It was January 1971, and Bob was sitting in the living room of his mobile home trying to get a fix on how to spend the day when the phone rang. This is Barbara the voice on the other end said. Who? he responded. Barbara Coonhart. You know, Barbara Kohler. Barbara Palmer, your ex-wife. Bob hesitated, trying to match the voice with the memories. Is this somebody playing a joke? he asked. No, it's really me, she said. She had come home to visit her mom, who was recuperating in the hospital following surgery, and her father had told her where Bob was living. God, it's great to hear your voice, he said. How you doing? Barbara told him that she was still married to Coonhart, who had retired from the Navy in 1966 and now worked as a consultant for the government. She had two children in their early twenties and lived in a large house in McLean, Virginia, an upscale suburb near Washington, D.C. She and Coonhart liked to entertain and go sailing on his yacht. Bob and Barbara talked non-stop for two hours, both admitting that they had regularly checked the duty rosters in search of the other's name at each new assignment. It'd sure be nice to see you, Bob finally offered. 
they agreed to accidentally bump into each other the next day at a market in Central Point. What Barbara didn't mention in their conversation was that she'd made the decision to call Bob, her courage bolstered by a couple of stiff drinks, after her husband had called to demand that she cut short her visit with her parents and come back home where you belong. He ended the conversation by hanging up on her. The reality was that Barbara's marriage had not been a happy one for years. Robert Coonhart, as Barbara had learned soon after they were married, was not an easy man to live with. He had a notoriously short fuse and kept a tight rein on her and the children. A gun collector, he kept five loaded pistols and eight shotguns in the house. He demanded his dinner be served every night precisely at 1800 sharp, 6 p.m., and often graded Barbara on the quality of the meal or their sex. They took family vacations every year at the same time and to the same place to visit his parents in Connecticut. He kept her on a tight budget and had to approve of every expense. At one point their daughter, Lynn, told him to stop trying to run the family as if you're commanding a ship. His naval career had not gone the way he'd hoped. After rising to the rank of commander, he was passed over for promotion to captain and the admiralship he'd wanted. He alternately blamed it on being discriminated against because he was short or because he'd married an enlisted man's wife. He'd always been a big drinker, but after being passed over, he began drinking even more heavily. Barbara usually kept pace. He was a strict and controlling parent, rarely showing affection to his two children. He hand-selected the classes Lynn took in high school so that she could qualify for Annapolis. He repeatedly told his son, Bobby, that he was worthless and a loser and beat him with a belt. Coonhart's drinking had gotten so bad that one of his friends advised Barbara that if she was to have any chance of saving the marriage, she needed to lock the liquor cabinet. There was a part of her that was afraid of him and wanted to leave. But over the years she'd grown comfortable in their material world. She liked her big diamond ring. She remained faithful in the marriage. Lynn heard Coonhart's tirade ordering Barbara to return from Oregon. It would serve you right if she never came home, she said. At the market the next day, Bob had a six-pack of beer in his shopping basket when he came around the aisle and spotted Barbara. As he approached, tears filled his eyes. Oh, my God, you're as beautiful as ever, he said. You look pretty darn good yourself, she replied. Their old chemistry was instantly ignited. They got into Bob's pickup and started south on I-5, past Medford and Ashland, and up into the Siskiyous toward Mount Ashland. It was the same route they'd taken the day they first saw each other after Bob's return from the war. To Barbara, on that day, Bob had been a shadow of the man she'd married. Now he was robust and full of life, barely able to stop talking or casting lustful sidelong glances in her direction. They turned around and headed back north. In his bed and his single wide, they made love for five hours. The next three days were a whirlwind of sex, reminiscing, and feelings of guilt. Every evening Robert Coonhart called and demanded that Barbara come home, and every time she told him she couldn't leave until her mother was better. She even took Bob to visit her mom in the hospital. When her father learned that she'd seen Bob, he was disapproving, just as he'd been back when they dated in high school. See where you'd be if you ended up with him, he demanded. You'd be living in a trailer. What kind of life would that be? As the time neared for Barbara to head back home to Virginia, she and Bob agonized over what to do next. As intense as the sparks had been, she wasn't ready to leave her marriage. Maybe we can just have a long-distance love affair, she suggested. I want more, Bob insisted. He remembered when they went to Reno in 1945 to get a divorce and ended up making love all night long, only to have Barbara dash his hopes of getting back together. But this time, it felt as if renewing their relationship might be possible. She'd told Bob how unhappy she was in her marriage, and that she'd never loved her husband with the same passion and intensity that she'd loved him. For Bob, being with Barbara again had been the best thing that had happened to him since their wedding day back in 1941. 
All the years that had intervened had done nothing to diminish his passion or desire to be with her. It was as if he'd just been treading water while she was away, treading water for twenty-five years. I'll do whatever it takes to get you back, he vowed. On their last night together they bid each other a tearful farewell. I don't think we should contact each other, she proposed. It would just be too painful. I don't know if I can promise that, he responded. After he watched her walk back into her parents' house, he drove away. But instead of heading home, he headed south toward California. He drove all night, and the next morning when her plane landed at San Francisco airport, he was waiting to greet her when she headed for her connecting flight. You got away from me once, he said. I can't let it happen again. Her heart told her to get in his pickup and head back to Oregon with him. All I thought about on the flight down here was being with you, she admitted. But I can't do it. At least not now. I have to go home and see if there's anything to be saved in my marriage. Once again they said a tearful goodbye. Bob headed back to Oregon, and Barbara flew east to her husband. Bobby, I want you to meet me at the Holiday Inn in Georgetown tomorrow at six o'clock, said Barbara. She sat nervously across the family room from her twenty-two-year-old son. A senior at the University of South Carolina, he was home on vacation. Why? he asked. Barbara cleared her throat. Because... I'm going to introduce you to the man I'm going to leave your father for, she replied. Bobby stared in disbelief. Had he heard her right? She'd always been high-spirited, a bit of a kidder. Say that again, he said. Barbara took a deep breath and repeated the words. This is for real, she added. Bobby studied her face. Clearly she was serious. But she'd always been the dutiful wife and good mother, living in her husband's world and by his rules. Who is this guy? he asked. Barbara paused. Bobby vaguely knew that his mother had been married before, but how could she possibly explain to her son the history she shared with Bob Palmer and the passion that had been reignited? I want you to meet him and see for yourself who he is, she answered. When she'd first returned from Oregon, she initially tried to brush her rekindled feelings for Bob into a back corner of her mind and heart. She had lived her whole life doing what others expected of her, and she saw too many barriers in the way. They lived on opposite sides of the country. She couldn't imagine giving up her life to go live in a single-wide trailer. She didn't think she could ever get up the courage to confess to her husband. But the pull to be with Bob was relentless. Barbara had decided to enlist her daughter's support. She invited Lynn upstairs to her bedroom, where she went into a closet and pulled out a shoebox. Inside the box was another box, and inside that box was still another locked box. Barbara opened it to reveal pictures of her and Bob, as well as other little mementos. Lynn had never seen her mother look so happy or excited. It had always been a mystery to her why she'd stayed with her father. Lynn was no longer living at home, and she volunteered her address as a place where Bob could write to Barbara. In the months ahead there was a steady stream of letters back and forth, as well as phone calls. Once, when Barbara's husband was out of town on business, Bob got in his car and drove forty-six hours straight through across the country to see her. They spent five days in a motel room. When he went for a physical shortly after returning home, he still had rug burns on his knees and elbows. The doctor inquired how he got them, and when Bob confessed, the doctor shook his hand. Sitting across from his mother in the family room, Bobby had never seen her look so resolved, so self-assured. Does Dad know about all this? he asked. Her smile disappeared. Yes, she had told him. At first she'd just told him how unhappy she was and she was considering leaving. He responded by telling her he wanted to save their marriage and asked for a month and promised to make changes. He took her out to dinner, bought her gifts, and treated her nicer than he had in years. But it was too little, too late. She called Bob and asked him if he'd marry her if she left Coonhart. Yesterday, he responded. 
I told your dad last night while we were out on the boat that I was leaving him to go back to Bob Palmer, she said. What did he say? The first thing he said was who's going to help me with the boat. Bobby rolled his eyes. What about the house and boat and all of that, he asked. I'm giving everything to your dad, she replied. I just want out. Wow, this guy must have money, Bobby ventured. Not at all. You guys must be really in love. Barbara smiled. I can't wait for you to meet him tomorrow. He's special. You'll see. I'm staying at the house tonight, said Bobby. I don't trust Dad with all those guns. In July 1971, Bob flew across the country to bring Barbara back to the West Coast. Despite his nerves, the meetings with Bobby and Lynn went well, both of them giving their blessings to the relationship. Some of Barbara's friends thought she was nuts to run off with a man who couldn't afford an engagement ring. I can't imagine leaving someone who won a national sailing championship, said one friend. They also thought she was being naive. She had not hired a lawyer, and she had signed everything over to Coonhart. I admitted to him that I'd slept with Bob and he was going to charge me with adultery if I'd tried going after property, she explained. For Barbara, physically leaving had not gone as badly as she'd feared. All she was taking were a couple of suitcases packed with clothes and an old sewing machine, which she put in the back seat of a five-year-old Chevy Nova. The morning she left, Coonhart rode with her to the Holiday Inn, stopping a block from the motel. As he got out of the car, he threw two $100 bills at her and then walked away. She and Bob didn't even get out of the state before they stopped at a motel and made love the rest of the day. They stopped at a drugstore in Ohio, where Barbara bought two imitation gold wedding rings until they got something more permanent. Instead of returning to Oregon, they rented a small one-bedroom apartment in San Mateo, south of San Francisco. Bob took a job working three and a half days a week for a drywall company that installed movable partitions in buildings. Barbara stayed home and clipped coupons and decorated the apartment. For her, the romance and affection Bob gave her more than made up for the material things she'd left behind. She felt that for the first time in her life she had a say in decisions. She had money, though not much, to spend however she wanted. When Bob wasn't at work, they spent almost every possible moment together. They held hands everywhere they went. Bob opened doors for her and wrote her love notes and cards. His manners were almost Victorian. He regularly told friends that his main purpose in life was to make Barbara happy. Because she'd been an officer's wife and lived in a big house, he worried that he wouldn't be able to measure up financially. So he took a part-time job selling lawnmowers for Sears. Barbara constantly reassured him how happy she was. It wasn't unusual for them to make love in the morning before he went to work, then when he came home, and then again before they went to sleep. They remarried on August 12, 1972. One of the things that impressed Barbara the most was how handy and practical Bob was. He could fix anything. If he was driving down the street and heard the engine ping, he'd pull over and fix it on the spot. If a door squeaked, he'd take off the door and replace the hinge. For Christmas, he bought her son a screw gun. The only gray cloud in their life came from Marty, who had married his high school sweetheart and was now living in the Bay Area, too. It wasn't that Marty didn't like Barbara. It was just that she was stealing such a big part of his father's heart and time. Marty's long hair and his being stoned a lot didn't help his relationship with his father. Bob was constantly amazed at Barbara's positive attitude. He marveled at the way she started singing as soon as her feet hit the floor every morning, and the fact that she kept separate envelopes of money for furniture, dishes, bedding, clothes, and other expenses, just as she'd done when they were first married in 1941. When he got home from work, she'd excitedly show him her purchases for the day. It might be a salt-and-pepper set or a TV tray. She told him that when she was married to Coonhart, She'd go shopping with no intent to buy because she already had everything she needed. They traveled frequently to Oregon on long weekends to visit old friends. In 1977, Bob and Barbara moved back to Medford. He wanted to be closer to the mountains and rivers he'd loved so much as a kid. With his Navy pension and the disability pay he was now collecting, 
He figured they'd have enough money to live comfortably, especially after he started receiving Social Security in a few years. Plus, every time he drove through the Hunter's Point neighborhood in San Francisco and saw all the blacks, he'd usually say the same thing. I hate those people. Medford was a lily-white community. Soon after moving back to Oregon, Bob suffered his second heart attack. The cardiologist told him he needed to slow down, so he and Barbara started to play golf regularly and bought a camper to take trips. Barbara was a faithful follower of all my children. So that she wouldn't miss any episodes while they were on the road, Bob hooked up an antenna on the camper and always made sure they stopped in a place with good reception. It wasn't too long after the heart attack that Bob received a jolt of another kind. Barbara's father apologized to him. For almost forty years, Mr. Kohler had held firm to his belief that Bob wasn't good enough for his daughter. But after seeing how happy Barbara was now, and the adoration, love, and respect that Bob lavished on her, he pulled Bob aside. I was wrong, he admitted. Because the war was responsible for his long separation from Barbara, he wanted to be able to show her a part of that experience. So in 1988, he took her to Penang, to the place where he'd spent the first four months of his imprisonment, the convent on Light Street. After the war, it became a highly respected school for girls again. For several months, he'd been exchanging letters with Sister Frances de Sales, the director of the school. He'd even made a charitable contribution to the convent. It was an emotional return as he visited the classroom where he had been held and saw all the names of the crew memorialized on a plaque. He cried as he listened to Sister de Sales introduce him to the students, teachers, alumni, and local dignitaries. This is no ordinary day for us here in Light Street Convent. We have as our guest someone who came here, metaphorically in chains, forty-five years ago. He was a prisoner of war then. Today he has freely come of his own accord to visit what he often calls the old school. Some of you once studied in the classroom near the laundry, generally known in school as the Grenadier Sanctuary. I regard it as a sacred place, a monument to the love and loyalty to one's country and fellow men that inspired, strengthened, and goaded on the Grenadier men to a superhuman endurance that could take the beatings, the clubbings, the bayonet pricks, and the physical weakness caused by near starvation and intense hunger. We here have long sensed the mystery that surrounded these gallant men. Mr. Palmer edits and circulates the Grenadier newsletter. I have been receiving a copy of it monthly for almost six years. I wish to pay tribute not only to Mr. Palmer's outstanding writing ability, but also to the splendid work he's doing in keeping the men together. He was the ship's writer before that fateful day in April 1943. He is still that today, in fact, but he is more than that because of the part he plays in strengthening the bond between the men. They are a unique bunch of men, sharing one another's interests, plans, joys and sorrows, all the nitty-gritty of daily life. Someone has said that of all the fighting men of World War II, the submariners lived in the closest confinement and therefore forged the closest companionship of all. That seems particularly true of the grenadier men, and that such close and constant companionship has not only weathered the passing of time, but has been strengthened in an unbreakable bond, is due in no small measure to Mr. Palmer's efforts. That brings me to the grenadier's bond with us, a strange one in a way, since our school was the crucible of their sufferings. Mr. Palmer tries to explain it this way in a newsletter dated September 1983. For some there are definite ties with the old school, it seems. I cannot really understand that, except that young men are impressed by everything that happens, and it must be remembered that the first blows struck by the Japanese with bayonet or fist or club were the first real physical hurts some of us had ever received. Little wonder we remember and attach significance to the school of 1943 and the lovely school of today. Elsewhere, in a personal letter to me, Mr. Palmer wrote, 
Why we hover over the painful or the unusual is a mystery to me. But what is clear is that a small group of very young boys encountered their first real and genuine confrontation with life within the walls of your school. It would seem that they have profited much by that experience. In 1990, Bob and Barbara moved to Ocean Pines, Maryland. Bob wasn't all that keen on moving to the East Coast, but he went along with it because he knew that Barbara wanted to be closer to her two children and four grandkids. Making her happy continued to be the most important thing in his life. He often expressed this love in writing, as he did in a letter to friends in 1998. Twenty-six years have passed since Barbie and I reconnected. She is seventy-seven and I'm seventy-eight. To put into words seems beyond me. We have traveled both in the United States and overseas and have felt the touch of the other's hand all this time. Our hearts quicken at each other's return home from an errand. To watch her walk across the room arouses those urges present in a much younger man. She excites me and I'm so proud of her. She line dances and started to tap dance at the tender age of seventy-five. She plays bridge, gardens, and maintains a household environment of cleanliness along with three square meals a day. Our bills are paid on time, no birthdays are forgotten, and I have been privileged to count her children and theirs as very close. I heard that a man has only six chances in this world of finding a completely suitable mate. Considering the billions of women in the world, I count myself as lucky beyond belief in not only getting her in the first place, but in being able to recover her a second time. My cup runneth over. Bob's health continued to decline slowly over the next few years. He had a triple bypass, an aneurysm, a ruptured appendix, restless leg syndrome, gout, and failing kidneys, and his gallbladder had to be removed. He had stents implanted and a new aorta made from a vein in his leg. The doctors marveled that he was still able to stay semi-active. He took to calling himself the Grey Ghost from the West Coast. His relationship with Marty, who had recently divorced, also continued to deteriorate. Marty had moved briefly to Atlanta to try to reconcile with his ex-wife and children, but soon moved back to the Bay Area and started hanging out with the meth crowd. He found a new girlfriend, but he was arrested and sentenced to a five-year prison term in San Quentin for having sex with her sixteen-year-old daughter. He finally got up the courage to write his father, apologizing for his drug use and the way he had burned bridges behind him. He admitted to having attempted suicide four times, but said he had now found religion and hoped to qualify for PTSD compensation upon his release. The shrinks say I have double PTSD because of your history and mine. He closed the letter with, I want to shake your hand again, Dad, and hug Barbara. I love you, Dad. Bob received the letter and, after considering his response for a week, sent this reply. Well, Marty, who is to blame for this one? You can put away the whitewash. It just doesn't sell anymore. I cannot imagine what you told your doctor about me and my experiences. You know nothing about them. You never asked, and all you have, if anything, is fabrication. You're good at that. You have blamed me for so many years for all your failings. I cannot imagine your ending your letter with, I love you, Dad. You have a wall of hate so very high and thick. I don't think you can see over it. I guess you could blame your mother for a while. You managed to call her enough foul names these past years. I almost overlooked your post-traumatic syndrome. There's a good scapegoat. Strange, there were none from WW2 or Korea, only Vietnam. I rode the A-frames of a submarine through women, kids, dogs, all screaming and drowning right after we torpedoed their ship. I spent a day on the bottom of the ocean in a sunken submarine that was on fire. The Japs beat me for months. I spent nine months in a solitary cell. What do I have to show for it? A stack of commendation letters from admirals and flag rank captains. Years of fitness reports all marked in the 4.0 column written by high-ranking officers. 
no post-traumatic syndrome. How come? You have been near death four times? No kidding. I have been confined to the house in a chair for two years and sit all day with a hose up my nose. I am almost eighty years old and I have a very short time left, so do not bother with the handshake when you get out. I probably will not be here. Please do not bother Barbie. She has nothing of value to give you to throw in the corner to gather dust and forget. She will have no extra money and her family will be helping her. Just do not bother her. You are past fifty now, Marty. Not much time to join the human race and start carrying your own load. You cannot live on the fifty percent service-connected disability. I wish you well. Your father. Marty wasted little time in responding, saying he was sorry if Bob misunderstood the intent of his first letter. He said he felt ashamed and knew he'd been a piece of crap the last few years and didn't expect forgiveness, including from his two children. He closed this letter with, I remember who was there while I was growing up, and I love you for it. Bob stuck the letter in a drawer. He wanted to believe his son's words. He wanted to believe that Marty could somehow turn his life around. He remembered riding on a motorcycle together and how proud he was to have such a tall and handsome son. He remembered how happy he was when Marty got accepted into college. So how did it go so wrong? There was a part of him that wanted to reach out again, like he'd done so many times. But at what cost? He felt betrayed. Marty's behavior ran so contrary to his own sense of right and wrong, strength and weakness. Drinking two six-packs of beer, he believed, was a far cry from the dope-smoking of Marty and his generation. As much as it pained him, he thought it was too late in his life to spend the emotional capital to repair the wounds. The one thing that kept Bob from becoming depressed over his son was the continued fountain of love and joy he gained from Barbara. On the occasion of her birthday in 1997, he wrote this to her. Barbara, my debt to you grows by the day. I try all I can to pay it, but just cannot seem to catch up. Seventy-five years is a long time to remain as beautiful as you were when you were born. In spite of my constant sores and complaints, I think of you every waking hour, and everything I do is, for the most part, for you. You are very loving and loyal to those around you. You look straight ahead and are arrow-like in your flight to your targets. You have provided me with so many thrills through the years with your sensuous touch and your loving look. Mostly, I think, I love to touch and hold you. These moments are the most precious and are never repetitive. Each one is a new thrill. I always feel a little pang when we separate. I look to you for so much and appreciate all the many things you do for me. Thanks, Barbie, for all of the above and for the beauty and thrills I know are in store for the future. Happy birthday. Epilogue There were moments in interviewing each of the men when I was brought either to tears or laughter or complete amazement. On my penultimate interview with Chuck, he told me he had recently flown to Florida for a heartwarming visit with Irene Damien, his high school sweetheart. She was still married to the man she met after Chuck joined the Navy, but she was now totally paralyzed. Chuck had gone to visit her after her husband had called to tell him Irene wanted to see him one last time before she died. Every time I met with Chuck, I was impressed with the strength of his determination. He'd suffered a lot of physical setbacks in the last twenty years, but he was resisting slowing down. He seemed almost obsessed with being the best grandparent he could possibly be to somehow make up for being an absent father. Thinking back on all the time I spent with him, two things stand out. The first was when he told me about providing hospice care for his son when he was dying of AIDS. He had kept that fact from me for over two years, even though Gwen and Marilyn had already told me. He was reluctant to have me included in his story. But what he did for his son while he was dying, I think, redeemed whatever shortcomings he'd had as a father. The second was a conversation we had the last time I saw him. 
It was just before the presidential election of 2008, and it spoke volumes about his generation. Chuck was a lifelong Democrat, and I asked him if he was going to vote for Obama. I'll be go to hell if I'm going to vote for that goddamn Muslim, he replied. In interviewing Tim McCoy, I was regularly struck by his almost evangelical approach to life. Financially, he was far and away the most successful of the four men, and the one with the most braggadocio. But every time I would get to thinking that this guy was too full of himself, out popped a sign of his kindness and consideration, like his total devotion to his wife Jean, who was confined to a wheelchair. When I asked him to name his greatest accomplishment, he didn't hesitate. Taking care of my wife. When I first met Gordy Cox in 2001, I figured he had six months to live tops. He already looked like a cadaver. But the little bantam rooster somehow kept hanging in there, feisty as ever. The last time I saw him was at his prefabricated home in central Oregon, and there was so much cigarette smoke in his living room that I worried it would clog his oxygen tube. But this was a guy who by all rights should have died several times in prison camp. But of all the interviews and research I conducted for this book, Nothing came close to matching what happened on my visit with Bob Palmer. At that point, I had not talked to any of the other men. I had traveled across country to the Maryland shore from my home in Oregon to meet with him and Barbara. They had generously offered to let me stay in a spare bedroom. In return for their hospitality, I was prying into all the dusty, neglected corners of their lives. During our interview, Bob sat in the pink easy chair in his living room his voice animated and full of energy, his blue eyes as clear as the water in Crater Lake, where he'd spent countless hours as a boy. Barbara sat in a nearby chair. Shortly after I arrived, he reached out and placed his hand on my forearm. I noticed his little finger, bent and discolored, like that of a catcher who'd absorbed too many foul tips. Only I knew that's not how it got so crooked. I'm glad you're here, he said, tears welling in his eyes. I've wanted to tell this story for a long time. People need to know what happened to us in those prison camps. Barbara got up to bring him a glass of water. As she passed his chair, he reached out and let his fingers trickle across the side of her leg. In return, she slid her hand over his shoulder, letting it linger for an extra moment. I thought of my own parents, people from the same generation, and even though I never doubted their love and devotion to each other, I couldn't remember a similar display of affection, at least not publicly. As I waited for Barbara to return from the kitchen, my eye caught a flat, brightly colored box sitting on the lamp table next to Bob's easy chair. What's this? I inquired. A passion wheel, he answered. I got up to examine it. It had a plastic spinner and a dozen multicolored sections, each with a sexy title. Cop a feel, French kiss, dance naked. It's a game, sort of like spin the bottle, he says. My stepdaughter Lynn gave it to me last Christmas. Barbara walked back into the room. Actually, it was more of a bounce than a walk. At eighty, she was amazingly fit, a chorus line member of the Happy Hoofers, a tap dance team that performed around the state. I eyed her smiling at Bob, one of those secret little glances couples do. It occurred to me that I was in a room with two octogenarians, husband and wife, who were still physically in love, real, honest, hands-on love. Maybe their generation wasn't as sexually and emotionally repressed as my contemporaries believed. She pulled out a copy of his 1938 high school yearbook and pointed to a quote next to his class picture. His favorite saying, Where is Barb?, will remind us of him always. It was nearing the end of the second day of my visit. Bob looked tired, but in my thirty years of interviewing people about their lives, I'd never had anyone so appreciative or eager to tell his story. Thank you for being here, he repeated. I've heard it said many times that we need to let the men and women of Bob's generation know that we applaud and appreciate the sacrifices they made in order that future generations could enjoy the many freedoms and benefits our society has to offer. It's what we had to do, he said. 
We didn't have any choice. Slowly, he rose from his chair, ready to call it a day. It was past his bedtime. We'll start going through the box tomorrow, he promised, referring to a seventy-pound box of memorabilia he kept in his closet. It contained photos, patrol logs, POW documentation, grenadier newsletters, love letters, transcripts from the 1946 to 1948 war crimes trials. Wait, I said, pointing at the passion wheel. Before you say good night, let me give this thing a spin for you. I spun the wheel. It made a couple of quick revolutions before skidding to a halt, the arrow pointing directly at feel above the waist. Bob winked at Barbara, then headed down the hall toward the bedroom. He would shower before turning in, just as he did every night. On his list of priorities, cleanliness was near the top. Two years without a shower in prison camp can do that to a guy. Barbara got up to follow him to the bedroom. She stopped and clasped my hand. Every day before you arrived, he'd say, I wish that writer guy would hurry up and get here. This means so much to him. She walked down the hall and turned into the bedroom. Behind her, I gathered my notebook and reached for the light. Then I heard Barbara scream. Bob's collapsed! Help! It took me only a second to reach the room. Barbara was standing at the end of the bed, frantically pointing to the floor. Stripped to his skivvies, Bob was splayed across the carpet. I knelt next to him, cradling his head in my hands. Bob! Bob! I shouted. Check his pulse, urged Barbara. I eased his head back to the floor and felt for a pulse in his neck. All I felt was the blood rushing through my own fingers. Is he dead? cried Barbara. I'd never seen a dead person, let alone touched one. But I had no doubt Bob was already dead, probably gone before he hit the carpet. Call 911, I instructed. I looked down at him. His face was already turning a purplish blue. His eyes and mouth were open. He gasped slightly, like a fish that's been lying on the dock for several minutes. I stroked his forehead and then felt for a pulse again. Nothing. Barbara knelt down next to him, gently touching his lips. Don't die, Bob. Please don't die, she whispered. I love you. I love you. I had never seen anything so tender. It took less than two minutes for the paramedics to arrive. They quickly pulled out the shock paddles, but just as quickly put them back in the case. It was already too late. Bob Palmer was gone. At Barbara's request, I stayed at the house for three more days, doing what I could to comfort and support her and the family. I helped write Bob's obituary, met with neighbors and friends, and listened to Barbara's stories. A month later, she flew out to Oregon with his ashes, and as she put it, I kept them right between my legs the whole flight. With her daughter, Lynn, we drove to Crater Lake National Park, where Bob had spent much of his youth, and we scattered his ashes surrounded by the deep blue water and the wind whistling through the conifers. In the years that it took me to finally finish this book, there wasn't a day that went by that I didn't think about Bob and that moment when I cradled his head in my hands as his life slipped away. A year after Bob's death, I met Marty. He had been released from San Quentin and was living in a mobile home in Novato, north of San Francisco. He was off of drugs, but clearly fragile, and, by his own admission, fighting a horrible battle with depression. Vietnam and prison can do that to a guy, he said. A tall, slender, good-looking man with deep blue eyes like his father, he talked softly, breaking into tears on several occasions, clearly saddened by the lack of reconciliation with his dad. He showed me poetry he'd written about his experiences in Vietnam and pictures of his mother, who died a couple of months after Bob he admitted to thoughts of suicide. Several times during the conversation, he repeated his mantra, I'm okay today, and that's the best I can expect. I'll deal with tomorrow when it comes. Leaving our meeting, I drove across the Golden Gate Bridge into San Francisco. I wanted there to be a happy ending to my story. Looking back, I realized that I wanted this to be a story of resiliency, 
and of how these four men had survived the Great Depression, gone off to war, and suffered through the unthinkable, but returned to America and ultimately left that darkness behind. But what I found were four men who came back from war, and although they did live out lives of differing degrees of quiet nobility, strength, and resiliency, carried with them the deep scars of a good war, not only that never went away, but that they passed on to their sons. I guess one lesson from the stories of these men is that they offer further testimony, not that any is really needed, that there are no winners in war, only survivors. In 2010, World War II veterans were dying at a rate of over a thousand a day. In late 2009, I found out Gordy Cox finally passed away, six years after the doctor had given him six months to live. Then I got a call from Chuck. I could tell from his voice he wasn't well. In the past several months, lung cancer had racked his body. He'd just completed six weeks of radiation. He had lost forty pounds. More pain than anything I've ever experienced, including prison camp, he said. But guess what? I got married. To whom? Gwen. We got remarried. Sixty-three years after the first time. We're not living together or anything, but I figured she wouldn't get anything from my Navy pension when I finally croak. Now she will. Chuck died a few weeks later. I've always been a little confused about what constitutes a hero. Is it hitting sixty or seventy-four home runs? Inventing a vaccine? Serving your country? Maybe. Probably. But I've also got to include a man who, despite his flaws, gives hospice care to his dying son and then makes sure that his ex-wife is taken care of financially. I'd also include a millionaire on that list, a man who listed his greatest accomplishment as the care he's given his invalid wife. The fact that these men also gave so much in service to their country pretty much seals the hero deal. Author's Notes When I started researching this book in 2001, I couldn't wait for each day, each new discovery. I knew that I had stumbled on a story that went to the heart of America. Love, war, loss, history, failure, courage, and redemption. But something happened along my journalistic way. My journey broke down. Maybe it goes back to my second research trip. I traveled to Florida to talk with a Navy buddy of Bob Palmer's. The morning I arrived at his house was September 11, 2001. We sat in his living room and together we watched in stunned disbelief as the image on the television screen framed the Twin Towers crashing down. It's like Pearl Harbor all over again, he said. Two days later I traveled to Georgia to interview Robert York, one of a handful of men still living out of the original crew of 76. He was a 19-year-old electrician's mate second class when the ship went down. Now he was 77. Along with the rest of the nation, he was trying to make sense of what had just happened. I figured that his experience in World War II and the fact that he had been at Pearl Harbor and had suffered unimaginable torture as a prisoner of war would provide patriotic insight that I couldn't possibly feel. We watched Billy Graham try to bring a measure of peace to the televised hysteria. When a flag flying at half-mast filled the screen, York stood up and saluted. I don't think people in this country fully understand what that flag represents, he said, his voice quivering. Did you vote for President Bush? I asked. I've never voted, he answered. What good would it do? How could I ever unscramble the paradox of such a contradiction? The deeper I probed into these men's stories, the more my focus kept shifting. I felt as if I was standing on quicksand. For example, the more details I learned about how the grenadier sank, the more I believed that Captain Fitzgerald had screwed up royally. But how could that be the case when every man I talked to under his command steadfastly called him a hero? These were men of the so-called greatest generation and for the longest time America had been falling all over itself, gushing over the way this generation had endured the depths of the Great Depression, performed heroic deeds against truly evil aggressors, then somehow found the strength to bounce back and rebuild a post-war utopia. 
Yet in almost every interview, I regularly heard the N-word tossed around like kindling, and women referred to in terms that negated every advance for women's rights over the past fifty years. How could I paint these men as the greatest generation, when so much of the evidence I was gathering seemed to draw a picture of a racist, xenophobic, and misogynistic generation? I would read about the treatment of prisoners at Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo, and then sit down and try to write about the torture the Japanese inflicted on the men in these pages. I wondered what would have happened if somebody had photographed the degradation in the Japanese camps. Would there have been a greater public outcry against the Japanese after the war? Would President Bush, Dick Cheney, and Donald Rumsfeld still believe that waterboarding was okay or that due process didn't apply? Did our leaders know that in the war crimes trials in Tokyo following the war, Many of the Japanese military men directly responsible for the torture inflicted on our POWs were sentenced to death by American military tribunals. None of the men portrayed in this book believed such torture would accomplish anything other than lower our standing in the world. If these guys didn't crack under the torture inflicted upon them, and I included only a portion of those descriptions on these pages because writing about it was difficult and I assumed reading about it would be equally hard, what would make anyone believe it would work against our captured enemy? For research, I beat a regular path to Google, as well as read books, official Navy documents, and first-hand accounts I found in the National Archives. But perhaps the best document I had for my research was from Gordy Cox, the guy who'd supposedly flunked first grade because he'd been kicked in the head by a horse. To help me in my research, he wrote a 75-page account of what happened to him, stunning in its details and honesty. Captain Fitzgerald's written testimony submitted during the Tokyo war crimes trials in 1947 was also very useful, as was Bob Palmer's 20-page autobiography titled A Rather Unusual Story. Bob, Tim, Gordy, and Chuck weren't just subjects for my book. We forged special connections. In sharing such intimate details of their lives, they put their trust in me. It was impossible not to feel a closeness, a responsibility. I visited their homes, sat in their living rooms, talked to their wives, ex-wives, and children, and dug through old letters. We met in restaurants, at a hospital, and rode in cars together. I attended two of their reunions, one in Las Vegas and the other in Reno. Reunions that at times were so drenched in memories that it brought these men to tears. Always the subject understood the purpose of my visit. In most cases I used a tape recorder, and if that was not possible, I took notes. All transcriptions were done by me. By the time I showed up, these men were old, liver-spotted, hard of hearing, and sometimes slow to remember. Yet at times they told tales from sixty years ago, as if it was yesterday morning. They showed me telegrams to their parents from the Department of the Navy that declared them missing in action. I listened to their anger over their treatment by their own government and Japan's and the callous disregard for their right to reparation. I spent time with a psychiatrist who specializes in post-traumatic stress disorder, a term that wasn't even coined until 1985. These men were all textbook cases, but they were all reluctant to admit that they suffered from it. Scenes in this book were reconstructed from the memories of those involved and are subject to the inaccuracies that the decades might have brought. When dialogue is directly quoted, at least one of the participants is the source. With but a few exceptions, the real names of the people involved are used. In the few instances where I have changed the name of a minor character, it was to protect his or her privacy. The true story was often hard to pinpoint. In some cases, the recollections of different individuals of the same event varied, e.g. the grenadiers sinking. In that case, as well as others, I recounted the story that made the most sense to me in terms of the published facts. If there was an account recorded within a couple of years of the incident, I relied more on that. With regard to the ship's sinking, I interviewed ten men who experienced it, and they all had different accounts. Four men believed the grenadier fired two torpedoes at the freighters. Yet there was nothing about any torpedoes in Captain Fitzgerald's official report immediately following the war. In the letters and journals that are included, 
They are reprinted exactly as they were originally written, although sections might have been omitted for brevity. At times I cringed at the stories I was hearing. Combined, I was told over one hundred torture stories. But these were men who had to be tough. They had endured hard-scrabble childhoods and withholding fathers. Every time they pulled out of the harbor to patrol enemy waters, they didn't know if they were coming back. A submarine is no place for a loner, and these men grew to know each other better, perhaps, than anyone they'd meet the rest of their lives, and forged a bond they found hard to explain, stumbling on words such as respect and affection. When the war was over and liberation finally came, they returned to a country much different from the one they'd left five years earlier. All of them were married within a couple years of their return. Was it because it was an era when that's what young people did, or because their imprisonment had made them all starved for affection and female companionship? I'll leave that for the shrinks to determine. Another thing the four men had in common was that they rarely, if ever, talked about what they'd been through, or spent time indulging in introspection. For the most part, they lived veiled lives, until this book. What was it that gave each of these men the mettle to survive a POW experience almost unimaginable in its brutality? What gave them the strength to endure? Most days I felt inadequate to the task of figuring it out. In the end, I could only conclude that they were all very tough sons of bitches, not just because they survived their captivity, but also because they endured the lifetime burden of war. For whatever reason, Bob, Chuck, Gordy, and Tim were ready to talk when I came to visit. Maybe it was because they knew that this was likely their last chance to tell the world what happened to them. They talked freely about their childhoods, Navy careers, and years as POWs. They bristled at the handling of Iraq. They made dark jokes about living long enough to read this book. They were not pleased that I was past my deadline by several years. For all their honesty and candor about the past, most of them drew tight when talking about their relationships with their sons. I had to wonder. Had their experiences in World War II directly or indirectly impacted their kids? Three of their sons preceded them in death, and a fourth was in prison. There were stories of drug addiction, disease, and deep depression. But I didn't initially learn any of that from these men. I knew that to tell their stories, I needed to include the parts they would rather not discuss, if only in a final chapter. But to do so would surely cause them pain a pain they didn't deserve at this late moment in their lives. I wondered if there was a part of me that was waiting for them to die so as to spare them any pain this book might cause, or me the pain of thinking I may have betrayed them. As I write this, only Tim is still alive. For months at a time it seemed too daunting a story for me to try to tell. I'm not a historian or a psychologist, and yet it felt like I needed to be those things to somehow make sense of it all. But perhaps nothing paralyzed me more than the day in December 2006 when I opened a Christmas card from Chuck Vervalen, of whom I'd grown especially fond. He wrote a little note on the inside. I am eighty-four years old. I have read ten books in my life. I hope to live long enough to read the eleventh. I let him down. But I hope I still did him justice. This concludes No Ordinary Joes.